Hi, hello, Natambi Rose, how are you? Can anybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? Hello, Adnan Mohammed. Bayam Batson, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. Good. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Who else is here? Wael, how are you doing? Osgur, Mahandra. Hello, I can hear it. You oh good good I'm glad so you get in okay right yes 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 good thanks. okay welcome thanks oh you're from Turkey right yes I am from Turkey oh okay listen we have a conference coming up uh, February fifth one week from today and we were wondering if it'd be worth to translate into Turkish. Ah, I, what, I what do you what do you think? Uh, this is a good uh, for for us uh, for you and us. I think so. Okay, okay. I'm I'm going to think about that because um, it's easy to get a translator, uh, and it may bring more Turkish neurosurgeons here. Do you understand? Yes. Uh, you are in the, you are in Miami now. Yeah, in a webinar, a translator during the res, re, into, into Turkish. Yes. Uh, uh, it, it's difficult to explain. But anyways, welcome. Thanks.
How are you doing? Oh, Sam, how are you doing? I'm fine. How okay, it's time to go over the schedule. Okay. Uh, okay. Because okay, let's go. Can you screen share the schedule, please? Give me one uh, moment. Okay. Kind of doing this at the last minute. <laughs> Maybe I can share it. That's it. You got the schedule? Yes. Okay. Does the beauty you? Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out when to have the uh, the lounge. Okay. Because I, okay. I don't I don't want to interrupt so much. Okay. 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 I'll, uh, maybe after Dr. Goel. I'll announce it. Okay. Okay. And maybe after Baldos Doncini, just just a couple different ones. Okay. Okay. And because the last time I think I inter, I inter when I edited it, it, I was interrupting you too much. <laughs> you, you know, you know, it's okay. You know, Never it's mind. So so yeah. You get the screen option, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll just say, Sam, do you mind if we announce, you know, the uh, Zoom lounge? Because I know a tool likes them. He likes to go chat with the people. And then I'll just Great. turn it back. To, turn it back to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you uh, make my uh, account uh, co-host? You make your what? Oh, co-host. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mauricio's here. Good. Maybe I'll make him host today. Let's see. Mauricio, you there? Dr. Bennett, good morning. Good morning, uh, Mauricio. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Well, listen. Do you want to? You got a cam You got your camera, right? Uh, yeah, I got my camera. Just give me a second. Okay. I'll be back. Yeah. Okay.
You see that, Sam? I put the registrants in the chat. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we got 12 minutes, Sam. I'm gonna, I'll be back, okay? Okay. Hi, Abby. How are you? Hi, Sam. I'm fine. What about you? I'm okay. <laughs> Good morning. Good ready? morning, Abby. Good morning, John. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. Where's the elephant? <laughs> I left it in the stable. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people will think we're delusional. <laughs> I think they're used to it by now. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, it's early over here. It's uh, well, no, seven o'clock. It's not too early. It's unusually cold in Miami. It's unusually cold in Mumbai. Yeah, is it really? <laughs> I mean, it's not really cold, but it's much more than it normally is. Yeah, yeah I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Um, but compared to where I used to live in Boston, Boston, they got. They're going to get 18 inches of snow, I think, today. Yeah. That's a lot. Miami. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. For, for them, it's not normal. Yeah. No, as is good. This is good weather for us. Otherwise, you, don't, you, don't, you don't get snow in Mumbai, right? Uh, no. no. We, barely, we barely make it to 19 degrees or 18 degrees. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of AC air conditioning there. Yeah. Yeah, you have to have it, or can you live without it? Right now, you can be without it, but otherwise, yeah. in the summer, you need it. You have to, you have to have it. Yeah. You know Mauricio, <coughs> right? Yeah. Hi, Mauricio. And you know so Sam. Sam, you. have you met? Have you met Sam, uh, Mauricio? No, I haven't. Sam, Sam is a promoter nice par, par excellence. Nice to meet um, you, Sam. From the Cairo. He, he, he put together this conference, got all the speakers, which, uh, as you know, is no easy task to coordinate everyone's schedule. No, it isn't. So... Uh, I would ask you to uh, host uh, Mauricio, but there's a couple of things I got to do during the webcast. Okay. Um, uh, this will probably a, be a pretty large one. But uh, you know, Sam, our Latin webinars, uh, they draw very well. Yes, I am. Good, Matthias. Good how are you? 
Good morning. Welcome, David. Good, good morning, everybody. Hi, Samet. Hi, John. Mauricio, Abdia. Good morning. Good afternoon. Dr. Matias. Good morning. Buenos días. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Matias. A pleasure to see you again. Yeah. Morning from Brazil. Is it cold down there? Sorry, John. Is it cold down there, uh, Matthias? No, no. Oh. Uh, we, we have today 24 centigrades. Oh, okay. Because Miami is cold yes, today. Miami really? is cold. Yeah. I can't believe it. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> it is almost impossible in Miami. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it is. Sometimes. Unbelievable. Usually around Christmas, there's a couple of days where it gets down to 40 centigrade. Tonight, it's supposed to go to 40, but I don't know what that is, uh, centigrade. It's 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's really cold yeah, for Miami. Yeah, that's close to freezing for for in, in centigrade. You feel like you're uh, living in Boston. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Boston. <laughs> when I go home to Boston, that's where I'm from. I, I don't like it. I don't. I don't go there yes. in the winter anymore. Yes. You know, when you get I, older, you, I, I tolerate the the cold less. Yes, I was living in Boston during three months, uh, two years ago, and it was really uh, uh, uncomfortable to me because. Oh I, really? You know, yeah, you've never lived in the cold weather. Yeah. Before? Yeah, with a lot of snow, one meter of snow or uh, fifty. Uh, um, um, centimeters of snow every day really really yeah they're, they're expecting one today uh, 18 inches well uh, centimeters that's like 28 centimeters today they're expecting and the, did you did you ever drive in the snow <laughs> no it's very difficult <laughs> it's different than driving I, normally i can imagine i can imagine yes fortunately and um, during these three months, I only walk around the city. Well, you know, when you're driving in the snow, <clears throat> you cannot put your feet on the brakes immediately. You got to very tap them lightly. Yes. But people get nervous and they put them on and then they skid when they yes. put the brakes on. It's a different Around way of different many, way many of driving. Different way of driving. Every yeah. day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a lot. Yeah. Good lot. To this reason, yes. Okay, we have more speakers here, right, uh, Sam? You, you have the first yes. speaker, Sam? You're all set to go? Everyone is here. I'm the first speaker, John. <laughs> oh, okay, you're very good. Very good, sorry about that. Uh, sorry about Abby, you're sorry about that. Hi, Professor So. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you all. Good morning, Dr. Sue. Good morning. We start in four minutes. Two minutes, John. Four minutes, right, talk, Sam? Uh, right, Sam? Two minutes. I will talk for uh, just two minutes. Um, Bayan Batson, how are you? She's from Mongolia. She's a neurosurgeon from Mongolia. Bayan Batson, you, is your camera working today? Perhaps not. Well, you know, you know, Abby and Matthias and Sanford, we, we may have the Zoom lounge after a couple of speakers speak. Uh, no, no, we can't have the Zoom lounge. I, I only have one Zoom, so we can't do the Zoom. We can't do the Zoom lounge, unfortunately. So we'll have to suffer through.
Oh, okay. That's a... Oh, great. Haman Shir Shinwani from Afghanistan. Welcome. Can you introduce yourself, Shaman, if you want to? Before we start, we're going to start in two minutes. Okay, John, we can start now. Okay, okay, Sam, just give me a second. Okay, hold on. There's a couple of people I've got to mute. One second. Okay. Okay, Sam. Okay, here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach, just like in the background, but it's cold today. Uh, we have I have the honor of starting the EWNS collaboration with Neurosurgical TV. The topic, uh, pituitary approaches. And I'd like to introduce uh, the in inimitable Sam L. Morsi. Welcome, Sam. Good morning. Good morning, John. Thank you. Uh, dear friends and the brother, welcome all to EWNC Academy Pituitary Session. This session aims to orient all of us about recent advances in surgical management of pituitary gland lesions. It also dedicated to the soul of Professor Fred Gentili who is a well-known international neurosurgeon. May his soul rest in peace. Now we will start our session by a lecture of my dear friend, Avida Shah. Dear professor, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And uh, this is an apt topic that we have selected to pay our respects to Professor Fred Gently. As you know, he was a world-class endoscopic surgeon and also a master skull-based surgeon. So let us begin our this year's session organized by EWNC by my dear friend Sam with the master gland, the pituitary gland. So I'm going to discuss the anatomical correlates that are important for pituitary surgery. I thank my colleague, Dr. Subdeep for many of the images in my presentation. So this is our recent paper on the subject where we have discussed how the anatomy correlates and affects the surgery for pituitary tumors. So this pituitary gland that you see has a very unique location right in the center of the skull base. It is neither extracranial nor intracranial. It is neither intradural nor extradural. And I think I would like to call it as interdural as we will see in the relationship of the dura shortly. So this pituitary gland occupies a position where it is in close relation to the sphenoid sinus in the front and cavernous sinus lateral. Why is this location important? As you know, that the attic of the nose is the, uh, is the area of the nose that is that the air reaches directly. So you can, the attic of the nose gets the temperature of the air directly which is transmitted by the sphenoid sinus mucosa into the cavernous sinus. And together, both these sinuses regulate the temperature of the body. And this information is given to the pituitary gland, which in turn regulates the hormonal secretion. So this is how this gland of ours maintains homeostasis of our body. You see the location of the pituitary gland. It is surrounded superiorly, laterally, posteriorly, by many vital neurovascular structures. And the only access that is the best for this tumor 
is anteriorly through the sphenoid sinus, as we will see in the later part of the presentation. So this, you see this region, this is that of the pituitary gland. Superior, it is related to the optic nerves and the optic chiasm, to the circle of release, more specifically to the anterior cerebral artery complex, to the basal part of the frontal lobe, to the hypothalamus, to the suprachiasmatic recess in this region. Laterally, it is related to the internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus. Inferiorly, it is related to the sphenoid sinus. And posteriorly, as you can see here, it is related to the basilar artery and to the brainstem. So again, you see the location of the pituitary, and this is the region of the sphenoid sinus. This is probably one of the most important landmarks that is important to us for pituitary surgery. Superiorly, you can see how it is related to the optic chiasm. This is the stalk as it goes on to reach the hypothalamus or the floor of the third ventricle. This is the region of the hypothalamus, the floor of the third ventricle. And this is this is a image that's showing the liliquist membrane, which separates the chiasmatic cistern from the interpeduncular cistern in this region. The important path to access this tumor, access the pituitary, is through the nose. And we will see a little bit of the anatomy of the nose also as we go ahead. So the pituitary gland rests on this structure. This is the cella tersica, and you can see its saddle shape right in the center of the middle cranial fossa. The important prominences that are relevant for this region, this is the region of the plenum sphenoidale, this is the region of the tuberculum cellae, and this is the region of the dorsum cellae. This groove in between the plenum sphenoidale and the tuberculum cellae is the chiasmatic sulcus. This is the anterior clinoid process. This is the optic canal. This is the carotid sulcus, which is grooves the lateral part of the sphenoid bone and is occupied by the internal carotid artery in its way in the cavernous sinus. The anterior clinoid process comes in this region. Sometimes you have a middle clinoid process and the, dors the posterior clinoid process comes at a, as a projection of lateral to the dorsum cellae. So the important structures while performing a transcranial approach to the pituitary are this pink structure that you see here is the anterior clinoid process. This part of the bone here is the optic strut. And this blue shaded region is occupied by the cavernous sinus. There are important dural relations in this region. And as we proceed, I will show you the dural relation. So let's look at the pituitary gland from superior. So this is the superior aspect of the superior view of the pituitary gland. You can see this fold of dura matter is actually the diaphragma cellae. It normally does not have such a wide opening. It, the opening size may vary from person to person and it transmits the stalk of the pituitary. So the diaphragma cellae engages anteriorly with the dura on the plenum sphenoidal, posteriorly with the dura of the dorsum cellae. Laterally, it goes over the anterior clinoid process and the roof of the, and into the roof of the cavernous sinus and then curves downwards as the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So you see the optic nerves and the carotid and their relations to the pituitary. The pituitary lies medial and inferior to them. You see this is the optic nerve that has been reflected superiorly and this is the ophthalmic artery as it goes on to supply the optic nerve. Now the dura of the diaphragma cellae has been removed and this is the P-shaped structure of the pituitary gland. So you can easily make out the difference. So this dark firm structure that lies in the anterior part of the cella is the anterior pituitary. It hugs the stalk the pituitary stalk and forms the pars tuberalis in this region. And posteriorly, this is the soft gelatinous portion of the posterior lobe of the pituitary. The anterior lobe is relatively easy to separate from the dura of the cellar walls, both inferiorly and laterally, whereas the posterior lobe is quite stuck and is actually covered a little bit by the dorsum cellae, if you see in the lateral view. Medially, this is the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. And this is the carotid artery in the cavernous sinus. And this is, it is coming out from the roof of the cavernous sinus. So this is another image showing the relation to the various cranial nerves in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. You see this artery that arises from the posterior bend where the ICA just turns to enter the cavernous sinus. And this is the meningohypophyseal trunk. And the inferior hypophyseal artery is a branch of the meningohypophyseal trunk. And it runs in this region to supply the posterior lobe of the pituitary. 
Further laterally, this is one branch that is the dorsal clival artery going inferiorly. Further laterally, there is the third nerve. And then you have the V1, V2, and V3 is in the lowest part. And this structure that is entering here in Dorelos canal is the sixth cranial nerve. This is the dura in the region of the clivus. So the blood supply of the pituitary gland is mainly by three vessels. So this is the superior hypophysial artery which comes out as a branch from the ophthalmic segment of the ICA or the C4. The inferior hypophysial artery, as we just saw, comes out directly from the cavernous part of the ICA, where it takes a bend to enter into the cavernous sinus. And then there are direct branches from the ICA. These are the mechanals capsular artery, as I will show you in some other images. So this vessel that is also arising from the ICA is the ophthalmic artery. So now we have seen the pituitary from the front from the superior view. Now we have to see it from the anterior aspect. So this is a view of the nasal cavity. This is the medial turbinate. This is the spinoid ostium. And this is an important landmark for endoscopic surgery. This is the spinopalatine foramen. Going further inside the cella and inside the spinoid ostium, these are the structures that are visualized. So this is the region of the clivus. This is the cellar floor. And these prominences that you see here are the prominences that are made in the posterior wall of the spinoid sinus by certain important structures. So this is the prominence of the optic nerve. This is the prominence of the carotid artery. This is the opticocarotid recess. This is sometimes you see this prominence in the lateral wall of the spinoid sinus, which is made by the V2. And within this, you see the blue region that is the basilar sinus here and other sinuses, as I will show you. So this is another view of another specimen showing the various prominences in the region of the posterior wall of the spinoid sinus. So again, this is the optic prominence. This is the carotid artery. This is the optic opticocarotid recess. This is the clival region. This is the bend of the cavernous of the carotid artery, as you can see. This is the paraclival carotid artery. More anteriorly here is the region of the tuberculum and the planum spinoidum. Now, why is this anatomy important, especially while performing surgery? So the important aspect in this anterior part is to know the distance between both the carotid arteries. Normally, the carotid arteries are the closest just below the tuberculum cell. But sometimes this is what happens. This is a patient with an acromegaly. And you see how close the carotid arteries come to each other in the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. And this is where a transpinoidal surgery may cause injury, and there is a high chance of a carotid injury during this surgery. Sometimes the carotid come very close to each other, and that's when, you, when it is known as the kissing carotids. So this is when the bone of the posterior wall of the spinoid sinus has been removed. The periosteal dura is still seen here in the region of the clivus, in the covering a little part of the carotid artery. This is the pituitary with the dural covering and the capsule of the pituitary. This is the inferior hypophysial artery. It joins the inferior hypophysial artery of the opposite side and together they supply the posterior lobe of the pituitary. And this is the curve of the carotid artery. Further laterally, you see the nerves in the cavernous sinus, but we will not go into that right now. <clears throat> so this is another important thing that you have to understand while performing pituitary surgery by the transpinoidal or the endoscopic route. So there are a lot of sinuses in this region. So if you see this one, that is superiorly, that is the anterior intercavernous sinus. Then you have this region where both the sinuses are, cavernous sinuses are connected. This is the inferior cavernous sinus. This is the basilar sinus. And of course, laterally are the cavernous sinuses. So just like you have a circle of bilis that is lying superiorly to the pituitary gland and in the supracellar cistern, this arterial ring, when it connects, when the anterior and the posterior intercavernous sinuses connect, it forms what is known as a circular sinus, or as Professor Goyal and Professor Kothari used to call it, the venous circle of relief. What is the significance of this is, this venous circle actually acts as the sump, acts as a sump and helps in modulating the intraocular pressure during straining, during the Valsalva maneuver, and even in cases of cavernous sinus thrombosis. So these are some dural attachments that you see in the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. Going further, when you remove the dura and the capsule of the pituitary gland, this is what you'll see. This is the pituitary. 
Laterally, it is the carotid artery. More superiorly is the optic nerve. This is the region of the tuberculum cellae. This is the region of the clivus. Again, this is the inferior hypophyseal artery. The next blood supply to the pituitary gland is the superior hypophyseal artery that comes as a direct branch from the carotid, the ophthalmic segment of the carotid. So this is the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, and this is the superior hypophyseal artery as you see it branching. The superior hypophyseal artery has various patterns of branching. So this one is called as the candle bra appearance of the superior hypophyseal artery, where you see that it comes here and then distributes into twigs going to the infundibulum, going to the optic chiasm and to the other structures in this region. So the superior hypophyseal artery mainly supplies the pituitary stalk and the anterior lobe of the pituitary. Sometimes there is a tree-like branching pattern of the superior hypophyseal artery where the branches occur in this region and then they go out as single twigs, twigs to supply this region. This is the region of the frontal lobe. Someone else is sharing their screen, John. Is it visible now? John? It's okay. Abby. It's okay. Okay. Abby. okay. 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 So now going and seeing a complete overview of the pituitary gland from anteriorly. So these are all the structures that are seen. This is the optic nerve. This is the optic chiasm going posteriorly and forming the optic tracts. This is the region of the anterior cerebral artery, the ACOM and the A1, A2 complex in this region in the suprachiasmatic cistern. This is the carotid artery. This is the ophthalmic branch. This is the superior hypophyseal artery going to the pituitary stalk. This is the inferior hypophyseal artery going to the posterior part of the uh, pituitary gland. And these are the various important structures in this region. Again, going further out, you see more structures here. And this is the posterior relation of the pituitary, the basilar artery and the brainstem. This is the sixth cranial nerve as it is going laterally to the carotid in the cavernous sinus, as you can see here. And these are the other structures of the other nerves in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And these are all the anatomy that I've already showed earlier. So now we have seen the anatomy of the pituitary from superiorly and from anteriorly. Now the most, another important structure that is relevant for pituitary surgery is this entity that is the diaphragma cellae. So technically diaphragma, what does it mean? Actually, it's a Greek word. It means through a fence. Basically, when you go through a fence, that is the term. In our medical parlance, it is basically a thin sheet of membrane that separates two structures. And if you, anyone is interested in photography, so diaphragm is like an aperture that you can enlarge or decrease while taking a photograph. So why is this diaphragm relevant? And I will show you now. See the anatomy of the diaphragm. So this is the pituitary gland, the pituitary stalk. This is the diaphragm that lies between the optic nerve and superior to the pituitary gland. It goes forward and joins the dura of the tuberculum and planum sphenoidal. Laterally, it goes as the falciform ligament and then continues over the ACP into the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. From the pituitary, it laterally goes forming the roof of the cavernous sinus and then the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So this is another image showing the dural relation. So this is the tuberculum, this is the dorsum, this is the pituitary stalk. So you see the relation of the diaphragma as it goes, it forms the middle wall of the cavernous sinus here and more superiorly, it forms the roof and lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Here you can see it more clearly as it joins the tuberculum cellae forming the roof and the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And here you can see how it forms the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. Here you can see that the carotid artery has been reflected laterally. And this is the medial part of the diaphragma cellae as it forms the cellar part of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. So this is a diagrammatic representation that I have made to show you how the diaphragma actually goes. So this is the pituitary gland and this is the dural covering. So this is the region of the stalk. So the diaphragma cellae actually goes superiorly over the roof of the cavernous sinus and then forms the outermost layer of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Here at the region of the middle fossa floor, it is closely adherent to the endosteal layer of the dura. So this is the meningeal layer, this is the endosteal layer. So in the region of the cavernous sinus, both these layers split. And you can see here that the endosteal layer throws up a membrane here 
and you have the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, which is covered by two parts of the dura. Now, the endosteal layer, layer also continues into the inferior part of the cella and the sphenoid, thus forming the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, as you can see here. So, part of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus and the lateral wall of the pituitary is formed by the meningeal layer, which is part of the diaphragma cellae, and the endosteal layer of the sphenoid sinus. So, this is the cellar part and this is the sphenoid part of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. And most of the studies that have been performed have seen that there is probably no deficiency in this layer. And this, is, this study was also performed, performed by Professor Goel way back in 1993. So why am I showing you the anatomy of the diaphragm? Because it is most relevant to understand how to approach the pituitary gland. All pituitary tumors, majority of them, can be approached and should be approached transphenoidally, whether by a subluable transphenoidal approach or by the endoscopic endonasal approach. The reason is because they all lie below the diaphragma cellae and the diaphragma actually forms a protective layer over the pituitary gland, thus preventing any injury in the intracranial compartment. So this is Professor Goel's classification of pituitary tumors. So this is grade one pituitary tumor. As you can see that the diaphragm is elevated Everything, the whole tumor is below the diaphragm. It has not transgressed. And sometimes there are lobulations of the diaphragm that are formed, conforming to the shape of the pituitary gland. And this all will be discussed in detail by Professor Goen. So this is grade two, where you see that the tumor goes into the cavernous sinus and encases the carotid of the cavernous sinus, the supracellar part and the cavernous part. So this is grade two. Grade three is when there is elevation of the roof of the cavernous sinus, as you can see in this image. And grade four is when the diaphragma cellae is transgressed by the tumor and it encases the circle of villus, or the arteries of the circle of villus. So this is the major deterrent to transphenoidal surgery. Now let's go into the surgical anatomy of the surgical approaches for the pituitary. So this is the cut section of a bone showing the lateral wall of the nose. So this structure that you see here is the inferior nasal concha. So these are the superior and middle concha, which are parts of the ethmoid bone. The major bone that is important to us while performing transmural surgery is the vomer, which you see here. And this is the sphenoid sinus. The sphenoid sinus has sometimes multiple septate. It's not necessarily midline. They may be off the midline. And when doing transmural surgery, they can easily be broken and the pituitary approach. So this is the anterior cellar wall or cellar floor. This is the frontal sinus and this is the region of the clivus. So what is the significance of sphenoid sinus while performing pituitary surgery? So there are three types of sphenoid sinus that are common. So this is the pre-cellar type of sphenoid sinus where you see that the classification is based on the pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus. So you see this pneumatization does not extend beyond the anterior wall of the cellar floor. So this is the pre-cellar type of the sphenoid sinus. This is the cellar type of the sphenoid sinus where you can see that the pneumatization extends below and posterior to the, to the cellar floor going right up to the clivus. Sometimes there is a very thin bone that separates the sphenoid sinus and the clivus. And this is the conchal type where you see there is a thick layer of bone between the sphenoid sinus and the cellar floor. And this sometimes can be as about 10 millimeter in thickness and it has to be broken while performing transpenoidal surgery. So this is again a lateral view of the nose showing the various structures and this is how this posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus is related to the pituitary gland. This is the region of the vomer. So again just to show you the direction, this is the sphenoid sinus, this is the septae within the sphenoid sinus, this is the ostium of the maxillary sinus and these are the inferior nasal conchi and the superior and medial nasal conchi. Now I have removed the conchi. The superior and medial, middle nasal conchi have been removed and you see the ethmoid cells covered by this thin layer of bone. This is the sphenoid ostium. Again, this is the sphenoid sinus. This is the anterior clinoid process and this is the floor of the cella. Now this is the most important bone while performing transphenoidal surgery. We perform all our pituitary tumors by the sublabial and transphenoidal route. And this is the anterior view. And you see this marker that I've put here. This indicates the sphenoid sinus and the anterior cellar wall. So this keel of the vomer, as you see, it, it looks like the anterior aspect of a ship or the keel, 
When you open this, it directly leads you into the sphenoid sinus and the cellar floor. So these are some images from Professor Roton. And you can see how this is the nasal septum. This is the nasal spine. So nasal septum is formed anteriorly by the perpendicular plate of ethmoid and posteriorly by the vomer, as we saw. And more anteriorly, there is the septal cartilage. So when you enter from the transpenoid route, you have to separate this mucosa from the nasal spine, separate this whole mucosa in the region of the septum, and then insert your blades in this region. This is the maxillary sinus, and this is the supracellar system. So the posterior ethmoid air cells point to the sphenoid ostia. These are the posterior ethmoid air cells, and this is the sphenoid ostia that lie just posterior to the superior concha. This is the middle concha, and this is the vomer bone that you have to identify when performing a transpenoidal approach. So when you break this keel of the vomer, you straight enter into the sphenoid sinus. Now, another important aspect of the sphenoid sinus is sometimes as absorption occurs or as pneumatization increases, the walls of the spine, uh, sinus, the bony walls are reabsorbed and the mucosa is directly in contact with the neurovascular structures. So it, there might be no wall between the sphenoid mucosa and the carotid artery or between the optic nerve or even laterally in the cavernous sinus. So when in, you insert the speculum, when opening it, you have to be careful, otherwise you may cause injury in this region. So this is once the cellar floor has been removed and you see the magnificent pituitary gland. So this vessel that you see here that is directly coming from the, cav from the cavernous part of the carotid artery, this is the McConnell's capsular artery and it supplies the dura and the diaphragm cellae and the pituitary gland. So this is the sublabial transpenoidal rote that we use for performing pituitary surgery. So when you look from anteriorly, this is the nasal spine. This is the keel of the vomer. This is the inferior nasal concha. This is the middle concha and this is the superior concha. So the septal cartilage is broken here. The perpendicular plate of ethmoid is broken here. So you separate the mucosa from the nasal spine and insert your speculum between the septum and the mucosa to reach the keel of the vomer. So intraoperatively, when you see, this is how you identify. This is the keel of the vomer, and that means you have reached the sphenoid sinus. Once you open the keel of the vomer, this is the sphenoid sinus, and you can see that sometimes it may have many septae, as are seen here. These are the impressions of the carotid artery of the optic nerve in the sphenoid sinus. This is actually the median nerve in the lateral part. So once you remove the, once you're inside the sphenoid sinus and you've broken the septae, this is the anterior cellar wall. Once you remove the anterior cellar wall, this is the dura that you will have to incise. So basically when you make an incision, use a cruciate incision either in this X, this form or in an X shaped fashion. And then you open the dura and the tumor is usually a powdery tumor that comes out immediately when you're performing the surgery. And this is an image of the diaphragm cellae at the end of surgery. So you can see that this is a firm barrier that is present superior to the pituitary tumors. And once you remove the pituitary tumor, it bulges out into the field and you can see this diaphragm very nicely. Lastly, just to complete this, the other approach that is not being used, but sometimes people do use it for giant pituitary tumors is the transcranial route. So basically historically, Cushing first started using the transpenoidal route. Then he shifted to the transcranial route. But luckily, there were surgeons who continued doing the transpenoidal route and has continued to its popularity. And the relation of the diaphragm to the uh, pituitary, as described by Professor Goel, has made it has made transpenoidal surgery an important, is the best avenue to approach pituitary tumors. So this is the subfrontal approach that can be used for transcranial surgery. So this is the craniotomy that should be performed in this region. This is the region of the pituitary stroke. This is liliquous membrane. These are the optic nerves, the optic chiasm. This is the lamina terminalis. This you can see the ICA and the A1 and the ACOM complex. This is the MCA. So this is the approach that will be that you will see during a craniotomy. And this is a subfrontal approach that we use while performing surgery. And you can see in this image, this is the optic nerve. This is the carotid artery. The, a1, the MCA, and this is the region of the pituitary stroke. Actually, here more laterally, you can see the other IC and the third nerve, but I'm not sure it is clear in this image. So lastly, this is the image of the pituitary gland as we know it, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Abby, for this excellent presentation.
is the unit question from panelist okay uh, if you have uh, any question please type it in uh, chat box or in uh, question section and now we will uh, shift to uh, our next speaker both so so please start sharing your screen thank you Abby. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Same. Uh, everybody see my screen now? It's okay, sir. Okay. Today I would like to talk about the uh, uh, pretemporal transcarbonate approach to invasive pituitary macroadenoma. And I'm from Taipei Veteran General Hospital. And actually I have done a clinical fellowship at UMS uh, since 2007. And to 2009, I learned a lot of uh, concept and techniques of microsurgery from Professor Yasuke and Professor Mahti and Professor Christ. And actually, uh, when I did clinical fellowship in Little Rock, I spent a lot of time in the lab and especially uh, in the cavern of sinus. But I realized uh, the anatomy is not the things that you, you have to memorize, like uh, that she uh, just introduced. Now you have to apply the uh, knowledge of anatomy to your uh, surgical routine. So how you can apply all these uh, anatomy knowledge to your daily routine? So this is the photo of the real intra-opt uh, pictures. And actually you have, you spent the, you retire in the lab and you uh, delineate every uh, decade details of the anatomy. And when you're back to your uh, surgery uh, operating theater, you have to know uh, which, which the most important landmark, which guides you to the next step of the surgery. So later I will show how I did the uh, transcranial approach to uh, invasive or a giant pituitary tumor. In a previous lectures, I um, and based on my experiences, when I did cavernous sinus surgery, I classify all these anatomies into dura, bone, venous channels, and neurovascular structures, because you have to know uh, in each categories, you have to uh, be very well familiar with all these landmarks. For example, in the dura structure, you have to know what is the inner ring, outer ring, tentorian structure, and you have to know how to uh, deal with all these structures to expose the, uh, to get an adequate surgical field. And especially when you did the cavernous sinus surgery and all these cranial nerves are penetrating the dura and into the cavernous sinus. So they were forming the ring-like structure surrounding all these important neurovascular uh, uh, structures. And if you are very familiar with all these anatomy and you know the basic steps to open the cavernous sinus, like I showed in the black blocks, the basics to the cavernous sinus approach is you have to know how to peel off the dura because there are double layers dura overlying the little wall of the cavernous sinus. And you have to know how to peel all these temporal dura off the little wall of cavernous sinus and you have to know how to do the anterior clindotectomy to expose the superior wall of the cavernous sinus. And you have to know how to deal with all these ring structures, like I mentioned. And you can uh, uh, finish the first steps of the cavernous sinus approach. Then based on your experience and different uh, pathology in and around the cavernous sinus, you can uh, modify all these basics for example, you can do just the transmicroscape approach for trigeminal schwannoma, or just do the transcavernous approach, and for example, for uh, invasive pituitary tumor. So if you're familiar with the, each uh, different variants of cavernous sinus exposure, you can deal with a lot of uh, pathologies or vascular lesions surrounding this important uh, area. And based on the learning curve in cavernous sinus surgery, I um, categorize into four levels. And today, um, the invasive pituitary tumor, I put it in the level three 
um, of the cabinet sinus surgery, because in this uh, level, people have to know how to open the superior wall uh, along with the removal of the anterior clinoid. People have to know how to open the lateral wall and open each window between the nerves and vessels. And also you have to open the posterior wall of the cabinet sinus because most of the uh, invasive pituitary tumor, they, they are extending positively uh, into the subtemporal region or in, even extending into the sylvan fissure. So uh, in this uh, uh, cabinet sinus approach, the most important uh, concept and techniques, like I mentioned, is to peel the dura off the wall of the cabinet sinus to make an anatomy shell. So we can do almost totally the intradural approach to this area. And you have to remove in the bone blocks in the way to your view. For example, you have to remove the anterior clinoid to uh, open the superior wall of cavernous sinus, and you can go this uh, route into the cella, and even the supracellar region to deal with the invasive pituitary tumor. And the most important one is you have to free all the nerves from where it is anchored to the dura so that you can widen the windows between the nerves and also you can minimize the traction injury to the nerves. So I always did, did a pretemporal approach to the cavernous sinus like my uh, teacher, Dr. Chris did. And for a met, uh, invasive pituitary tumor, uh, you need to uh, actually to mobilize the zygoma to make the temporary muscle uh, to reflect it more down to the base. So the first step of the uh, uh, cavernous sinus approach is to identify the so-called dura fold, uh, which uh, formed by the meningo orbital artery. If you cut coagulate and divide the dura fold, you can easily expose the superior orbital fissure, and you can find the dura group below the superior orbital fissure, and you can find the double layers, the beginning of the double layers overlying the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And usually I'm using the sharp dissection and to make uh, the plane between these double layers of dura. And I push the dura backwards until I expose the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, especially the anterior one third of the lateral wall. So you can see the anterior clinoid, you can see the trochlear nerve and the first two branches of trigeminal nerve. Then you can turn your microscope to the another uh, view uh, to localize the middle managerial artery uh, is just beneath the foramen spinosum. And you can do the same thing. You divide the middle managerial artery to expose, to help you to expose the V3. So you can identify the foramen overly and the V3. Then you can push the dura backwards and continuously uh, peeling the dura off the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Then you can identify the GSPN and preserve it and expose the anterior petrous region, the so-called Kawase triangle or rhomboid. So in this way, you can uh, totally expose the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So you can see the anterior clinoid, severe orbital fissure, trochlear nerve, and all three branches of the trigeminal and the gesserin ganglion and the macros cave in the anterior pitus region. So if you can totally expose the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, now you are uh, equipped the techniques to deal with the uh, invasive pituitary tumors because this is the uh, most uh, important uh, techniques. And sometimes because the pituitary tumor, um, if it is invasive, uh, most of the tumor, they are extending into the mesiotemporal region or even uh, upward into the supercellar or third ventricle. So you need to cut the dura to expose the uh, intradural space. And so since you already exposed the 
the literal of the Kevin and Sanders in the HR Dura way. So you need to cut the Dura along the seven fissure down to the base and extend the incision bilaterally to expose the uh, intradural optic nerve and the intradural uh, uh, until literally until the uh, tendur incisura. So this picture showed that, like I mentioned, all the important nerves and the vessels, they are penetrating the dura into the cavernous sinus. So they always forming the ring-like structures surrounding all these structures. For example, they're forming the uh, outer ring surrounding the carotid. They're forming the ring-like structures surrounding the optic nerve, so-called the phosphor ligament. And also there's a uh, ring-like structures surrounding the oculomotor nerve in the oculomotor uh, wing, uh, triangle. So you need to uh, free all these uh, important neurovascular structures from these anchoring points. So you can widen the space or windows between these neurovascular structures and lessen the traction, the stress over all these important structures. So this intra-op photo shows the forceful ligament surrounding the optic nerve. If I cut the forceful ligament and outer ring surrounding the optic nerve and carotid, I can widen the window between the carotid optic uh, space. So this is the good, you can get a good uh, trajectory of view to the uh, supracellar uh, region. Like, or if you can free all these uh, nerve and vessels from the dura structures, actually you can totally unlock in the cavernous sinus. So in this photo, you can see uh, I totally uh, free the optic nerve and even I totally free the carotids even in the intracavernous portion. So you can see the carotid, the siphon and intracavernous carotid. If you, um, you can mobilize the oculomotor nerve because I totally uh, widely open the severe wall and later wall of the cavernous sinus. But if you have to mobilize the third nerve, the first step is to free the third nerve from the dura ring structure like uh, at the uh, point in oculomotor uh, triangle. So for the uh, invasive um, joint pituitary tumor, I mentioned that uh, it's in my uh, learning curve is at the level three. So I need to do uh, open the severe wall, little wall and posterior wall of the cavern and sinus so that I can reach the cella, supercella, interpeduncular and preponding space. So the basic techniques for this level three, especially the invasive macroadenoma is to full exposure of later wall of cavernous sinus, to remove the anterior clinodectomy, to cut all the ring-like structure, for example, the forceful ligament or uh, outer ring, and to open the oculomotor window to free the oculomotor nerve. And sometimes you may need to open the sylvian so that you can uh, retract the frontal to reach the supercella and even the third ventricle region. And sometimes you need to open the Mako's cave and divide in the tentorium in the sura, uh, to facilitate the view to the uh, tumor beneath the mesial temporal region. And also you have to know how to open the windows between each nerves in the cavern and sinus. So this animation show that the invasive joint pituitary tumor, they can extend severely into the supercellular region, positively to the mesial temporal region and inferior down to the uh, sphenoid sinus or the uh, maxillary sinus. So actually uh, people like to uh, classify the size, the extent of the tumor growth. So in this picture, uh, the, this is the basics. Uh, this is the beginning of the tumor invasion. The tumor invades the uh, cavernous sinus, but just at the level of the carotid but they can extend beyond the carotid and possibly to the posterior wall of the cavern sinus, like this picture show, the tumor extend 
into the pursuit of the capital centers and beyond the karate level. And also they can extend su superiorly even into the third ventricle or even uh, extendedly to the temporal or infratemporal region or even the bilaterally to the cavern sinus or the cerebral fissure. So in this such cases, uh, I did a transcranial approach uh, with indication that the tumor uh, extended uh, uh, to beyond the carotid or essentially be into the mesial temporal region or the, or the cerebral fissure. But if the tumor large but stay within the midline, I always prefer the patient for endoscopic approach. So this photo I show, uh, just to show the, the basic techniques to, to expose the cavernous sinus to deal with the basic pituitary tumor. First, I totally widely expose the little wall of the cavernous sinus. And you can see the uh, tracheal nerve, V1, V2, and I remove the anterior clinoid. So I open the superior wall of the clinoid so I can see the clinoid portion of the clinoid. Then I free the oculomotor nerve. Like I said, I free the nerve from the oculomotor triangle. So I can mobilize, mobilize the oculomotor nerve to widen the space in the superior wall of cavernous sinus. So I can remove the tumor and I can trace the carotids into the cavernous sinus. Then I can open the window between the third and fourth nerve, the so-called Parkinson triangle. So I can remove the tumor and also I localize the intracavernous carotid within the Parkinson triangle. And the next step is to localize the sixth nerve beneath the tracheal nerve so I can trace the sixth nerve down to the duratal canal. So like you, like, like you can see, it's the sixth nerve and the intracavernous carotids. After you remove the tumor step-by-step step within each window. Then I remove the tumor within the uh, window, uh, in the window within, between the V1 and V2. Also I trace the uh, intracavernous carotids. And in this way, step by step, uh, from the spill wall to the little wall of the cavernous sinus, uh, you can trace all these important neurovascular structure and preserve it. And also, you have to identify some important branches from the carotid, like a manigal, manigal hypophysial trunk or inferior little trunk. Then I open the dura and I widely. Uh, widen the window between the carotids and the uh, oculomotor nerve, so I can remove the tumor in the uh, interpeduncular fossa. So you can see this is the carotid and the pecan anterior corridor artery. Also, I can remove the tumor uh, between the uh, carotid and the nerve, uh, extending into the subalocellar region. So this is the four Push up photos. So you can see I totally remove the tumor and actually I delineate and free all the nerves and uh, vessels uh, in and outside the cavernous sinus. And the patient actually has a transient oculomotor palsy, but after six months, we, I refer, always refer the patient for acupuncture. Usually after six okay. months, the patient Almost fully recovered. So in this case, I will show them my surgical video. The tumor uh, extending into the cavernous sinus and also uh, upward into the supracellular region and backward to the um, mesotemporal region. So the first step, I uh, remove the little wall of the orbit and to localize the manical orbital artery is the so-called dura fold. And I 
expose the superior, orb superior orbital fissure. I divide the meningo orbital artery, the dura fold. I find the beginning of the double layers of dura. And I use in the sharp dissection to make the plane clear and using the blunt dissection to pull the dura backwards to peeling the dura off the later wall of the cavernous sinus. So you can see the uh, V1, V2, and tracheal nerve overlying the little wall of the cavernous sinus, and also the tumor within each windows. As you can see, this is the V2, V1. This is the V1, V2. Then I continue the peeling of the dura. Now I remove the uh, anterior clinoid. Most of the cases, the anterior clinoid is eroded by the tumor. So it is very is easily to remove the clinoid. And I sclatonize in the optic canal. So you can see this is optic canal. This is optic nerve. Now I totally expose the little world of cavernous sinus. So I cut the dura, like I said, is inverted T shape down to the base. And I cut the phosphor ligament to free the optic nerve. So you can see the nerve is always pushed against the dura, against the diaphragm cellae, by the tumor. And I remove the outer ring surrounding the carotid to free the carotid. So I cut the inner membrane. I cut the inner membrane overlying the acromonal nerve and open the severe wall of the cavernous sinus. So I can start to remove the tumor to debulk the tumor from the severe wall of the cavernous sinus. I like to remove the tumor step by step from severe wall to the later wall to the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus. So I open the inferior severe wall of cavernous sinus. I can trace the carotid artery into the cavernous sinus. And I can widen the space between the optic nerve and the carotid. So I open the diaphragm cellae to remove the tumor, which is extended into the supracellular region. I actually, I kept the diaphragm cellae intact. I remove the tumor beneath the diaphragm cellae. Then I turn the microscope to the later wall of the cavernous sinus. I open the space between the Parkinson triangle between the tracheal nerve and V1. And you can see all the branch from the carotid. This may be the manical hyperbasal trunk, the branch. One branch is plying the clivus. One branch is to the posterior lobe or the, the pituitary, like Dr. Shia mentioned. So I localize the intracaminous carotid. Now the next step is to localize the sixth nerve just below the V1. It's usually uh, the six numbers go within the, between the inferior lateral trunk and the carotid. So I found, I preserve all these branches from the mandible hypothesis trunk and remove the tumor, continuous widely open the cavernous sinus between the V1 and trochlear nerve. For transcranial approach to the pituitary tumor, the uh, disadvantage is that sometimes the tumor behind the, all these nerve structures that you cannot uh, visualize very well, is not visible very well. So sometimes you need the endoscope assisted approach. You can use in the endoscope to check the, each corner within the cavernous sinus. But now I totally, almost totally free the carotid. Then I free the, the oculomotor nerve uh, from the oculomotor triangle. 
if you push hard over the oculomotor nerve, the patient will have the uh, oculomotor palsy. To minimize the uh, post-op uh, oculomotor palsy, you have to free the oculomotor nerve from the oculomotor triangle. Now I remove the tumor, and actually you can see the diaphragmella is is uh, actually is down. And I open, I free the oculomotor nerve, and I open the uh, capsule uh, in the mesial timber region because the tumor is extended proximally into the mesial timber region, and sometimes the tumor will go up into the cerebral fissure. So as you can see, I free the oculomotor nerve from the oculomotor triangle so that I can mobilize the oculomotor nerve to widen the space in the mesial tumor region or in the preponding space. So this sac, this capsule is underlying the mesial tumor region. So as you can see, this is the, I already uh, removed the tumor. And after the surgery, I usually harvest the fat pads in the surgical defect and using the Duracell to, to make a waterproof uh, closure. So uh, I think most of the uh, time, uh, most of the cases, uh, even the invasive joint pituitary tumor, they have done by the endoscopy approach. And actually this is a very uh, good way to deal with such kind of the tumors. But actually I'm trained in the microsurgical lab to, for such cases, especially the invasive uh, microadenoma, I get used to do uh, transcavenous approach to such kind of lesion. And if you want to do such kind of the uh, surgical approach, the most important, you have to spend time in the lab, like I mentioned at the beginning. So I actually, I have done uh, different kind, different topics of uh, hands-on dissection course in Taipei for more than 15 years. And if you gather your experience in the lab, then you uh, minimize and you can lessen, shorten your learning curve in the operating theater and the patient will get benefits from your trainings. So uh, you're welcome to Taipei after the uh, pandemics. And also uh, welcome to our course. And actually we just finished the uh, Kevin Sinus course uh, by ISCLA Academy and hosted by me and my colleague Dr. Wang, the next speaker. So thank you very much. And actually uh, today my lecture, uh, just in memory of Professor Fred Gently, and he has actually uh, also uh, have done the clinical fellow of Professor Yasuko. So actually he is my senior and he is the first uh, director of the uh, skull base, especially the uh, expert in endoscopic uh, pituitary surgeon in uh, Toronto. Thank you, Samay, and thank you, every colleagues. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Professor uh, Mitro, for uh, this excellent presentation. Is there any question from Benle? Thank you, the uh, both for uh, this uh, informative and uh, nice. Thank you. Now we will shift to our next speaker, uh, both so uh, we have seen. Please start sharing your screen.
Professor Wee, we are waiting for you. We are uh, seeing your screen now. Can you start, please? You need to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. On the bottom of the screen, there's a mute button. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, I'm sorry because I'm muted, uh, but right now seems okay. Uh, can you see my no, screen? You, you are not muted. You are you are on now. Yes. So the you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for no problem. Uh, taking... No problem. Yeah, okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wei Xing Wang from Taipei Veteran General Hospital, and Dr. Semper is my colleague. And uh, today, uh, I, I would like to share. Uh, my experience in endoscopy surgery for the pituitary lesion. Uh, so that we know the pituitary tumor is not only the, the ordinary tumor, but the, the neuroendocrine tumor. So that uh, we agree that this kind of tumor should be treated by the multiple discipline team and especially for the experienced surgeon. So this idea for the pituitary center of excellence has been provided a few weeks ago. And uh, there's a few criteria, but I'm not uh, trying to explain it. But the, um, uh, in, in it, uh, uh, the target for the pituitary surgery was defined and uh, uh, it, it's not only for uh, how much tumor you can remove for the compression, but uh, you have to uh, uh, still uh, 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 take care of the normal function, uh, especially the, the normal hypophysial function and, uh, and of, of, of course, uh, the uh, cranial nerve uh, function uh, uh, should, not, uh, should be uh, uh, well uh, <clears throat> protect in this kind of surgery. So uh, uh, endonasal surgery uh, has been widely used for the pituitary lesion and uh, through the nose, uh, uh, it has a very advantage uh, for the adequate exposure, the cella and, and the paracella and supercella uh, space can be uh, uh, seen uh, very clearly. Uh, the detailed anatomy already been described in the previous uh, <coughs> speakers. And so I just skip uh, uh, most part. And uh, in oral anatomy, I think that the, for the dura there, I think that is very important for this kind of surgery. Uh, we know the two layer of dura in this corner and, uh, and then this two layer of dura will separate uh, 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 laterally and uh, it will, there will be the cavernous size in between of uh, two layer of dura here. So the, so the, you, uh, you know the dura layer and, uh, and then there is another, the, uh, uh, technique for extra capsule dissection. And uh, this uh, shooter capsule is, uh, uh, is the idea is provided, uh, provided by the Professor Ophir. Uh, I think that is a very useful uh, technique. Um, for the, the, this kind of the shooter capsule, uh, it, it, it seems not a very, is a real one, the capsule uh, is uh, uh, the, the tissue uh, is a normal, normal grand tissue uh, is compressed uh, by the tumor and, uh, and this, uh, there was a very uh, thick, uh, the, a relative thick tissue like the capsule. So this is a sh the idea of the pseudo capsule. Uh, for this kind of the pseudo capsule, I think that it's very important, uh, uh, especially for the functional uh, tumor resection like this. Uh, uh, when we open the dura, and um, in the middle, and so we know the uh, the tumor will separate laterally. So if this not the case, uh, in to, uh, embedded to the cavernous sinus, uh, you you will uh, uh, not just go to the laterally to uh, open this two layer of tumor. And uh, here uh, we can we know the tumor uh, for this case over the right side of the pituitary fossa, so that we can predict the location and try to uh, to dissect this. Uh, the capsule carefully, and you can see there's a tissue, a relative dense comparing with the other. So we know the tumor was uh, was embedded in uh, this capsule. So we just follow this pan of the, the capsule, and uh, we know the normogram will be laterally 
And uh, so just uh, keep this plan and uh, you will uh, let you know the, where is the tumor and the, where is the normal structure. And uh, so this is uh, uh, the last piece that uh, we know that we are very close to the cavernous sinus. Uh, there is a, a, a blood flow come from the cavernous sinus and it's not very clear in these corners. So the, uh, in my, um, right now the practice, I will, because this is a cushion case, uh, the ACTH screening tumor is a functional tumor. So the surgical goal is I'll try to uh, resect it uh, all and uh, to uh, have the, the functional remission. So the, uh, because the, the cavernous sinus wall is not very clear, I'm not sure is there a tumor. And so uh, I uh, just uh, uh, opening uh, the cavernous sinus and you see that it's a two layer of dura. So you can uh, you know where uh, you are and uh, to control the oozing from the cavernous sinus and you can uh, uh, put in uh, this uh, medial wall and to, uh, to try to uh, make sure there's nothing there. So the, after the surgery, uh, we have the, the three piece of the, the passage and the main part tumor, of course, is the cortical trap at Noma and then the capsule, the shuttle capsule, uh, there's uh, uh, now repower. Uh, we can still see there's a tumor, but hit on it. And uh, for the cavernous sinus wall is very clean and it's just the fibrotic tissue. So the, in this case, uh, we can make sure that uh, the, the, the function remission is achieved. Uh, so the, for the uh, tumor, uh, a little um, uh, bigger uh, is a macroadenoma. Uh, is the work for this uh, uh, shuttle capsule dissection? A uh, short capsule dissection. I think that is uh, is still work. And the same, uh, we we open the dura and we try to keep the the, the dura there, and we know the, where is uh, the boundary between the tumor and the dura. And then we know that this in this uh, case that the the tumor density uh, is different in in uh, the the main part of the dura. In the center, uh, uh, we see the tumor is uh, relatively soft, but the, the laterally uh, seems that the density of dura, the consistency of dura uh, is a little bit uh, fibrotic. So the, uh, following the, this, uh, the capsule, shuttle capsule uh, uh, really help in this kind of the uh, case uh, because uh, you just suck it, the tumor, but uh, for this fibrotic tumor, it's very hard for you to, to just suck and uh, you need to dissect, but where is the pen? So, I think the, the this uh, capsule uh, will lead you the pen. So the uh, uh, <clears throat> after the further medical dissection, and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, achieve the, the total resection. So for this case, uh, we send the same. We send the the the, uh, the passage. Uh, the main part is gonadal trabecinoma, and uh, the capsule. Uh, there is uh, some tiny uh, non tumorous that it, Hypophysial tissue that would be the normal gland, but uh, for the post of the the image uh, post of the hormone profile, uh, it shows uh, uh, the the main uh, function was preserved. There's a no uh, uh, the, the uh, hypopituitarism after the surgery. There's a post of image. So the I I try to uh, analyze my my data and uh, and uh, because. Uh, uh, I try to collect this kind of the, the capsule. Uh, so in my uh, the data, I, uh, the most of part of the, this kind of the capsule, uh, just the fibrosis tissue. And, but still you can see uh, there's uh, around the 40%, there's a tumor at the head on the, uh, the, the capsule. So the, for the functional tumor, I think that it's worse to aggressive pitting uh, this capsule and try to make uh, uh, the functional remission. So the, for the tumor, uh, if the further lateral extension to the cavernous sinus, that would be the limitation for this kind of surgery. I think the, um, it, it's, uh, it's not a limited uh, right now. And Dr. Fernando Miranda, uh, uh, my mentor, uh, he published the, this uh, um, uh, idea of the, uh, how to divide it, the cavernous sinus into four components, I think. And uh, also uh, he described the very detail about the ligament structure. Uh, he will be uh, the, the next speaker. Uh, I, I think uh, he will uh, talk this very detailed. And for this structure, if you know that you can have the um, chance to just follow up the tumor and go very deep, like this uh, superior compartment of cavernous sinus, uh, you will uh, predict uh, there is a, a cranial nerve, the third nerve will be there in the deep. And uh, for the posterior compartment, uh, 
the uh, abducer nerve will be below uh, this compartment. Uh, and uh, for the uh, inferior compartment, just the sympathetic plexus. And uh, for the uh, lateral compartment, uh, we're familiar with the, uh, the nerve, the cranial nerve, uh, we're located in this uh, lateral compartment. So you know the location of the nerve and uh, because the pituitary tumor is uh, growing from the medial to laterally, most of the time the, the cranial nerve is not embedded uh, just to be pushed uh, lateral, inferior or superior. So uh, if you uh, have this idea and uh, you know how to get into the cavernous sinus, uh, you can uh, very aggressive to resect the tumor into the cavernous sinus. This case uh, is a acromegaly patient. Uh, uh, he already accepted multiple surgery and but still uh, there's a um, tumor remain over the left side of cavernous sinus because in the previous surgery, uh, nobody uh, tried to, the, uh, uh, to open the cavernous sinus and to resect the tumor, but the remission, uh, the tumor is not controlled very well, uh, even by the gamma knife surgery, radio surgery and, uh, and the medical treatment. So I decided to do the, the surgery again. Uh, we know that this tumor uh, uh, probably be trapped by this dense tissue, the ligament or the, the, the capsule. Uh, uh, so the, uh, if you want to go uh, laterally into the cavernous sinus, you have better release this kind of the uh, tissue. And uh, so uh, I released uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, dense uh, tissue like the property is just the carotid carotid ligament. And then uh, uh, the superior compartment and the posterior compartment uh, can be uh, open uh, very clearly. And so uh, you can see after uh, cutting this uh, tissue and uh, you will have a chance to go uh, further deeper uh, into the cavernous sinus to, re to remove uh, all this tumor. And after the surgery, uh, the, uh, uh, his uh, functional, uh, the, the growth hormone already uh, dropped uh, very uh, dramatically uh, to the normal range immediately after the surgery. And uh, the, this case, another cushion case, uh, uh, I think the, uh, the, same, the same story, uh, the multiple surgery treated, uh, but the, the, main hum the, the tumor still lay over the posterior compartment. So I, uh, I am very aggressive to do this kind of surgery again and to clean all, all this uh, scar tissue and the ligament, and then uh, uh, go this carotid artery here. Uh, we can uh, achieve the, the deep part in the posterior compartment. And uh, the view uh, is just like uh, the dissection I did in the lab. Uh, you can see the abducer nerve uh, uh, just uh, superior to the apex here. Uh, this is a post of uh, the image and can show, show there's a, a corner will be, um, the tumor will be removed uh, very clearly. So the, um, uh, in my practice, uh, for the, the, um, the superior compartment uh, will be the most uh, for the tumor uh, occupied and the posterior and uh, inferior, uh, almost the same, the laterally is rarely. Uh, so the, uh, this case is another uh, cushion uh, this is uh, the SCTH screening tumor. Uh, this is a young lady uh, present with uh, the Cushing syndrome. And the tumor, you can see the occupy uh, uh, start from the cella and uh, growing into the, the sphenoid sinus little recess and go into the cavernous sinus and even uh, go posterior to the posterior fossa. As for this kind of surgery, uh, I think the, this uh, four part com concept of the uh, cavernous sinus. Uh, Really help. Uh, I start from the lateral recess of the spinal re the recess uh, and the partially uh, transterior approach, and you can uh, have a very wide view. Uh, go laterally, and here is a median nerve, and there is a lateral recess. Uh, median nerve is here, so you can uh, uh, remove the uh, uh, tumor uh, occupying the spinal sinus uh, first. Uh, and then I go to the lateral part of the sinus, and uh, here. Um, uh, like the dissection I did uh, in the lab, uh, you can see uh, we just follow the turnal from the inferior compartment of cavernous sinus and to uh, re uh, to resect the tumor. And uh, uh, here is a um, inferior trunk uh, to supply the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And so you can see here is a cranial nerve. You can see after the tumor removed and just a little bit uh, mobilized the Cavernous sinus ICA that you can see the ovarian motor triangle from the uh, this uh, uh, trajectory, and uh, further resect the the connective tissue and the ligament, and uh, here is a, a vertical segment uh, of the cavernous sinus ICA here. 
So the, how you can see the sympathetic process there. The, so the last part is a cap and sign the superior compartment. So here is a probably the carotid kinetic ligament and I reset it and now uh, I can have the uh, go deeper and uh, to go to the superior compartment. And uh, here is a, a ocular motor triangle, the arachnoid uh, member you can see uh, after the tumor removed uh, coming out. So the last piece is from the uh, posterior compartment. Here is the abducent nerve there. So the, after uh, this, uh, old, uh, this compartment, the resection and the uh, total resection can be achieved. And uh, luckily, uh, this uh, patient uh, covered very well and uh, uh, still under the uh, uh, remission status here. If you tumor uh, go uh, superior to the uh, superior compartment of cavernous sinus, I think the, the, the function we should uh, uh, carefully, uh, of course, uh, uh, is uh, optic chiasm, the optic nerve function, and also the pituitary stroke and, um, and the blood surprise from the superior hypophysial artery. Uh, I will focus on the superior hypophysial artery and uh, uh, because uh, we, we really know about uh, how if we uh, injury this kind of the uh, the artery and it will relate it uh, to the visual deficit. Uh, in the, there's a, no uh, uh, study to talk this very clearly, but just uh, some, a few of the, the, the case report or series talking about this. Uh, there's about a 30% uh, the damage, the visual deficit will happen if uh, uh, the superior hypophysial artery was clipped uh, uh, in the uh, aneurysm surgery uh, has been uh, described this. So, uh, uh, it's better to prevent this uh, artery, uh, uh, even uh, for the pituitary tumor or the, for the cranial pharyngeal or other uh, tumor embedded to the superior uh, uh, supercellular region. Uh, for this uh, invasive tumor to occupy uh, this uh, more uh, superiorly, anteriorly, and laterally, uh, um, this kind of surgery, uh, uh, the, uh, the strategy to, to remove the tumor is better to have the wider exposure, so the is a uh, uh, not to just to create a, a small hole and try to uh, to uh, you, to to suck the tumor and to expect the tumor will falling down uh, is not the right uh, the idea. So the uh, it's better to uh, have the very wide exposure and uh, to have the window uh, to expose the supracellular region and even the uh, uh, optic canal, and then. Uh, uh, you can see under the uh, endoscope, uh, the visualization is very good. And uh, we have the uh, angle uh, scope and then we can go uh, see the laterally. Uh, and uh, for this the big tumor, there's still some part you can find the, the, the tumor capsule, but uh, uh, for the most part, the superior part uh, is hard to, to uh, identify the capsule. We're talking about a shuttle capsule, but uh, still the, under the very good visualization, uh, you can keep this, uh, hypophysial artery or perforator uh, surrounding uh, this uh, 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 chasm or the, the pituitary stoke. Uh, you can, uh, you can, when you can see it very clearly, uh, you have the chance to uh, protect it all and uh, to uh, try to not to injure it. So this is a post of the image. Uh, so the, for my, most of my practice uh, is a uh, uh, macroedemoma is the most and uh, non-functional is most. And uh, uh, the gross total resection, uh, it means uh, the radiologist told us uh, there is no more recurrent or re uh, residual tumor after the post op. And uh, it's around the uh, close to the 80%, and the near total across the gross total is almost 95%. Our um, remission rate is fair. Uh, so the, for a pituitary tumor, I think the, it's a benign lesion. So the uh, surgical goal uh, for the functional and non functional is different. For the functional, we should be the more aggressive. Uh, even the tumor uh, going to the cavernous sinus, uh, we should try attempt to remove it uh, uh, as much as possible. And um, comparing to the total resection, I think the functional preservation is very important. And uh, early identifying the capsule will really, really help uh, in this kind of surgery. And uh, so the, uh, maybe I have still have some uh, 10 minutes and uh, uh, for the, a similar lesion, uh, like the pituitary tumor uh, in the cell or supercellular region, is a rusty cap cyst. Uh, for this, uh, the cystic lesion, I think the surgery goal is different uh, because uh, in my practice, uh, 
uh, most of the patient just presenting with a headache or a visual problem. So the, it's not like the tumor growing. So the, the surgical goal may be the uh, decompression. So the, uh, uh, but the, still the recurrent uh, still may happen. Uh, for this kind of surgery, uh, this, the patient, uh, uh, because uh, you can see uh, we open the cella, uh, we open the sphenoid sinus and see the pneumatize is not very well. So the first step I tried to, uh, to drill and to uh, expand more uh, about the, this uh, kyphoresis and to have the most uh, space uh, to open the inferior part of the, the cella. And uh, so uh, the same, uh, we try to uh, identify the normal gland and try to find the capsule or the, the, the cystic wall uh, from uh, between the normal structure and it. So when you incise the, the lesion and the, the mucus coming out and uh, 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 we can see the very clear uh, of the structure there inside. Uh, for this kind of surgery, uh, uh, total resection, the capsule or the cyst wall is not necessary, but uh, we still need to uh, try to, uh, to dissect if, uh, if uh, um, there is a very clear margin and I, I will try to remove it in the same for the passage. And uh, this is a poster image. And uh, this is another case uh, because uh, in the pre opt image, uh, uh, it looks like the very low look like the- the bureau, you see. It's like, like the- This cranial pharyngioma. And so the, I'm not sure the, the how aggressive I should, should attempt to do. So, but the, in the, the intraoperative in, in finding, there's a, some hard part and, uh, and the most of the soap part. And uh, the, the wall seems um, a little bit uh, thick uh, comparing to the normal, the, uh, the uh, last crevices. So the, I, I do uh, do more dissection, but you can see the normal structure connected to the, the cyst wall uh, is uh, very close. And uh, for this uh, kind of the uh, surgery, I uh, I uh, I decide to uh, try to more aggressive to resect the uh, cyst wall, uh, uh, like the the cranial phar pharyngioma case I did. But uh, uh, this case turned out to be the rusty crab cyst, and uh, but the patient uh, uh, have the pain hypopituitary after the surgery. So the I think the um, uh, how aggressive we should. To, to, to do for this kind of the patient. Uh, you can see although the, the main structure is still there, but uh, I still do some damage to the normal structure here. So uh, this patient, uh, I still have the complication of the pain hypopituitary after the surgery. So the for the rust caps is a benign lesion and uh, without the aggressive growing pattern. So the for this surgical is the compression. Uh, I think uh, I have in my case, uh, I have the focal recurrence is less than 20%. But the most of the case uh, is less mass effect for the primary surgery. So we just observe it and do not do anything uh, for this kind of patient. So the aggressive, how uh, should be aggressive resection is a cyst wall. I think the, uh, in my uh, uh, practice, I have the around 10% the new insufficiency uh, 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 of the hormone after the surgery. I think the more conservative or just to keep the decompression would be the, the best. And for a cranial pharyngioma is another story. I think uh, probably uh, uh, I have not, not much time, but for endonasal surgery, the, 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 we, the, for the cranial pharyngioma, I think that is uh, uh, the very good approach. The reason is uh, we can see uh, because of the axis of the group, this the lesion growing is uh, 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 from the, the midline and uh, it will go um, posterior to the, the ritual chiasm uh, space. And uh, so we use the scope. This uh, trajectory is uh, the very good just for the follow the region. And also the good visualization uh, we can identify this uh, very critical structure, uh, including the superior hypophysio, uh, stalk just below to the chiasm. And I think that is a view is uh, very hard to uh, see from the microscope surgery. Uh, so the, that's the reason I think the cranial pharyngioma is, uh, has a very uh, privilege for this uh, uh, endonasal surgery. And uh, so uh, here's uh, the comparing the almost the same structure. Uh, we can see uh, comparing uh, the dissection I did in the lab. Uh, here, you, 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 uh, for this, uh, the lesion, because uh, the cranial pharyngioma is a more aggressive 
uh, the pasturage it will uh, uh, growing um, uh, not like the rustic cyst. Uh, so the uh, more aggressive resection uh, to try to uh, resect the boundary in the, the cyst wall uh, um, will be uh, help to prevent the, uh, the recurrence. Uh, because it is a young lady, uh, uh, his um, chief problem is a uh, vision and, uh, and uh, just marry and not have the child. But uh, you can see the stroke can be seen very clearly. So uh, we try uh, ever to, uh, to make effort to, to preserve this uh, the normal structure. And uh, after the surgery, uh, this is a view. And uh, the good thing is uh, after the surgery, uh, this patient had the uh, baby uh, two years ago and uh, she did not have the, any of the hormone problem after surgery. If the tumor even uh, bigger like this, uh, initially the, uh, the, the patient uh, uh, did not accept the surgery, but the, a few months ago, the progress to the uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. So the, in this case, uh, we still choose the, uh, the, the endonasal surgery to, to remove the, this kind of lesion. Uh, you can see uh, the structure can be seen very clearly. And uh, the first step, uh, we will uh, identify uh, the main uh, superior obesity, especially a uh, supply to the chasm. Uh, this is uh, the branch uh, we should uh, preserve. Uh, and uh, so that you follow this uh, trajectory, uh, you can go into the, the, the main part of the cyst. And after the drainage, the decompression was the chip. But uh, we say that this is a, a different uh, uh, passage. Uh, uh, if uh, we should uh, 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 more aggressive to, to resect it. Uh, like this, uh, the, the capsule of the tumor, and uh, uh, we will uh, dissect it uh, more patiently. And uh, uh, you can see this um, wall uh, of the cerebral and uh, hypothalamus. Uh, you can uh, dissect it, this wall uh, 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 very carefully, uh, especially in the, the primary surgery, and then uh, uh, try to deliver uh, all this uh, capsule. And, uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, if we can uh, to remove uh, uh, all this uh, capsule, uh, it, uh, it will really help for the patient to prevent from the recurrence. And this is a post-op view where you can see a very beautiful uh, view to see the, uh, to go from the below to the um, Monroe and the core plexus. This after the surgery. And um, so the, for cranial pharyngioma, the, the, my predicts uh, the uh, around the, 70% of all the cross total recession can be achieved. Uh, for the primary surgery, uh, I think there's even higher. And uh, for the recurrent rates is around the 30% and uh, for the primary surgery is more or less. So uh, uh, for the first surgery, it's very important uh, to resect uh, the cranial pharyngioma. Uh, but so hormone replacement uh, uh, for the, uh, even for the primary surgery, I have the 40% I need to uh, keep the replacement of hormone. And uh, I have no sense of leak. And stock preservation is a controversial and still under debate. Uh, but uh, uh, if uh, we can uh, aggress more aggressively resection the cyst uh, wall, I will uh, attempt uh, try to not to uh, make the patient have the recurrence. Uh, so the uh, this is about my the, my my experience about endonasal surgery uh, for the cellar and uh, supercellular lesion. And uh, two days ago, uh, that would be the our uh, Chinese uh, New Year. So, so I want to uh, say Happy New Year to uh, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your listening. Thank you also for uh, this excellent presentation. Uh, is there any question from uh, panelists? Okay, uh, thank you. And now we will uh, shift to uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Nishman uh, Anubal. Uh, please uh, start sharing your screen.
Um, Dr. Sami, you can see the screen, right? You can see my screen. Yes, yes perfect, yes, okay. perfect. And you sound is clear. You can start now with it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will stay with pituitary adenomas. I will not talk about craniopharyngiomas. Maybe some comments at the end about rat case. And um, I will stay with the endoscopic approach. Uh, I just um, rearranged my, my title. Just put it surgical nuances rather than saying different strategies. I think the strategy is pretty straightforward. And let me start by uh, showing my experience with large and giant pituitary adenomas. What do we do in Istanbul, Jarrah Pasha? Two uh, quick acknowledgements. Number one is not quick. Uh, I had a chance to welcome, that means host, Professor Gentili in Istanbul. Um, and uh, it was a wonderful uh, visit. I learned a lot. I think he's one of the best teachers in the field of neurosurgery, arguably the best teacher in, in, in the field of endoscopic uh, endonasal surgery, uh, so I hope uh, he will rest in peace. Second uh, acknowledgement is uh, to Professor uh, Sami al uh, I would like to thank him for this kind invitation. Where are we now with giant pituitary adenomas? I will start with, I will start with um, the last 10 years, probably, uh, 10 to 15 years. This, is, this belongs to 2007. From Italy, basically what we have here is what we have here is 95 patients um, with 100 more than 100 approaches. Uh, please pay attention to this number. About 23% uh, of the cases they approach it through transcranially, which I argue now it's decreasing more and more. Sublabial transeptal was the approach. Radical tumor resection was not acceptable, visual improvement was good. So even with not enough radical tumor resection, visual imp improvement is, is uh, almost as well as what we do today. Uh, the same, the same uh, study here, uh, mortality is here 3% now down to 1%. Major morbidity is high with adjuvant radiotherapy, five pure tumor control rate is around 90%. And the incidence of new endocrinopathy Unfortunately, here we are still in these numbers. And this is another one. This is a, an experience from an experienced group. Uh, three years later, 55 patients, uh, 51 patients. Here, I would argue that tumor apoplexy is another whole story. So if you have an apoplexy, it's easier to operate. It's easier to take it out with minimal invasive cases. So. Uh, when I see apoplexy high numbers, in high numbers, uh, I question, I somehow in my mind at least question the results. Here we have endonasal transphenoidal approach, gross total resection is good, near total resection, the numbers are, are similar to those we have in the uh, endoscopic era. Post of the endocrinopathy is here, tumor control is the same, 80% visual impairment. Uh, this important paper emphasized one thing, if only progression in postoperative residue tumor volume, we do stereotactic radio surgery. We do the same. This is the approach. So uh, residual, not a big residual, visual impairment, okay. And uh, the tumor is, is stable. Do not directly go, want to go to uh, stereotactic radio surgery. You may wait, this is an option. So I agree, agree with this conclusion here. Uh, very experienced group, to, uh, 2013, 54 patients, seven patients with pituitary apoplexy, total endoscopic endonasal transpenoidal approach, near total resection now increased, post of visual improvement, same complications we have. Here at Sinsipidus, please pay attention to here. CSF fistula was high, now is, uh, I agree with the previous speaker, less than 2%, even in large, large and giant pituitary adenomas. Um, even without the ENT, and three patients lost due to tumor pro progression. And finally, uh, one of the most honest, I will underline once again, uh, I, 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 I met him, I, I, I had a chance to talk to him more and more, and um, 
So this is an honest view, Professor Gentili's view, 73 patients. Now he included uh, three centimeters. That's a large and giant other than once. 24% gross total resection, near total 17%. Please pay attention uh, to the to the dates of the of the studies, subtotal year, partial year. This is uh, the mean tumor resection, the mean amount of tumor resection, it's about 80%. Visual impairment is steady now, 60 to 80%. This is from our lab. I know that. I, I, I know that transcavernous approach has been covered. This is a right COZ. You have options uh, through the optic. This is optical corrections. One way or other, you transpass. This is the pituitary stalk, perfect view to the interpedicular fossa. That's the infrachiasmatic corridor, or I call a chiasmatic cistern and interpedicular cistern, but you transpass something. So you need an approach that you don't touch these structures. And we will just uh, go into details. Many, many modifications. We have seen beautiful modifications from the beautiful uh, from the previous speaker. We do transcavernous, we do transplenum, and we do transclival uh, for this giant adenomas. Um, there is no option in my mind that you do a transtuberculum. You don't do a transtuberculum approach in any of the giant adenomas. You need to uh, take out the tuberculum. Uh, portion. So transcutaculum approach should be a must in my mind. Uh, generous opening. Uh, you have seen many pictures of this. This is anterior clinoid. Pay attention here. Pneumatized in 11% of the cases. Optic canal. Easy to, easy to open and decompress the optic canal from the beginning. Planum. Some cases you need to, but you need to take out the tuberculum. Cellular floor. And in both of the, in, in giant adenomas, you can approach to the cavernous sinus. Now, for about five decades, very important microsurgical neuroanatomical uh, laboratories dealt with uh, different approaches. This is from Dr. Roton's lab, very famous, very famous uh, picture. We know where to go with transcavernous, where we can go with the transcavernous. We know where we can go with the pterional, anterior cavasse approach, etc. But uh, we don't really, even today, don't know the, the limits of the uh, endoscope. Through the nose, just uh, through the nose, opening uh, the sphenoid uh, and the relevant anatomy and taking out, uh, seeing almost everything, even uh, the infrachiasmatic uh, corridor. So it's a perfect view. Sagittal view, even from the frontal sinus to the C2, pretty straightforward. Uh, a few landmarks that you need to know in terms of giant pituitary adenomas. Again, beautiful displayed before me. This is the middle turbinate. Uh, the, what I call the inferior attachment of the middle turbinate is one of the important areas. It ends up with a sphenopalatine uh, foramen. Here we have the, the midline here. Look at this side here. Uh, the flap uh, will be uh, vascularized from this area here. Uh, so this is a navigation probe. Navigation probe is within the sphenopalatine. Uh, for him. Uh, and then you see the video and you will follow the video if you want to do a transpeterogoid approach. Here's the maxillary artery. will turn into sphenopalatine artery to, um, to vascularize this area. So taking out the flap, put it the corner, you need to preserve this area. I will try to demonstrate in one case. So a few uh, things here. This is the pterygoid, sphenopalatine artery, maxillary artery coming here. Here is the vidian, here is the rotundum. At least you need to deal with, in giant pituitary adenomas, you need to deal with this area here. You may go in cavernous sinus cases, you may go more laterally to the lateral recess. And what do you do in transpetergoid? This has been emphasized over and over again. There's an orbital process and sphenoidal process. You take out the sphenoidal process. So follow the vidian not in most of the cases from down, down and uh, posteriorly. It just shows that the drilling uh, will start from here. And this is a beautiful view of the, you have seen, uh, you have seen similar uh, cases. This is a view of the pterygopalatin ganglion, vidian artery, vidian nerve, and the area will be, uh, will be drilled underneath the, uh, underneath the vidian nerve. So we started, when I'm back, uh, when I came back from uh, Gainesville, we started in October, 2007, 
almost all cases have been operated just by neurosurgeons, just by us. We don't work with, uh, we don't work with um, ENT guys. So 76% of the cases are pituitary adenomas. I will just talk about uh, this part here, the giant ones. Then comes the second pathology is primary or traumatic. This is not a secondary. This is not the CSF fistula after my operation. This is the primary or traumatic CSF fistula. Uh, we have published the results. More than 90, 95% of the cases we are able to take care of that. Craniopharyngiomas is here, chordomas, odontoidectomies, more and more optic nerve decompressions. If we have time or any questions, I may. Uh, I may discuss the pseudotumor cerebral and optic nerve decompressions. Here is the pituitary adenomas, 900 patients, 1,000 approaches, acromegaly, 31% uh, of the cases. Then comes gonadotropes and non secreting adenomas, Cushing. Uh, here we have again, uh, I think one, one, more than 150 cases, prolactinomas uh, and TSH adenomas, 1% of the cases. We have uh, pathologies from the uh, back, uh, neurohypophysis. Pay attention, the bleeding is not here. You don't deal with the bleeding in these giant tumors, not too much, I mean. But if you have a pituocytoma, spindle cell oncostoma, you will end up with uh, generous bleeding. So that's another whole different issue. What about giant pituitary adenomas? Among them, 12%, almost 12% were giant pituitary adenomas. That means four, more than four centimeters, 97 patients, 116 approaches. And here is the division. Most of them are gonadotropes and non-secreting pituitary adenomas. Again, a previous surgeon just emphasized the correct way. Operating a giant pituitary adenomas with non-secreting pituitary adenoma, or that's a null cell or a gonadotrope adenoma, is, a, I believe, a little bit different than operating in acromegaly, Cushing, or prolactinoma. You have a weapon, a loaded weapon, sandostatin analog, uh, postoperative cabergoline, et cetera. You don't have a weapon. The only weapon is the endoscope. Uh, remember once again, this is for the initial part, but uh, one in three, uh, the pituitary adenomas, uh, one in three uh, coming to Jerapasha, we will attack the cavernous sinus. Most of the cases, what we call a, tumor, uh, minimal transpiterygoid approach, and we have published that. Now the tumor size, many tumor uh, classifications, you can modify the Hardy, so you can have a supracellular extension more and more and end up with giant pituitary adenomas. Uh, I will try to show examples uh, of that. Here is a 42-year-old uh, patient, panipopituitarism, bitemporal hemanopsia, counting fingers uh, at uh, one meter and left eye, right eye. Total. So this is a beautiful, uh, um, e relatively easy to go uh, pituitary adenoma. If it's more than four, it's a giant. Here is the, what I do, at least, without an ENT, what I do, uh, what I understand from the vascularized flap. I'm coming from, from above, uh, above the ostium, from, uh, from um, anterior to posterior, end up in the ostium, and then taking the flap downwards. Pay attention to the middle turbinate, the inferior attachment of the middle turbinate. That's the vascularization. You need to take out more and more laterally. You need to be careful uh, until you are okay with the vidian, vidian canal. It's not the vidian canal. It's what I call the palatovaginal uh, canal. You can go uh, laterally. The Vidian canal is about 1.5 centimeters laterally, located laterally. So uh, I, I uh, go as lateral as I can on the opening. Uh, prepare the flap, go downwards, clean till, and then start opening the start opening the uh, cell, um, the sphenoid on the cellar floor. I will try to show that fault that I see here. This is the fault. The optics are here. So this is a partial transtubercular approach. We need a generous opening. I always take out the dura, try to take it out separately. One cut that I will mention, this is nuances, what I talk about nuances. Before taking out this all together, uh, this holds the tumor. I go laterally with the Doppler and then, and then cutting through towards the cavernous sinus. 
take out uh, take out the um, dura separately and then taking out the tumor. This is typical. Uh, what we want to do is take it out without CSF. Can we do that? So take the tumor out, uh, preserving the, the membrane. So uh, this is a descent. This is what I don't, I don't say this is, a, this is a, a premature descent. This is a normal descent. Uh, you may argue that this may hold this, this this, this may have a pituitary gland itself. Uh, I don't think so. You need to take it out in this, in this tumor. So uh, just uh, try to take it out uh, with patience. The aim, once again, take the whole capsule and then uh, look for uh, the remaining. You do the same on the, on the left side. And you need to see the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. In this case, we don't have a we don't have a cavernous sinus invasion, and uh, just search for the neurohypophysis on the medial side. You search for the uh, you search for the cavernous sinus. You try to take it out uh, as a whole uh, together, and then the flap will be put together. So there is no CSF leakage. Still, we have the flap here. Uh, you see the uh, the medial wall here and the neuroprothesis and, and then the, uh, the closure. Here is a 54-year-old panipopit using B-tample and manopsia, two previous microscopic transphenodal surgeries. Similar approach, this has been opened before. I just want to mention here, opening the dura. The dura tags the tumor or pushes the tumor backwards. In this case, I can open it laterally, inferiorly. And then the same uh, thing is applied from inferior, taking out with respect to the diaphragmatic, um, uh, the descent of the uh, the descent of the diaphragms from above. Here's a tumor. With patients, you can take it out all. Now you have the plane here, once again, preserving the plane without opening it. No matter how big is it, it is, you may take it out in these cases, in these suitable cases. The, if the tumor goes beyond this, it will change, and I will try to show uh, how I deal with the supracellular uh, compartment in a minute. Once again, same thing. Uh, you see the diaphragm. Alvaro will talk from Argentina. Alvaro will talk about this in detail, I believe. The same thing, you see the, exactly the same. You go, your eyes the endoscope, you go inside, and then look for the tumor. Here is the end. So uh, on both sides, you don't see the tumor. This is what I call a transtubercular approach. This is not transcavernous. Medial walls are intact. These are the postoperative uh, images. This is pre and immediate postoperative images of the, of the patient. Now supracellular, the same thing. Tumor has been taken out. This time cavernous midline is here. This time I need to attack the cavernous sinus. There is a tumor on the cavernous sinus. We open the cavernous sinus. I will not mention about the cavernous sinus here. Uh, an incision on the cavernous, this is the medial wall. What we do is we, we operate uh, from medial and from lateral. We come together, lateral and medial. Uh, I will pass it uh, very quickly. So take out the tumor cavernous sinus, but what I would like to emphasize is here. Let me stop. Uh, here's the tumor has been, has been taken out, but we are sure that this is the diaphragmatic opening. Uh, it's sometimes, not sometimes, generally very hard to go here and take this tumor out. So this is what I call nuance. This is the nuance that I use. Let's pay attention. Just to take about two minutes, but I would like to pay attention. Hard, blind and hard. We are not doing a transeptal microsurgery. This is not correct. I cannot push it and then take the tumor out. This is not correct. So I need to do something. Either I need to 
Yeah, this is what I call a water jet. Let me stop. Water jet injection. Uh, I did not invent it. I just take it from uh, from Hermes Yemi and put it to the uh, put it to the uh, endoscope. Uh, probably it will be published uh, in a couple of months. But this is what I call. So this is a saline. I, I elevate the, the upper leaf of the of the diaphragma and very um, uh, very slowly I put the saline here and then wait. You will see that the tumor will come out. It will like a ball. It will uh, come out. It will be born. Something like that. You can you can understand. But this works in uh, most of the cases. So. We are not taking out uh, the tumor from above. I will give examples of that more and more, but let's wait and see. This is the supracellular compartment. Here, once again, same thing. Uh, upper leaf retracted uh, superiorly. With patients, you give the cell line. Remember, uh, we don't, we don't, we have either tried an lumbar puncture from the lumbar puncture, ring or lactate, or we have just gone with this. So this, this works very well. So nowadays, we don't need to give any, any linear lactate, et cetera, from downwards. So just taking out the tumor very patiently. So this is what I would like to emphasize. Take it out, be patient. This is the blind side, blind part of the tumor. There may be ways that maybe I, they, they can, uh, some some uh, surgeons prefer to to just take it out uh, to to cut the diaphragma, and then under direct vision they try. But this I I, I advise that you may uh, uh, you may try this. The same thing, the same patient. We are still working on it, and the, the and the and the tumor is coming down and uh, more and more. Same thing. Uh, safe, effective, quick. The most important thing, anybody can do it. Here is another example, 50 years old, an acromegaly by temporal hemianopsia. The story is different. Uh, it has been displayed before me. And uh, now I need to take it out and I need to pay attention on the somatomedin C, uh, oral glucose tolerance test, etc. We work, all of us work with uh, endocrinologists taking out part of it does not, does not work in this case. Uh, generous opening, same, cellular floor. Lateral excision should be dealt. Again, that fault, tuberculum, dura uh, is taken uh, separately. Send it to pathology, tumor resection. We have kistic compartments, so it will be relatively easier uh, than we what we talk. Look for the look for the diaphragmatic opening. You have the cavernous ICA. You have the navigation. You have the uh, you have the um, and this is another set of that. This is. Uh, pre and post op. Pre and post op. Remember, this is uh, early post op. Uh, what we see is um, scarcely granulated somatotrop adenoma, aggressive adenoma, and within post operative 24 hours, the remission has been has been uh, has been done. This is another patient, 76 years old, progressive loss of vision, right eye. This is a non secreting pituitary adenoma. Uh, two uh, previous operations, and uh, there is a fibrosis. In these cases, uh, the story is again different. You use CUSA, you need to take it out, the fibrotic tissue, it is possible. Uh, you go inside and we don't have a myriad. We use uh, normal um, CUSA here, and then see the diaphragm and uh, take the tumor uh, altogether, see the medial wall of the, cavernous uh, sinus. Here is preoperative and it is postoperative that fibrotic uh, tumor uh, um, pre and postoperative views of the same tumor.
I will pass this one. 70 year old female, sudden headache, nausea, vomiting, ad admission to emergency room, progressive loss of vision, and history of a paranoid schizophrenia. We need to wait for the thyroid replacement and then operate this almost six centimeter uh, tumor. Let's see what we, what we do. It's not a true tumble shape, but let's see what we do uh, in this, this upper part, for the upper part. Again, I will pass the initial part here. I will pass the easy uh, lower part here. And hopefully pay attention to the diaphragmatic opening. Still, what I call the easy part, taking out, attack the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, define the cavernous internal carotid arteries with the, with the Doppler. The problem arises here. Let's be patient for one minute. Yeah, this is the opening. The opening could be small, could be high, but once again, I rather do not put the ring turret more and more. Now, stop, uh, saline, uh, the upper leaflet, what I call the upper leaflet, retracted, uh, retracted uh, superiorly. Just let's wait and see. I am sure of the opening. So the tumor is coming up and this is what I call an endoscopic water jet uh, irrigation. That's what we see. Let's see what we have here. Here is the bone tumor. Is it enough? No. Do I take it out with a, with a punch? No. Wait, be patient. Same thing, dissect. Dissect like a Sylvian dissection. And then, from above, more. It will bone again. Now, what are, where are we working? We are working right here, right this part here. So uh, it's the third ventricular part uh, through the foramen of Monroe. It's possible to take it out. This is the immediate post-op. Uh, remember, this is not a true future apoplexy. It's not a, like a cheese form, etc. It was a typical tumor, typical adenoma. Here is tre and tre. Here is post op uh, for giant future adenomas. So there is an option here, tre and post operative option uh, that you can take this tumor out uh, through the uh, through the um, diaphragmatic opening. Uh, atypical facial neuralgia, left hemifacial spasm, this time left and right cavernous sinus, and a huge uh, progressive loss of vision, near total, uh, anosmia, etc. a huge tumor. So uh, can be done with a one shot? Yes, uh, I believe it can be done with one shot. At least the, the sagittal plane will be taken out, and most of the, most of the lateral parts uh, will also be resected. Uh, so uh, no matter how big is the tumor around this type of tumor could be taken out with that. Uh, this is, I, I did not do this. This, uh, the tumor has uh, destructed almost everything. I will show in a minute the, um, uh, the anterior sphenoid, the tumor. We are lucky um, because the tumor is, 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 you can take the tumor out with a, with a suction. And then now we are going to take out the, the bone. From this time on, everything is similar to a chordoma. If you do a chordoma, uh, what, I, what I believe is this is a typical chordoma case. And uh, you need a large opening. Uh, you need to define the carotid arteries and uh, cavernous internal carotid arteries. You need to define the uh, the clival, uh, th these are the carotid internal carotid arteries. These are proximal cavernous, uh, proximal cavernous segments. Uh, you need to define the post, um, the clival dura, uh, um, deal with that and take the tumor out. Uh, the tumor comes from the ethmoid. 
straightforward. So once again, this kind of tumor is suitable ICA it's here, both ICAs, thibal dura, and um, this kind of tumors are, uh, are suitable for, uh, here's a small opening, um, for um, endoscopic endonasal approach. Let's see what we have done in the sagittal plane. This is the post-operative uh, post 24 hours. What happens in the third month? Here is the result on the third month. So pre, post of 24 hours and uh, the third month. This is, this is a good view of the sagittal. Is it enough? No. What did we do with the, what did we do with the corona? Here is the tre and here is the post-op, immediate post-operative. This was a different uh, issue, non-splitting pituitary adenoma, but he has a metaplasia, very aggressive tumor. And uh, we still waited, we still waited for uh, radiotherapy, uh, but this was an aggressive tumor. This is preoperative, and these are the post-operative images uh, of the same patient. Here is another one, 19-year-old university student, we are lucky the upper part is cystic and uh, there's a cavernous sinus invasion on the, on the right side. Uh, this was a non-screeting uh, tumor. On the right side, he had a six nerve palsy, which resolved right after the operation. This was a gonadotropa adenoma. Uh, the visual field was okay, immediate post-operative period. That was a residual, small residual on the, on the right side and the small residual on the left side, no uh, radiotherapy, no steatoactic radiotherapy, just observe and the patient is fine. Uh, six nerve, as I told you, uh, resolved. Uh, nowadays, uh, we can discuss, we are using neuromonitoring and I have few comments about the visual evoke potentials, which I believe is the future, uh, is the future of uh, endoscopic endonasal surgery. And it, it is very, very, uh, beneficial. Uh, so um, a giant pituitary adenoma, you do a surgery, uh, you do around 40 to 60 percent uh, uh, resection, and then you wait, you wait for radiotherapy. If there is a, if there is a, um, what I believe, a, a recurrence, then, then consider about, uh, consider about radiotherapy. A few words about this, our 97 percent of the cases, the number, I believe, of transcranial approaches is coming down and down. So where do we use the transcranial approaches? Is there a place? Yes, certainly there is a place. That place is a, uh, is a, a lateral, superlateral extension to the ICA uh, bifurcation. If you have a tumor on the superlateral part of the ICA bifurcation, here it is, you have a problem, uh, but if the case is, is, is a weapon, weapon pituitary adenoma, that means you have a cabergolin or you have a sandostatin analog, that changes everything. Here is a 24 year old acromegaly. Here is preoperative. As you may guess, we go from, we go from down, we went from down. Uh, I made a mistake. I could have taken out, this is preoperative, the number. I could have taken out the pterygopolitan that natural recess thing that could be taken out very easily, but I'm more concentrated during the operation on the, uh, on the carotid artery on the, on the right side. Here is that, that problem here, A1, M1, superlateral, that's a problem. This is preoperative and that problem arises from here. What we did, this is a preoperative, uh, preoperative MRI, postoperative MRI, uh, residue, uh, it's a problem of mine. And my technique, uh, a residue, uh, which is tolerable. What happens? I have a weapon, we have a weapon, send it to endocrinology, and then this is post-operative uh, images, post-operative images. Uh, the patient is under control uh, within the six months. Uh, the patient is under sandostatin and doing well. Uh, he is in remission, uh, but I, I also, put, yeah, here is what I try to show you. We start with this, and then we end up with this, with the remission. So this is acceptable. 
So giant, I argue here, is that a giant pituitary adenoma with invasion, et cetera, et cetera, could be taken out. Uh, and then uh, that, uh, that um, the drugs will be more effective on that. Uh, here is once again the limit, ICA bifurcation through the endoscope, superolateral, you have a problem. That's what I, 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 I think. So extended endoscopic approaches are effective for safe giant pituitary adenomas, diminishes the need for transcranial approaches more and more. And uh, there will be no need probably in, in, in near future and should be the primary mode of treatment. So anybody dealing with uh, pituitary adenomas should be more and more under endoscope. Let me finish with my, not my, but our teachers idea. Um, I would I would recommend everybody to go to the lab. There are very good microsurgical neuroanatomy lab, not just in Istanbul or Turkey. I know that Virginia is one of the best in the United States. I recommend you to, to visit there to work with the, uh, to work with the surgeons and neuroanatomists, not only with skull base, there are places that you can do uh, intraxial operations well through the fiber dissection. So here is the words of the giant, not the pituitary, but the, the giant neurosurgeon, unimaginable and unforeseen surgical possibilities will only, uh, underline only, be based on new microsurgical anatomy. Dr. Sami, let me, let me try to stop sharing. I, I thank you, uh, thank you very much. And if any questions, I will try to uh, answer. Thank you, Professor Zanova, uh, for uh, this excellent uh, informative presentation. Uh, is there any question from uh, panelists? I think it was uh, too clear and uh, informative. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. There's, there's uh, one question here. Go ahead. Uh, should, uh, should we move uh, the diaphragm tumor capsule for uh, giant tumor? Yes, I try to. Yes, I try to do that, Dr. Sam. Yes, if possible, in every case, I try to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if there is any question, uh, please uh, make it in the uh, chat box. And now we will uh, shift to our next speaker, Professor Atul Guel. Please start sharing your screen. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, the king, yes. The, king, the king has arrived. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I am going to talk again on this subject of pituitary tumors. I have to say that pituitary tumor is the life of a neurosurgeon. We live with pituitary tumors, we work with pituitary tumors and pituitary tumors are the most result oriented surgery in our career. And it is also easy. You know, when I say easy, it, it is not a good term in neurosurgery, but it is easy if you know and understand the philosophy of anatomy. Now you see this term, philosophy of anatomy, and which I'm going to show to you. As Dr. Sameh has said that we are dedicating this seminar to the memory of our great friend, great leader of pituitary tumor surgery, endoscopic surgery recently, microscopic surgery in his history, and what made him change from microscope to endoscope. He gave lectures all over the world so many times, a good friend and a good mentor for so many, and needless to say that we all miss him and miss him bad. So pituitary tumor is a very unique, unique structure, small in size, big in function, located in the neither intracranial location nor extracranial. It has a special location. It is located not in, neither in the head nor outside the head. It is located between the two cavernous sinuses. It is located around the paranasal air sinuses. 
It is located in the vicinity of both carotid arteries. It is located in the vicinity of optic chiasma. So this location, I have written several articles on this subject. Is this location an anatomical error of God or a functional necessity? Needless to say that there is no terror of error when God has made a human body. This location has its unique functional needs. It satisfies, it gets, pituitary gland gets information about external temperature from the nasopharynx and paranasal sinuses. It gets information about body temperature from carotid artery. It gets information about body situation from cavernous sinuses. This information goes to the pituitary gland and this pituitary gland then regulates the whole body. So this location is like human testes, like thyroid gland is located ex subcutaneous, pituitary, the testes is located outside the body. So there is a functional need as to why this gland is located in this special location. Just give me one second, please. Sorry for that interruption. So we have heard about the anatomy of the cella, anatomy of the carotid arteries, anatomy of pituitary gland. More importantly, anatomy of the diaphragm cellae. You see diaphragm cellae has an opening from where the pituitary stalk emerges. So this is a very unique kind of situation. And this has been discussed, this anatomy in our article on the subject. And I have got several articles on giant pituitary tumors, which unfortunately my previous speaker, Dr. Tanover, didn't refer. This was, I consider, one of the landmark articles in the subject of giant pituitary tumors, where we studied 118 cases. And there are several more articles on giant pituitary tumors. There are book chapters on giant pituitary tumors in various books and various chapters where we have mentioned about our work. For the last 25, 30 years, we have been working on this subject. So giant pituitary tumor is indeed a challenge, is difficult. Giant tumors can be removed and they can be removed completely if we understand the anatomy of the dura. On the other hand, if we do not understand and remove it partially, there is a possibility of post-operative pituitary apoplexy and death. So this is a, from one side to another side. So it is a, you know, you have to understand this subject. Small pituitary tumors in Cushing disease is different. And we have got about 400 cases of Cushing disease, small tumors, where the controversy has now settled you can give new life and you can give wonderful new life and you can cure the person. On the other hand, you do incomplete resection, the person will die in six months or eight months. So from death to complete normal life, we know that the tumors has to be removed en masse in a complete form of nodule. This concept was not there earlier. We used to remove these tumors piecemeal and some of the tumor was left behind. And Edward Allfield, my good friend, was one who instrumental in giving this concept of pseudo capsule and removal. So this pseudo capsule remove has to be preserved. This kind of large tumors, I have to say that 25 or 30 years ago, these tumors were not at all understood. In the era of MRI, when the CT scan was done, these tumors could not be identified properly. The relationship with carotid artery was unclear, the relationship with intracranial structures was unclear, even one could not even diagnose whether these are pituitary tumors. And I have to say that almost all of these tumors 30 years ago were operated. Uh, something has happened, John. Okay. So 30 years ago or 35 years ago, all these tumors were operated by transcranial surgical route. 
So I want to show you several of these large and giant tumors. You see, now we can see the relationship of carotid artery. We can see the relationship as to how this tumor is going behind towards the brainstem. We can see the consistency of the tumor, the nature, necrotic nature of the tumor. We can see quite clearly with this MRI. So this is the tumor, giant pituitary tumor. We can diagnose on the basis of radiology. Even if the tumor has assumed a large size or a giant size, these tumors are benign histologically. So long duration of symptoms is one very important parameter in this story. So some of these tumors can grow into huge size. And I have to tell you that if, you, if your anatomical and radiological parameters are under your control, you can diagnose preoperatively that this tumor is nothing but a giant pituitary tumor. This tumor is nothing but a benign tumor. This tumor is nothing but a removable tumor. So these kind of giant pituitary tumors can be really giant in their size, but they are soft in their hearts. They are benign in their nature. Most of these tumors present with visual diminution and visual deficits, and these tumors have to be understood anatomically. So you just see some of these tumors, which I will clarify and discuss as what is the peculiarity of anatomy of these tumors. You see how this tumor is extending laterally. So what do you think about this lateral extension? Is this temporal extension? Is this going into the temporal brain? Is this going into the brain stem? Is this going into the frontal brain? These issues were not clear in the subject of giant pituitary tumors. You see another tumor, how it is going near the brain stem, how it is involving the internal carotid artery, how it is going lateral, whether this is in the temporal brain, whether this is in the frontal brain, what is the relation, whether these tumors can be removed from the nose. There was no question of removing these tumors from the nose. All these tumors were removed by transcranial route 30 years ago. This is another tumor. You see how it is encasing the carotid artery. Now we can see in the era of MRI. Before that, these tumors were not, this, was, this relationship was difficult to understand. This You see this anatomy, how it is going lateral, and I will like to show you and make you understand as to what are the anatomical peculiarities of these tumors. You see this frontal extension, this kind of cavernous sinus extension, this kind of posterior fossa extension. These are very quite dramatic kind of extension. So you see this is another tumor. This is another huge pituitary tumor. This is another one. And this is another one going into the paranasal sinuses. And this, there is, there is a method in the madness. There is a method in the extension or there is a pattern of extension. And that pattern I want to discuss with you. And I have to tell you that this pattern was not understood before we introduced these concepts in neurosurgery. So you see this tumor, how it is going up. The earlier concept was that there is a hole in the diaphragm cellae and the tumor is subarachnoid in its location. With this concept, this part of the tumor, the upper part of the dumbbells, it had to be removed. There was no other approach other than transcranial because this part was considered to be subarachnoid in location. For the first time in the literature, we introduced the concept that the dura of the diaphragm cellae is elevated on the dome of the tumor. So the diaphragm cellae is normally here, but we said for the first time in the literature that the diaphragm cellae is elevated on the dome of the large tumor or giant tumor. And the entire tumor is intracranial but subdiaphragmatic in nature. You see this tumor, there is a clear pattern of dural extension. This dura is nothing but diaphragm cellae dura. And I have no hesitation to state that this concept that the diaphragm cellae is elevated on the dome of the tumor has completely revolutionized surgery on large pituitary tumor. Otherwise, if, as I mentioned, that almost all of these tumors were removed by transcranial surgery. 
the diaphragm can be lobulated in its pattern. You see, the diaphragm need not be stretched. It is stretched like this, going reaching up till the third ventricle and lateral ventricle and even corpus callosum. But the diaphragm cell is intact and the anterior cerebral arteries are in the lobulations of the diaphragm cell. So when you are going to operate on these tumors, you don't have to actually see the anterior cerebral artery or internal carotid artery or basilar artery because there is a diaphragm which separates the artery from the tumor. So this is a huge concept in joint pituitary tumors. You see, there is a diaphragm cell which covers and the anterior cerebral artery and posterior circulation are all outside the confines of the tumor and they are separated by diaphragm, which is dura, and arachnoid, which is around the dura. And this plane of separation makes your surgery quite easy, as I mentioned to you, because this, this separation is what makes, when you remove the tumor, you may not get CSF in the picture because the diaphragm is continuously covered covering the tumor. So this concept we introduced about 25 years ago, first time in the literature. Grade one tumor, we call grade one tumor when the diaphragm cell is elevated by the tumor. The tumor is not involving the cavernous sinus. Even if it is going in the large cella, the dura of the cella is covering the tumor. So grade one tumor is when the diaphragm cell is elevated on the tumor and the carotid artery is not encased by the tumor or cavernous sinus is not involved. So this tumor can go up like that towards the corpus callosum and the whole diaphragm is intact. Cavernous sinus is not involved. So when the carotid artery is circumferentially covering the tumor, covered by the tumor, at only at that point we can say that the cavernous sinus is involved by the tumor. Otherwise, this diaphragm and the, it is, there is a medial dural wall of the cavernous sinus which separates the tumor from the carotid artery. You see very beautiful pattern of extension, diaphragm cell is elevated by the tumor. And I have to tell the, at least the young people in the audience that this concept was not there in the literature 25 years ago. And I have no hesitation to repeat and say that this concept, whether you use microscope, whether you use endoscope, that is a very minor issue in pituitary tumor surgery. The major issue is that the tumors are soft, tumors are necrotic, tumors are vascular. You can break the tumor, break the tumor, and at the end stage, there will be diaphragm emerging into your surgical field, as we have seen in our earlier presentation. You need not see, and you may not see the any artery of the circle of villus, and you should not even attempt to see. You see this tumor going anterior, there is towards the corpus callosum, these are cystic tumors, necrotic tumors, breakable tumors, vascular tumors. If you know that the tumor is never going to involve the basilar artery, if you know that the tumor is never going to involve the brainstem, if you know the tumor is never going to involve the anterior cerebral artery, I will say these tumors are easy tumor to operate and safe tumor to operate. So these are grade one tumors which can go up, diaphragm cell covering, cellar dura covered by dura, cellar part is covered by dura, bone is also present, a thin sheet of bone. So these are natural, you see the dura just in cases dura matter or dura mother, dura mother takes care of the tumor, keeps it in an enclosed cavity. So these are grade one tumor. It is not involving the cavernous sinus. You see the nubbins of the tumor, tumor anterior cerebral artery is not encased in the tumor. There is dura around the anterior cerebral artery and which is absolutely, this concept is absolutely important when you're going to operate on this tumor. If you think that the artery is involved by the tumor, you will have to do micro dissection and separate the artery. It is not necessary because the dura will be protecting the artery. So these kind of nubbins, there can be huge nubbins of the dura of the uh, diaphragm cell, and this makes your surgery. You see these tumors, as I mentioned to you, are soft 
a necrotic and vas vascular, but their vascular is also like puff of smoke. You don't have to coagulate inside the tumor. If you coagulate inside the pituitary tumor, you probably you'll have to, you have to learn how to do pituitary tumor surgery. So you see how the diaphragm can be elevated, and this concept has completely revolutionized pituitary tumor surgery. Now you see another beautiful thing. There is a diaphragm cellie and there is a nubbin. Now don't say that this nubbin is going inside the brain or something. It is going inside the brain, but there is a layer of dura which is protecting. And if you have this understanding that there is a dura layer which protects the tumor, <clears throat> you can remove this tumor easily. When I use the word easy, I mean, you see, it is not a good term, but it is a term referable to these kind of difficult looking tumors. The another beautiful case, you see how this tumor is going into the thalamus and the brainstem, <clears throat> but it is not, it is quite relatively safe to dissect this tumor because there is a diaphragm cellie which is, which is completely covering this part of the tumor and this part of the tumor and this part of the tumor. So it is an enclosed tumor, diaphragm cellie or the dura is covering the tumor. You see this tumor, how it is going into the brainstem, but there, this going into the brainstem does not mean that this diaphragm cell, if you have this concept, if you understand this concept that the dura is present, it will be possible for you to remove this part of the tumor, this part of the tumor from nose. Whether you use endoscope or whether you use microscope, that is not the issue in these tumors. This kind of subfrontal extension, this was a classical indication for transcranial approach about 25 years ago. But I have to tell you that this tumor I removed in 15 minutes, remove the anterior wall of the cell. I don't like to remove the tuberculum cell ever. You don't have to remove, break the tumor, break the tumor, break the tumor, and you will have to learn how to get this part of the tumor into your surgical field. And that is an art. This tumor I removed in exactly 15 minutes or even less. Now you see this tumor having nubbins, this nubbin, this here, this nubbin here, this is also covered by dura. And also you see it is a soft cystic necrotic. This tumor, if you know that there is no problem with the brainstem, you can remove this tumor in exactly 10 minutes. And this tumor, once you remove it beautifully, remove it radically, the person, I have told you, these are benign tumors and the person is cured. This is another tumor. You see the dura, how beautifully the dura is covering the tumor. Complete, it is going beyond the corpus callosum. I will say even if it goes beyond the skull, the dura has that dura mother. This mother dura is going to protect. And you have to remove just this anterior wall and start removing the tumor, removing the tumor, removing the tumor. And the whole diaphragm will fall down. If you remove pituitary tumors in five hours or 10 hours, then you to tumor surgery. This tumor has to be removed quickly and they can be removed within 20 minutes or half an hour, not five hours or 10 hours. This tumor is also going into the paranasal sinus, has a dural cover. And sometimes the tumor which does not have a dural cover are more aggressive in their histological nature. Tumors which go into the paranasal sinuses and go beyond the dura are histologically different and in their aggressiveness. So these are the grade one tumors which do not go into the cavernous sinus, have a dural cover, have various kinds of nubbins here, nubbins here, nubbins here, nubbins, but this is not encasement, this is dural cover, and you have to understand this anatomy if ever you have to dissect this tumor. Now I want to take you to grade two tumors. When the carotid artery is encased by the tumor, like in this case, the, it is, I call it grade two. The diaphragm is intact. The lateral dural wall is intact. So the dura is intact here. Why some tumors go into cavernous sinus? Why some tumors do not go into cavernous sinus? What is medial wall of cavernous sinus? Why it is different? Why it is allowing some tumors? So my concept is tumors which go into cavernous sinus are histologically and behaviorally more aggressive than grade one tumor, despite the fact that they are benign in their nature. 
now you see grade two tumor dura is intact dura is intact so understanding that dura is intact understanding where the sixth nerve will be is the more crucial part of how to remove this part of the tumor this dural entity has to be understood the consistency of the tumor this is the most beautiful part of the pituitary tumor that they are soft they are necrotic they are breakable and you can break quickly they are vascular but they don't need coagulation both cavernous sinuses can be involved and the tumor can go into the paranasal sinuses i still call them great tumors this kind of elevation of lateral wall of cavernous sinus is a rare event and lateral elevation of cavernous sinus is absolutely rare but it is present in some occasions but the dura is not transgressed so this is involving the cavernous sinus lateral wall is intact this is little bit in the cella you see here how it is going in the cavernous sinus i call them grade 2 tumors what is medial compartment of cavernous sinus is a very big controversial thing what is medial dura different from other parts of dura this is cavernous hemangioma of cavernous sinus it will go towards the cella but never break into the dura of pituitary gland it's the beauty why some tumors go into the destroy the medial wall why some tumors do not destroy i had discussed this issue in one of my articles 25 years ago and i wish that you please read what is the thing that differentiates medial wall of cavernous sinus and how some tumors go inside cavernous sinus and what are the relationships with carotid artery so this is grade 2 tumor it is going into both cavernous sinus internal carotid artery is involved grade 2 tumor diaphragm is intact lateral wall is intact cavernous sinus is involved both cavernous sinuses grade 2 tumor both cavernous sinuses are involved grade 2 tumor you can see some part of cystic necrotic if you see here there is some blood in the cavernous sinus these things are issues which have to be understood before you go into the surgery of these tumors going into the cavernous sinus both cavernous sinuses involved going into the paranasal sinus now I want to show you another beautiful thing. Now just see the diaphragm is intact, the lateral dural wall is intact. The diaphragm is stretched, lateral dural wall is stretched. These are grade two tumors. Now you see this beautiful slide, lateral dural wall is intact. This is the elevation of dural roof of the cavernous sinus. You see dura of the cavernous sinus is elevated, diaphragm is elevated, lateral dural wall is intact diaphragm is intact roof of cavernous sinus is elevated when the roof of cavernous sinus is elevated i call them grade three tumors this is lat this is diaphragm celly this is elevation of the roof of cavernous sinus elevation of the roof of cavernous sinus diaphragm cell is not elevated in this so when the diaphragm the roof of cavernous sinus is elevated now you please try to understand what I'm saying is the whole tumor is enveloped or covered by dura. The whole thing, there is dura around the tumor. And that is such a beautiful thing when we are going to operate on this tumor. <clears throat> this is the diaphragm cell elevation. This is the elevation of dural roof of cavernous sinus. Can you see beautifully? There is no controversy. <laughs> But I must say that this, um, this anatomical fact was never discussed in the literature before. So elevation of the dural roof of cavernous sinus. Elevation of the dural roof of the cavernous sinus. This is elevation of the dural roof of the cavernous sinus. I call them grade three tumor. You see this beautiful tumor? This is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. This is elevation of the dural roof of the cavernous sinus. This is diaphragm cell. So this anatomical concept in these kind of tumors, this is elevation of the roof of cavernous sinus dura. This is elevation of diaphragm cell. This is involvement of both cavernous sinuses. <clears throat> this is another beautiful case. You see elevation of dural roof of cavernous sinus diaphragm cell elevation of dura so this is a these are the patterns of extension you see this tumor is pituitary tumor all right you see the elevation of the dural roof of cavernous sinus 
This is the diaphragm celli, and you see the elevation of dural roof of cavernous sinus. This is cavernous sinus. So one has to, you know, this is not in, this is intracranial, but this is subdural. It is enclosed in dura. This is enclosed in dura. This is enclosed in dura. This is enclosed in dura. So mother dura covers the whole pituitary tumor. This is a beautiful tumor. Mother dura is protecting the roof of cavernous sinus, diaphragm, roof of cavernous sinus. The whole tumor is subdural or within the dura or interdural in nature. You see, it looks like a very haphazard kind of tumor. But if you carefully look at this tumor, there is elevation of the roof of cavernous sinus, elevation of diaphragm, elevation of roof of cavernous sinus. So it is not a haphazard extension. It is a defined, there is a method in the madness. There is, these are no lobules, but there is dura all around the lobules. Believe me, my dear friends, if you do not have this concept, you cannot remove this tumor. You do transcranial or do any transcavernous or you do any kind of clinoidectomy or OZ and OZ and all kind of approaches, you will not be able to remove if you do not have this concept. You see this tumor looks like a haphazard kind of tumor. But carefully look at this. You see there is a dura covering in the lateral elevation of roof of cavernous sinus, elevation of diaphragm celli, such important. Another beautiful case. You see this is the chisma. This is elevation of the roof of cavernous sinus, which is damaging the chisma. So you remove this tumor, the vision may not improve. So you have to remove this part of the tumor. Elevation of the dural roof of the cavernous sinus, beautiful tumor. Elevation of the dural roof of the cavernous sinus is a very common kind of thing. Now I want to go beyond grade four tumor. Tumors which transgress the dura, tumors which do not respect the dura, tumors which do not respect the mother are malignant children or malignant tumor. I call them aggressive p 2 tumors. I call them an aggressive behavior. And these tumors are completely different from other tumors. When they encase the basilar artery, when they encase the supra arteries of circular villus, they are grade four tumors. Now regarding, and when they go into the paranasal sinuses, there is always, almost always dural covering. The Clivus and the bone may get eroded, but even in these cases, there is a dural cover which is present. Now, this is the situation where you have already operated, and when you have operated, when the, you reoperate the patient, at that time, there may be an indiscriminative extension of these tumors. So, these recurrent tumors are a little bit dangerous and dangerous. So this paranasal extension, I relate my classification according to cavernous sinus involvement. So this is my grading system. Grade one is when diaphragm is in, elevated, cavernous sinus is not involved, grade one. Grade two is when cavernous sinus is involved. Grade three is when the roof of cavernous sinus is elevated. Grade four, when the artery of the circles of villus are elevated by the tumor. So I have no hesitation to say that this anatomical classification, which we introduced about 20 years ago, has completely revolutionized giant pituitary tumor surgery. It is not that the endoscope has changed or microscope has changed. It is the understanding of the diaphragmatic dura and dura of cavernous sinus. And there has been various discussion about my strategy in the literature. So when I start in, uh, presented my first paper a long time ago. This was the grading system. <clears throat> so grade three is quite common. Grade four is less common. Grade one is the commonest. So let me talk about surgery. Just remove the anterior wall of the cella. There is no need to remove the tuberculum cell. Remove the anterior wall of the cella. Learn the art of breaking the tumor. Learn the art of breaking the tumor. Learn the art of breaking the tumor. And the whole diaphragm will fall into picture in quick time. And you will have this situation in about half an hour or 20 minutes that I'm saying on a conservative estimate. So this is the uterus, this is the diaphragm and the baby has to come out from the vagina. That is the natural root. Uterus is the most powerful muscle of the body. Similarly, you, this diaphragm is the most powerful dura and this dura has the power to push your tumor down. 
these are necrotic cystic tumors. I will rate this tumor as easy tumor. And when I will see this tumor, I will say to the patient, your vision will 100% recover after surgery. There's no confusion. On the other hand, if this dural concept is not there and all those things, it can be a difficult situation. This is another tumor, which is quite a straightforward tumor. There is no need to remove the tuberculum cell. Just remove the anti wall of the cell, break into the tumor, break into the tumor, and the consistency, the necrosis, the cystic part of the tumor will take you to the conclusion. This tumor, you see beautiful, this nubbin, don't worry about this nubbin. This nubbin is along the dura, and this tumor will come down. This is another tumor. It is also very disciplined kind of tumor. I will say this is one of the most easier tumors in our subject of neurosurgery, where you can expect quick results and dramatic results. You go in the evening, the patient will say, doctor, I can see you properly. On the other hand, if you do not remove them properly, bleeding within the tumor and so many other things can happen and you can have post-operative bleeding. So you have to remove this tumor and remove them quickly and radically. Even when the tumor goes quite up, there is no need to do anything here. Just remove, break, break, break tumor, break tumor. It is vascular, no need to coagulate, no need to waste your time in coagulation. This tumor, you see such a big belly, I call it pregnant pituitary tumor, such a big tumor. You remove this tumor and you have huge space to remove this tumor. Such straightforward, these are, you know, beauty of our subject of neurosurgery. Another pregnant pituitary tumor, you see large cella, open the dura, break the tumor, break the tumor. You can see the necrosis within the tumor and you can remove this tumor. Controversy is whether to use endoscope or this scope or that that's a very minor kind of controversy. That is no controversy in my eyes. This tumor I removed in 1998, 23 years ago, 24 years ago. You see this extension? Do you think in that time all these tumors were removed by transcranial route? But there is a possibility, there are not possibility. I removed in 1998 by transcranial route, uh, transnasal route. Just remove the anti wall of the cella and remove this tumor. This is another tumor I removed in the year 2000. You see this tumor? Beautifully removed tumor. This is another tumor which I removed several years ago. The question is what to do about the part which is residual in the cavernous sinus. I will discuss about that. This is another tumor. This is not arteries or not. This is not artery. This is this is part of the little bit bleeding here in the tumor. This tumor break into the tumor, break suck into the tumor. Don't have to coagulate. This is quick removal. Don't have to do extensive exposure. The diaphragm will be intact. You may not get any CSF. Learn how to bring the diaphragm into picture. Learn how to break firmer tumors. Learn how to break little bit firmish tumors and you can have positive, beautiful results. This is also one tumor which I did several years ago and this is the post-operative situation. This is another one. You see this nubbin is, has to be dura, has to be respected. This is post-operative. Many of these patients, this is a simple tumor to operate and a dramatically beautiful result from blindness to complete vision. Dramatically beautiful just open necrotic tumor, the whole diaphragm will come into picture. Understanding that the diaphragm is present has completely revolutionized this surgery. You see, this is post-operative. This diaphragm and this is post-operative. This tumor also I removed several years ago. You see this diaphragm present <clears throat> and this is immediate post-operative phase which the patient never returned for follow-up. This is another post-operative, simple tumors, not very difficult. You see, this is also immediate post-operative, some blood here. This, are, this is pre-operative. This is pre-operative and post-operative. Beautiful, beautiful, this journey of mine. This I will like to show you this tumor, which I removed in the year 2001. And just anterior wall of the cellar removal, I broke into the tumor. There was some residue in the tumor. And in the year 2007, there was a recurrence. So now my strategy is when I leave some tumor behind in a tumor which is more than five centimeter, I like to subject those tumors to radiation treatment. <clears throat> this is another tumor I removed in the year 20 years ago. This tumor just anterior wall 
You can imagine at that time, 20, 21 years ago, transcranial was the only route. Nobody used to do by nasal route. I use microscope. I still use microscope. I removed this tumor completely, and this is post-operative. And this patient came back in 2008 with a recurrent. So now my strategy is a tumor more than six centimeter. Even when I have removed the tumor completely, I give them radiation treatment. Radiation is an effective form of treatment for large tumors. So this is another tumor which has been removed. This is another tumor where, which I could not remove. And I then did transcranial route for this tumor, some tumor residue in the cavernous sinus, which of course should not happen. But if it has happened and you cannot remove, and sometimes you are worried about the cranial nerve deficit because many of these non-functioning tumors, you don't have to worry about the cavernous sinus part of the tumor. But if you remove, it is better. Consistency of the tumor makes it possible to remove this tumor. So residue does not always mean radiation, but I will tell you when to give radiation in a residual tumor. So tumor in the cavernous sinus, some tumor left behind, this is tumor, some tumor left behind. Long time ago, this was done about several years ago, these tumors. This tumor I followed up here in the from the nose. There is some tumor here or some blood, I'm not sure, but it is possible to remove if you have the information. This is another tumor, some residue. Now I will tell you my concept about residue in the roof of cavernous sinus. This residue, I will like to give radiation treatment. I, <clears throat> this residue in the roof of cavernous sinus, I will prefer to give radiation treatment because this recurrence in these tumors is much more common. This is another tumor which I did several years ago, residue in both cavernous sinus, vision recovered after surgery, no recurrence for several years, no radiation treatment. So grade one tumor, I do not give radiation. This was another tumor. You see elevation of dural roof of cavernous sinus. I did this several years ago, maybe 20 years ago. The part of the tumor in the cavernous sinus and roof was not removed. And if I am not removed, I had left it. But this kind of tumor's radiation treatment, of course, today I will remove this tumor. I will not leave this tumor. You see this tumor residue in the roof of cavernous sinus, recurrence in 2009. So when there is elevation of roof and there is residue, I like to give radiation. Samay, you are, I have some more time. What do you think? Few minutes? Uh, Few minutes? Okay. okay. In such a hurry, please say. Few minutes. Okay. Few minutes. Okay. So this is another tumor where elevation of roof of cavernous sinus, I like to give radiation. I really like to remove the roof of cavernous sinus by the nose, but these tumors are more aggressive in nature. This is tumor which I have elevation of roof of cavernous sinus. And there are some red thing coming here on the screen. This is residue in the cavernous sinus. This is residue in the cavernous sinus. Radiation should be given in grade three tumors. This is another tumor where the lateral dural walls was elevated laterally. This is a rare phenomenon. I gave radiation treatment for this residual tumor. And this patient, you see, this is for several years. This patient continues to have several convulsions, but otherwise quite stable. This I removed transcranial root for this part of cavernous sinus. I could not remove from the nose and this was removed beautifully. How to remove cavernous sinus portion, we have already seen, and it is a chapter in our surgery. Cavernous sinus part of the tumor removal is a beautiful art of skull-based surgery, which we have to learn. But we have to also learn when not to do cavernous sinus surgery. Fatal post-operative epiplexy, which we described for the first time in the literature, can happen if you leave a lot of residual behind. You see this tumor, both roofs of cavernous sinuses were not removed about 15 or 17 years ago. Then I gave radiation and there is these, both these things are small in size, but this patient is asymptomatic for several years and that is a beauty. This is another tumor with elevation of roof. Grade four tumor is another danger 
And what to do about grade four tumor is whether to give radiation, whether to do biopsy, whether to do radical resection. And this is one tumor which I removed. But now I have to say that many of the grade four tumors which we have studied are prolactinomas. And you give cabagolin even when there is prolactin level is as high as this, or even if it is not high, you try cabagolin and that may work beautifully. So this grade four tumor beautifully worked with cabagolin. This is another tumor beautifully worked with cabagolin. So my danger issues in large tumor is very big tumor is a danger issue. Higher grade tumor is a danger issue. When the patient comes drowsy is a very danger issue. When the patient has altered behavior, it is a danger issue. And when there is hypothalamic dysfunction, it is a danger issue. These are the indications of radiation treatment in my series. So thank you very much, my dear Sameh, for inviting me to this beautiful, beautiful symposium of yours. And I wish you all the best. I know I have taken a little bit more time, but I become excited when I see your face and when I see the beauty of the so many people watching me. So thank you very much for giving me this platform of learning and training and education. Congratulations to you and to your team, Sameh. Thank you, uh, the group, for uh, your excellent presentation. It, uh, it is always fascinating to uh, see you uh, talking and uh, learn us uh, more wisdom. Thank you, Sam. Uh, there's a small uh, announcement from uh, John. Please start, John. Yeah, I had the, that's why they call him the king, uh, Dr. Goel. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, Atul, we're trying to widen uh, the talks, uh, the discussion. So we're trying to experiment with what's called a breakout room within this Zoom webcast. At the bottom of the screen is a breakout room that a tool you can enter, hopefully, and speak with some people that want to come in that breakout room with you and yet maintain our flow of the main conference. OK, a tool. So go yeah, into the go into the breakout room. There should be some people waiting for you there. Breakout room number one, at the bottom of your screen is a breakout room. Do you see that option? At yes, all? yes, yes, yes. Go into that breakout room number one, okay? And anybody okay. else that wants to go see a tool to continue the discussion or network, go into that breakout room. Okay, okay, Sam, onward. Thank you. I am now, uh, we will shift to our next speaker, my dear bro, uh, Professor uh, Kenan Yogmolo. Please start the uh, your screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, previously, we just listened fantastic talks, and the Dr. Gal also could take my from my time too. It was a great, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Very informative. And so, could you see my full screen? Yes. And thanks for having me it's here, okay. my dear friend Sameh, and thanks for operating uh, the John. So. Um, <clears throat> always have on this stack. So I just keep my next slide. Can you see it? Could you confirm it, please? Y yes. Thank you so much. So the, the outline of my talk is going to be, since we saw some extensive transphenidal approaches, I, I want to delineate to the borders of the midline skull base, anterior, middle, and posterior skull base first. And then I want to mention about the three important bonds inside the nose, sphenoidate more than palatine bones. And we will take a tour inside the nose. And finally, we will reach uh, to cellular region. And at the end, if I have time, I just want to show the cadaveric, uh, the video for anatomical landmarks. I will start with this uh, slides always. And based on the KS, 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 KS rule, is keep it simple and keep it stupid. So the intracranial, Inter the, the cranial base has an endocranial surface which faces the brain and exocranial surface which faces the orbit and the nasal cavity. The both surfaces are divided into three parts, as we saw, anterior, middle, and posterior. Anterior, middle, and posterior. So now looking from, uh, when I say the midline skull base, uh, I try to say uh, we can reach this midline structures through the nose. So there is a three anterior, middle, and posterior midline skull base. 
the, the border of the anterior, midline anterior skull base starts from the foramen circum, which is the posterior border of the frontal sinus to the tuberculum cella. So what we see here, Christagalli, which is attachment of the fox. Next to the midline, we see the curved front plates. Behind it, that flat area is the planum sphenoidale. For the midline, middle skull base, we see the tuberculum cella here, and here is the cella turcica, or titular fossa. For the midline posterior skull base, starts from the dorsum cella all the way down to the foramen magnum. Of course, through the nose, we have access to midline anterior, midline middle, and midline posterior uh, skull base. Today, uh, we are, I'm gonna talk about the transphenidol, mostly, you know, the middle, midline middle skull base trajectory. So uh, we saw the anterior, anterior posterior border of the midline skull base. What about the lateral borders? And the imaginary line, drawn from the lateral edge of the optic nerve to the mid-pupillary line here. So this, that means we can reach that area coming from below through the nose. If something happens, if there's a tumor is located lateral or beyond that line, it's difficult to reach through the nose. This is anterior. The midline uh, middle skull base, we can reach the recovery of sinus through the nose and the most lateral border of the posterior skull base, the landmarks are foramen serum or oculomotor nerve, sixth nerve, which runs through the pedicular fissure, and all the way down, we see the hyperglossal uh, nerve. One more time, this is the ventral surface of the skull base. Let's see the borders of the, the midline skull base structures. The anterior skull base starts from the behind the frontal sinus to the tuberculum cella, and most laterally, the imaginary line drawn from the lateral edge of the optic nerve uh, to the mid pupillary size. That means we can reach the uh, uh, we can reach that part through the nose. For the midline middle skull base, here we see the cella cella tutorial fossa and laterally we can reach the coronal sinus. For the posterior fossa, for the serum, again, there's a petrochemical fissure and this is the hyperglossal canal. And the lateral border is like this, all the way down to the uh, odontoid process of the C2. So uh, I see we already mentioned, we talked about it in previous talk, um, for the scabies talk, I'm not going to go detail, but I'm just going to show the uh, pertinent ICA, uh, the segments of the transphenoidal approach. This is the ICA sac, which corresponds to the foramen serum. From here to the inferior, to the cellular floor, there's a clivus. It's called paraclival ICA from the inferior to the cellular floor to the proximal dura ring is paracellar. This is the cella. And between the proximal and the dura rings, this is paraclinate, paracellar, paraclinate, and paraclival here. So, and here's the intradural uh, ICA. This is endoscopic point of view for ICA classification. So it's crucial uh, to navigate the bone anatomy underlying the nasal mucosa inside the nose. So what we see here, this is the sphenoid sinus, and here we see the osteum. The sphenoid sinus, this is the sphenoid bone. Sphenoid sinus sits the center of the bone. What else we see here? This is the lesser wing, greater wing, and here's the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. In the, mid, in the center, we see the sphenoid sinus, and here's the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. This is the crest, sphenoid crest. The upper part of the crest articulates with the perspendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, and lower, lower part articulates with the warmer. So what else we see here? This is the VDN canal, which usually runs the floor of the sphenoid sinus, and here's a foramen rotundum. The second segment of the trigeminal nerve passes through it. 
What else we see here? So here's a sphenoid ostium. The mostly the one third of the sphenoid sinus located above the ostium, and the two third of the sinus located below the ostium. So that's why when we start opening the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus, we usually start enlarging the sphenoid uh, ostium downward first and then upward because we have more space here, two thirds of the sphenoid sinus. This L shaped bone is a palatine bone, sits in front of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. And this is the palatine, pterygoid, pterygopalatine fossa, the space between these bones. So, what else we see here? This is the concal crest, inferior turbinate articulates, and this is the ethmoid crest, the middle turbinate articulates. Another fossa we see here, this is the sphenopalatine fossa that the sphenopalatine artery passes through it to enter the nose. So that close proximity, we can, we can, uh, we can use this close anatomical proximity as Dr. Tanrivar already showed uh, to find, because we wanna, we wanna uh, find the sphenopalatine artery inside the nose, either to save it or just you know, to coagulate it. So another bone, is the warmer, which articulates with the lower part of the uh, sphenoid crest. So the septal deviation uh, is a common finding and septal spur sometimes may stick with the, you know, the turbinates. So we wanna, we wanna be aware of that kind of uh, the, the variations before the surgery. So here's the warmer again. This is the sphenoid sinus, ostium, and the lower part of the sinus articulates with the warmer. What else we see here? Here's a, a part of the palatine bone, inferior turbinate, middle turbinate, and here's the sphenopalatine artery. <clears throat> we see the maxillary artery in the infratemporal fossa, enters to the pterygopalatine fossa, and then passing through the sphenopalatine fossa to enter the, enter the nose and supply to supply the lower part of the nasal septum and it turbinates here. So what about upper part of the nasal septum? Etmoral artery supplies the upper part of the nasal septum. Let's take a closer look. See the sphenoid ostium, middle turbinates, and sphenopodian artery. And here's a sphenoid point recess. And we wanna be aware of that uh, the artery because when we start opening the anterior wall of the sphenoid uh, uh, sinus. As we talk, we just enlarge the sphenoid ostium downward. So we wanna be aware of that, the arteries, because it's gonna start bleeding if you don't coagulate it. Or sometimes we can dissect the soft tissue with the artery downward before removal the bone and that part of the sinus. So let's see the, uh, the sphenoid type of the types of the sphenoid sinus. So, uh, there's a concal type. It's actually, the sphenoid sinus is classified into uh, the four types according to the degree of pneumatization. So concal type or agenesis, a small air, uh, small rudimentary air cavity, uh, can we see? And it's seen the one to four percent of the population, which means more bone work. The precellar sphenoid type, the posterior wall of the air cavity extend up to the anterior wall of the cella. And this is seen like 35 to 40% of the population. The cellar type, which is most common, most common type of the sphenoid sinus, usually seen the 55 to 60% of the population. And the air cavity extend beyond to the anterior wall of the cella and below to the territory fossa, the cella turcica here. Also, the cellar type uh, is further subdivided into uh, the different kinds based on its extension into the bone. Let's see the line one indicates the posterior wall of the cella. Line two indicates for the cella floor. And then line three stands for, for the Vidian canal. As we know, this is the dorsum cella and here's the clavus of the occipital bone. So if the cellular type sphenoid sinus 
extend beyond to the posterior wall of the cella, but not extend into the dorsum cella, which is called subdorsum type. If the air cavity extend into the dorsum cella, it's called dorsum type of the cellar sinus. Let's see. <laughs> if the, the air cavity extends below to the level of the Vidian canal and into the, into the occipital bone, it's called occipital type. And sometimes we can see the combined dorsum and occipital type too. Here we see the sagittal CT, and here is the spinal sinus. As we see here, the sinus extends into the dorsum plus to the occipital bone, which is combined dorsum occipital type, as we see here. What about lateral extension of the spinal sinus? So there's an, there is an imaginary line drawn from the Vidian canal to the foramen rotundum, and the sinus sometimes can extend beyond that level, that line. If, if the sinus extend into the greater wing of the sphenoid sinus, it's, it's called greater type, wing type, uh, the sinus. If the sinus extend into the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone, beyond that level, it's called pterygoid type. And sometimes also we can see the combined type, both greater wing and into the pterygoids. So also uh, the anterior colonial process uh, may be pneumatized up to 6 to 13% of the population and the forming optocardial recess, pneumatized optocardial recess. So in like 80% of these cases, the optic nerve is dehiscent. Uh, we just wanna be aware of that kind of uh, uh, anatomical variations. What we see here, this is a sagittal CT and this is the foramen rotundum, and here's a Vidian canal, imaginary line. As we see, the sphenoid sinus extends beyond that line into the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. This is the pterygoid type of the sphenoid sinus. What else here? Rotundum, Vidian canal, extend into the greater wing and the pterygoid process. This is the combined type. So what about... Uh, what kind of spinal sinus we see here um, as uh, based on lateral extension. So this is the Vidian canal again, rotundum, imaginary line. And as we see the sinus extend into the greater wing and pterygoid process of the spinal bone. This is the combined type uh, spinal sinus. So what about another, uh, the bone, the etmoid bone? sits in front of the sphenoid sinus. We usually use, uh, we usually work through the etmoid bone for uh, reaching to the anterior fossa. So etmoid bone has a lot of plates, cribriform plates, orbital plates, perspendicular plates. What else? The etmoid air cells, and we see the crista galli, which is the most recognizable, easily uh, recognizable part of the etmoid bone. Now we are looking from above, if you, let's say, let's just remove that, uh, the part of the bone, crista galli, just next to the midline, we see the cribriform plates and lateral to it is the fovea etmoidalis that is covered by the frontal bone. So to reach the anterior, midline anterior skull base, we work through that bones. This is a lateral view. By the way, this bone, uh, the, the pictures from Rotten Collection, the front and back here. So we see the crystal galley again. This is the middle turbinate attachment, orbital plate, and we see the eight motor air cells. There is a middle attachment of the middle turbinate, which is called basal lamella. In front of that basal lamella is anterior eight motor air cells, also called as etmoid bulla. And the post behind that line is the posterior etmoidal air cells. Now we are looking through the uh, from front into the nose. What we see here, this is the perspendicular plate of the ethmoid, 
corresponds here. We see the middle turbinate is here and lateral and superior to the middle turbinate. We see the etmoid bulla also called as anterior etmoral ESLs here. So now we are in the right, nost right nostril. We see the middle turbinate. When we pull the middle turbinate medially, this is the nasal septum, and this is the lateral wall of the, uh, the nose. We see the unsunate process, and we'll take a closer look. We see the etmoid bulla here, which is the anterior etmoid ASLs here. So also, in front of the, uh, the basal lamella, which is the middle attachment of the middle turbinate. So if you lateralize the middle turbinate, proceeding backward, and we see the superior to the middle turbinate is a superior turbinate. And sometimes uh, there can be a supreme turbinate, the sphenoidal steam located medial to the whatever highest uh, the turbinate in the nose. Now we are looking inside, the, this is the cellar region. And uh, we see the cellar, clivus is here, carotid protuberant prominence, and here is the carotid too. Optic nerves can be seen. What we see here, this is a, uh, here that there is a groove here, which is corresponds to the tuberculum cellar, mostly. Here, and the diaphragma cellar attached that Recess. So, optical carotid recess. There's a two optical carotid recess. One is lateral, and another one is medial, which is the most lateral edge of the tubercular recess. Medial optical carotid recess, lateral optical carotid recess. The lateral optical carotid recess uh, corresponds to the optic strut. Uh, let's see. Let's see another, another specimen. Cella floor. It's we can see better uh, the prominent, uh, most robust uh, the prominent curve prominent in this specimen. Optic nerve, carotid again, and here is the optic nerve again. So what we see here, this is the tubercular recess. Most lateral edge of the recess is the medial optical curve recess. And here is a lateral recorded recess. And laterally, if you open that bone, we can reach uh, uh, enter to the coronal signs. So this is the final view after removal of the dura and the bone and the cellar floor. What we see again, here is the foramen serum. This is the ICA sac, corresponds to the foramen serum. And here is the paraclival ICA. And here is the proximal dura ring, distal dura ring here. So usually proximal ring is loose, but if the middle, if there is a middle clinoid, which seen 20, 40% of the population, we can see more strong and robust uh, proximal ring in this part. This is the cellar, tutorial, tutorial gland here, and this is the paracellar ICA, and here's a paraclinoid. And here's optic nerves, and this is the infracosmetic sulcus. So, and actually we saw really nice, uh, the surgical intraoperative videos about those anatomy. So I want to show short video if I have time. So, let's see. The video is aimed to show the anatomical landmark instead of surgical techniques. So we are the so you know, great at the surgery videos uh, previously and also in the future speakers too. So we are on the right nostril right now. So we're just proceeding inside along to the floor of the, the nasal cavity and we find the corona, which is the most easily identified space. This is the inferior turbinate. And if you just you know to check, uh, if you look at your inside your nose on the mirror, on the mirror, you can see the inferior turbinate too. So inferior turbinates can be you know medialized and lateralized. 
to make it more flexible, but dealer's choice. And here's the middle turbinate, just the superior to the inferior turbinate. You see, there's a fat middle turbinate here. So this finite ostium here, bluish area, and usually located 1.2 centimeter above to the upper edge of the corner. You can see that membrane that covers the sphenoid ostium space. Okay, just to you know, try to show, try to see, you know, the, the anatomy, anatomical structures, lateral to the medial, uh, middle turbinate, we see the etmoid bullet here, and uncinate. If you open this part, we can get into the maxillary sinus. So, so also, if I follow the lower surface of the middle turbinate, I can reach the sphenopalatine artery. Most likely, this is a, not the, the fresh cadaver. And probably the artery looks like the blue silicones. It's supposed to be here. This is the recess here. So just, you know, enlarging to do uh, the sphenidostin with the mushroom punch. And it's we solve cracking the posterior part of the nasal septum. Just go on the other side too. And then finally working. Here's a spin. Yeah, here is a, this is a, if you see a door over the gun too. So we see the cut of the prominence on the sides and this is the clavus and here's a cella. Optic nerves is here too. Just try to open. And we see the intact, the cavernous flexus. Thank you. Okay, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, so I can for this uh, list of and the informative uh, lecture. Uh, is there any question? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Bo. And now we will shift to uh, next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Domenico. Please start uh, sharing your screen. Good afternoon, good night to everyone. Thanks for having invited me over. Just had to go very quick on the problem, like the previous presentation were treating basically what I've been treating in this presentation. So uh, let me welcome also for my team, like I'm based in Napoli, in the southern Italy, and uh, this is our city, like this led by the volcano, and this is the Emperor Federico II, to whom is dedicated our university. And uh, the adventure of endoscopic cannulosa treatment started in 1997 with Professor Capabianca, and we moved very fast from that moment. We received a contribution from all the world, and many things have been changing also for uh, conventional neurosurgery, like there have been like a progressive minimalism, a lot of adjuvants. And of course, like we all every day aim to increase our precision and get satisfaction in results and from patient. So our role uh, has been changing because our opinion is that like there is only one anatomy, uh, Professor Tanriover and um, also the last speaker like focused very well on the need of learning and relearning and have like clearly in mind before surgery, the 3D understanding of the same anatomy because the anatomy is only one, it's a matter of perspective. So we started dealing with this new anatomy back in 1997, thanks to also like to the uh, ENT guys and this is our path like we started with anatomy but we also spent time to develop instruments and materials and then of course we refined our technique this is our uh, European concept of anatomy it says that the anatomy it is the key and the compass of every kind of surgery and 
uh, Professor Antan Riover and later on uh, Alvaro, uh, they both uh, have been learning from this giant of neurosurgery and from anatomy that is Dr. Rodon. And we had also other giants that told us how to deal with the anatomy. Like on the left side, you can recognize Professor Chabischer, Professor Prats Galino, and in the end, Professor Castelnuovo, that is our friend ENT. But also other friends that we met along the way because everyone in Napoli here goes abroad like to learn and find the techniques. And this is our main instruments so far. Like we are using like the same instruments, like this is a rigid, there's no working channel. Like there's a xenon light that is cold light and then there is an HD camera. We had also an experience with the 3D uh, visualization. We did not have that convenient uh, approach. So we got back and we are improved to this other system that has been developing in <clears throat> regular GE uh, surgery. And really, really like the difference in terms of color and in terms of definition, it is great. So few lines of history, like our group, it, it has been uh, among the first one to develop this kind of surgery after the first experience of uh, Dr. Carao and Dr. Joe in the early stage of the Pittsburgh group. And this is what we do right now. We uh, love to differentiate what we call standard approach targeted to the cella with the three phases targeted uh, to leave the nose, to cross the nose and to reach the sphenoid sinus and also some tricks along the way uh, you show uh, you, you already saw like the importance of this kind of mucosa here with the tiny vessels that uh, feed the mucosa over the septum and this is probably uh, the revolution of re uh, skull-based reconstruction and it's called the flap of Adat Bassacasteghi. So at first time we started like to perform a huge breach at the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. Nowadays we respect uh, very, very much this area here and we love in radar to expand in the posterior ethmoid. So why we say I am the door? Because this is the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus and it really represents not a hole, like you do not have to feel like that with the endoscope you can move safely the instruments unless you have created like a decent room so it needs like to be prepared at the early stage to recognize clearly what is the delicate anatomy of the cellular region and the paracellular area and we also uh, have to give a tribute to uh, the most important figures of our uh, work like one it is the pathologist that helped a lot in the definition of a new era because uh, we are still considering like a pituitary adenoma as a gentle uh, tumor. Uh, it is not any more aggressive. It does not create metastasis, but look at the WHO and uh, this group of experts back in 2016 uh, admitted the pituitary adenoma inside the category of neuroendocrine tumor calling PITNET. And thereafter, like you need several information to go and define what is like the characteristic and the features that can predict and define the behavior of the tumor along the way. Uh, Nowadays, Napoli policy, we use surgery as first line therapy, of course, in non functioning adenomas when there is. Uh, can you stop using like this red and light and uh, yellow light drawing, please? Thanks. And uh, you see here, uh, only when there is the mass effect either on the optic chiasm, optic nerve, or the nerves inside the cavernous sinus. We always go for surgery in uh, pituitary that secrete, uh, pituitary adenoma that secrete ACTH in the so-called cush central cushing disease, of course, in the acromegaly patient. And we are uh, modulating our surgery upon the pituitary apoplexy uh, on the patient, on the clinical status of the patient. So. This is our endocrinology, the chief of endocrinology, Professor Colau, that also thought how to be gentle because there is not only a matter of removing the tumor in case there is a secreting tumor, but also to respect the gland because afterwards there will be a new life for the patient. So if you go and do not respect the gland, you will encounter several problems that are uh, at long-term distance, very, very severe for the patient. And it can cause like a are really uh, um, not a good results and the endocrinologists cannot do anything aside the um, common instruments. And like, again, we start dealing with like huge tumor, like we can consider 
Dr. Goel showed this, and I'm uh, I'm very proud of the work that we performed with the uh, friends of uh, Alvaro Campero to define what we call the cellular barrier. This is a nice tumor. It is three centimeters growing upward. There is no deviation toward the planum. The gland is upward, so it protects the supracellular sister. There is no point in a going for a, so what we call an extended approach. The tumor is soft. You can remove with a bimanual dissection technique. You do recognize the gland above here you keep on removing the part of the tumor that comes very very easily and then you have only to protect the systems and to replace the gland and the endoscope you see it is only um, an instrument but it is a nice instrument because it is not a close-up view it is also like a, a what we can call a see-through view because this is a um, a paper from uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kelly group, and it says like that, you see, as much as the tumor expands inside the paracellular area, the use of the endoscope can help a lot to recognize the, the percentage of tumor that are hidden in between the diaphragm uh, and, and just close to the walls of cavernous sinus. So the endoscopic approach so far has given really a lot of opportunity to the surgeon, but we love to say that has given a lot of advantage for the patient. Above all, it is already demonstrated as shown also by the ENT colleagues that it gives like definitely a better quality of life afterwards. And in terms of quality of life, if you expand your horizon and remove the frame, as I told you, like this is again our CD from a window of our hospital, you can move easily around the paracellular area, expand your corridor and follow tumor that goes up. These are what we're doing right now with the extended endonasal approach. This has been defined by Dr. Kassam and Dr. Karao all along the midline, but nowadays we are moving also in the paramedian and uh, lateral aspect. This is the most common approach that we use to follow the uh, pituitary adenomas in the supracellular supradiaphragmatic space. But don't forget about also this other corridor because a lot of tumor, as Dr. Goel showed, goes inside the cavernous sinus and toward the infratemporal fossa. So it is important to define which are the key landmarks uh, on the lateral wall of the sphenic sinus. This is the Napoli series so far. You see all, almost 2,000 pituitary surgery, a lot of craniopharyngioma, a lot of tuberculum cell meningioma. But it is not only a matter of being brave and uh, doing this approach regardless the tumor and regardless the patient. Because when you're considering to go for that route, then you have to consider which are the possibility of access, which is the distance between the carotid, which are the relation of the tumor uh, with nerves and vessels. And of course, like speaking about pituitary adenoma, it is fundamental to recognize the stalk hypothalamus region to avoid disaster after war. And this is uh, a nice picture coming from the group of Fernandez Miranda, like that shows clearly with this, which is the corridor. You see here, this is the gland. This is the middle OCR, like in between the optic canal and the uh, the carotid artery, you see the supracellular superdiaphragmatic space, you can recognize the stalk, you can recognize the anterior vessel complex. We had like this publication almost 10 years ago, but then we realized also this other concept because there is difference. It is not a matter of dimension, like because if you have this tumor that has been falling inside this finite sinus, then it will be uh, an easy, straightforward surgery because there's no uh, invasion of the supraphragmatic space. There is no involvement of the uh, vessels, no involvement of the nerves. Here, again, it is different, but the things like really gets worse, but you breach out the afrag and you get like an asymmetrical expansion inside the brain tissue. So we start from this concept, not a huge tumor, but for sure a recurrent tumor, just had like a transphenoidal microsurgical approach. You see here a piece of fat and you see the gland that is stratified above. We uh, went from above, like recognize that gland that we saw at the MRI to identify that there is no anymore any remnant of the tumor. You see here, I skip like this part of the section inside the tumor has been the bulk 
very, very nicely. You can recognize the chiasm, you can recognize the stalks and all the vessel here, and this is the anterior complex. And of course, thereafter, there sh uh, should be like a nice reconstruction technique. And you recognize that gland at the show and the stalk has been in place again. But today, uh, I love to show you our experience so on what we call unconventional adenoma. It's not a matter of classification, it is a matter of the shape. You see here, along the here, a uh, lot of people in Italy started to deal with the adenomas because they think that it's a easy surgery, especially with the endoscope. And we expanded our caseload of this uh, very uh, unexpected case that the other people do not consider in their uh, in their services. So wh why are we are talking of unconventional? So usually they have dumbbell shaped pericellar extension. Usually they involve the main uh, structures, neurovascular structure, uh, vessels, tiny vessels at the capsule, uh, back toward the um, um, substantia uh, perfor perforating uh, substance, and of course of the vessels that feeds the chiasm and the stalk. And Let's show some cases. You see here, we're not talking about like a huge case, but again, a recurrent case, uh, very uh, like a, clo a cloverfield leaf. There's an arachnoid here, but there's no plane in the other aspects of the tumor. We went like for a extended approach. We did already remove the tuberculum cell and we did not expand very widely above in the planum, but we always start to remove the cellar component. You see, it's a sort of double double corridor. Here you have the cellar when there is this yellowish thing here. Here you have the right optic nerve. We leave uh, a sort of tiny piece of diaphragma and then we start dealing with the supradiaphragmatic part. You see, how again it is soft and then again you need to detach from the vessels respect the arachnoid and follow the tumor above toward the right side of the patient you can recognize here the vessels that you have to respect and dissect without pulling away the tumor and at the end with a 30 degree endoscope you recognize the left optic nerve the anterior complex and that was the impinging of the brain tissue of course like the reconstruction it is mandatory and should be performed and later on i'll show you what are we doing today another case not that uh, devastating in terms of asymmetrical expansion but look at this uh, here bump uh, toward the third ventricle here you have like the gland so you will find uh, a little protection in the serum so again we're going to uh, we can remove 70 percent of the tumor by a regular transcellular corridor but then like to follow the tumor toward the third ventricle we coagulate the diaphragm and we have again a double corridor we separate from the arachnoid we respect the brain tissue and the vessels you, you see on the right side you you have like the right optic nerve you have to identify the chiasm here, we will find the third ventricular chamber. You see here, in the sake of time, I skip like the maneuver because it takes really time as in a nary other tumor. And then we are inside the third ventricle, we remove a blood clot, we rinse, and we close again with the fat pad. And that's the result postoperative. You see the fat inside the sphenoid sinus and cellar area. There's no more remnant of the tumor. But it is not always a magic trick. Like you see here, like that was a huge prolactinoma. Like we started the therapy with cabergoline and two weeks after uh, this was the uh, admission CT. Of course, it had been admitted at the uh, emergency room. So we started to do both like placing an EVD for that hydrocephalus that was starting to develop. And then we went back inside surgery you see like the hemorrhagic tumor uh, again like we in this case we we had like also some wider decompression at the bone to have the relief from the intracranial pressure that developed due to the hemorrhagic component you see how it was reddish the tumor and sort of fibrous it was inside the third ventricle here thereafter the signs the, these are the two foramina of monroe and that was it Again, another case, a recurrent case. And you see here, like that was that far lateral expansion. So we decided like to leave behind something intentionally. So we started with surgery. Uh, we started to protect the flap to reuse it at the end of the surgery. I'll skip also this part in the sake of time. And we started to deal with the infradiaphragmatic part, but there is also CSF coming out because the tumor has breached the diaphragm. 
we remove it safely the word also with the help of <clears throat> ultrasonic expirator that instrument that you saw before it is a micro doppler probe to identify the carotid artery at the lateral aspect you see that that there are no real cleavage plane from the arachnoid you follow the tumor then you recognize the vessels you leave it there that's the chiasm that we recognize we go for reconstruction but the day after this that was the ct scan with the, this huge uh, hematoma uh, the patient was awake he had like a third cranial nerve palsy and one week later he had like this kind of situation due to the vasospasm because we were uh, not uh, pacing in on uh, the nimodipine. So this is our series. So far we are performing 80 almost unconventional pituitary adenomas that represents the 5% of our case series. And these are the results. 56% of them have received a total removal via endoscopic endonasal corridor. The 31% received a endoscopic endonasal subtotal removal, leaving a piece inside the cavernous sinus, not anymore any remnant, as in the case that I showed you, because the risk of bleeding and then vasospasm is tremendously high for the patient. And these are the complications, as you see, like the most threatened one is, of course, the CSF. But along the here, we move it from this multilayer reconstruction technique that we've been also reporting in the literature and in the Congresses to this very basic technique. We call it the 3F. We use it a piece of fat, uh, the flap of that basagastegi, and then we ask the patient to move out of the bed very, very fast. So this is the series of uh, the uh, technique of the 3F at our institution. We started in June 2017, and we are almost at 120 cases, and these are the results. We had like only one revision surgery in a lady that presented like a tuberculum cell meningioma and a retrocellular um, epidermoid tumor that was preventing like the uh, attachment of the flap. And then in three cases, we have been adopting this technique with the injection of fibrin glue inside the world. I'll show you quickly also this reconstruction that is very, very easy. Like this is a huge uh, piece of fat that is placed inside. And then you can ask like the uh, anesthesiologist to tilt down the head of the patient to release the pressure and then like to do a balsalva to make the excess of uh, fat coming out, you fix it with a tiny layer of fibrin glue, and then you place the Adat Basagastegi flap toward the sphenoid sinus wall, and that's it. And then you can feel the sphenoid sinus chamber. So these are our strategies. We always have a backup plan. We studied a lot, and but we study also a lot the alternative planning. Our concern is, uh, again, like to develop the adequate skill, the adequate understanding. It is not only a matter of understanding the anatomy and be a good surgeon with the gifted hands. It is, only, uh, it is also the need of understanding the radiology, understanding the pathology, understanding the endocrinology. We are a team in Napoli, so we have been expanding our caseload. We can consider our group uh, center of excellence according to what Dr. Laws, that is the giant of this kind of surgery, defined. Because we can provide at our hospital uh, comprehensive care and support to the people that are experiencing, experiencing pituitary problems. We have a residency training that is uh, focused on endoscopic endonasal surgery, and we host fellowship here, and we, have, we never stops to contribute to the research. But this is not enough. Like another giant, Dr. Apuzzo says that what we've been doing so far, it will be like the half of what we can learn in the next five years. So please expand your uh, volume of information. Start again, like with the new technique. You know that now it's going on a very nice project um, that is called the Connectomics. We are trying also to expand our uh, adventures again uh, with the engineering part, like with the radiologist and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Sulai, for this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, is there any question from uh, Ben? There is a question uh, in the uh, chat box. Uh, can you check it, please? Uh, yeah. Uh... That is Mauricio Guerrero. 
Mauricio Guerrero asked me about like the labs. Uh, it is not real. Uh, um, we do not have like the system of donation. Uh, corpse cannot be donated like after the um, in regular institution, but we can buy uh, specimens and have like not daily, but decent uh, activity in uh, um, university institution. So uh, 2006 is uh, 15 years ago, but now we improved that. So thanks a lot for this question. Okay, then yeah, there's another you one, to... hemostasis. You have to avoid bleeding, like you can use uh, any sponge or any uh, sealant. The most renowned like are Flosil or Surgiflo uh, coming from Baxter and Johnson and Johnson, but they only help with the um, venous bleeding. For instance, if you are opening like the supracellar area and you uh, cannot manage the bleeding with the bipolar forceps of the superior intercavernous sinus, then you can use that like to have like stop that blood. Or if you are going for a transclival approach, you can use whether the, um, the clival uh, venous plexus gets in the way, but not for regular yeah. bleeding. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Suleri. Thank and you. now we will shift to next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Maria Silda. Please start sharing your screen. Thank you. She's, she's muted, Sam. Can you hear me? Yes. So um, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today. And um, we've seen, we've uh, heard and seen excellent talks. And to complement a little bit what uh, we saw about anatomy, and I'm going to show what is beyond the cella, what we don't usually see in a regular pituitary tumor, but that we can see and can look for when the tumors are a lot more complex and when they have these extensions into the uh, subarachnoid space, uh, sometimes for complex tumors. And I'm gonna show not only the, um, some cases of, uh, you know, some model cases of uh, surgery for pituitary adenomas, but other uh, pathologies that show us very nicely the anatomy that can be affected in pituitary tumors and can be burst. So this is, uh, of course, uh, dedicated to the memory of uh, Dr. Gentili, uh, master and mentor. And um, well, just to start with uh, some anatomical pictures of the Indonesian approach, Dr. Yarmulu um, beautifully described the, um, the uh, pneumatization of the cella, that the sphenoid sinus in the cella that can be conchal if it's all bone, which is the most infrequent, uh, pre-cellar or cellar, uh, like in this case, uh, pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus. And that's going to help us, the pneumatization, uh, to know exactly what the recesses and the prominences of the sphenoid sinus are and the anatomical uh, variations. So uh, this is one anatomical variation that we should be aware of. And this is uh, very common up to 30% of the cases or sometimes more. And this is the pneumatization of the posterior ethmoid into the sphenoid uh, area just above the sphenoid sinus, which is here. And this is called the onoidy cell and usually has inside the uh, optic nerve and also the uh, sometimes the carotid uh, prominence as well. So it's something we need to be aware of when we do surgery in this area. And of course, this is the classical uh, depiction of the optic nerve and the carotid artery. And we see here the anterior clinoid process, the dorsum cella with the posterior cranial process, and when it's present in about a third of the cases, the middle clinoid process, which is right here. So just building the skull base a little bit from behind, we can see the frontal bone, the ethmoid, and the sphenoid bone. And just to look uh, briefly 
uh, at the picture of the sphenoid bone, uh, we can see here the sphenoid sinus. And in this specimen, there was another or not cell that is just above uh, the main sphenoid sinus. This is the ostium of the sphenoid. And if we look behind, we can see this is the anterior part of the sphenoid bone, and this is the posterior part. And we see the planum, the limbus of the sphenoid, the tuberculum, and in between the limbus of the sphenoid and the tuberculum, we have the prechiasmatic sulcus, and we're gonna have the optic nerve uh, right here in the optic canal. This is the carotid artery, and the optic strut is going to be in between the optic nerve and the carotid artery. So looking anteriorly at the sphenoid bone again with the optic nerve and the carotid, we see that the optic canal has three parts. One that is, um, that is facing midline, is facing the sphenoid sinus. The other one superiorly formed by the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. And then the lateral and inferior part is formed by the optic strut. And we'll see exactly what the intra and extra cardiac correlations are of all these uh, structures. So here uh, we have three different uh, variations of the middle clinoid process, which is going to be very important for to know for uh, pituitary surgery and in general endonasal surgeries, that one is like the small, the most common uh, or absent uh, middle clinoid. It's just inferior to the carotid sulcus here medially. Then also a more prominent uh, middle clinoid, these are what we call the kissing clinoids, is almost a complete ring uh, between the anterior clinoid and the middle clinoid. And here we have the uh, less common one, which is the carotical clinoid ring that we need to know whether we do an anterior clinoidectomy um, uh, intracranially, or if we are operating endonasally, we need to know because we can just drill, but not break uh, that bone because it can potentially injure the carotid artery. So Dr. Jack Murlu really went in detail over this anatomy, but this is as a general, uh, you know, step-by-step -step approach of, uh, to the cella and is the inferior turbinate, that's the left side, the middle turbinate, and then this is a superior, and in this case, a supreme turbinate, which is an anatomical variation, the upper part of the coena, and about a centimeter and a half, we are going to find medial to these structures, the ostium of the sphenoid. We need to perform a posterior ethmoidectomy in order to open widely the sphenoid sinus, because if we just perform uh, a sphenoid, sphenoidotomy without a posterior ethmoidectomy, this is part of the posterior ethmoid, then we are gonna have a very restrictive view of the sphenoid sinus. So here with a bilateral opening of the posterior ethmoid, everything comes more clear. The ostium of the sphenoid is right here and it is covered superiorly or was covered superiorly but by the posterior ethmoid. So importance, I think in my opinion, to uh, expose widely and see all the uh, recesses and prominences of the sphenoid sinus, I think that makes the surgery safer. And then this is the other, the anatomical variation we're talking about, the onati cell, which is the posterior ethmoid cell that sometimes goes above the ethmoid, the, I'm sorry, the sphenoid, and includes the optic canals right here and here the carotid artery. Uh, so this is the other view of the, um, of the onati cell. And this is a specimen without an onati cell. This is uh, uh, the usual view of the sphenoid sinus with the sphenoid sentations that are most likely going to one of the carotid arteries, rarely midline. The only midline structure, as Dr. Roden used to say, is the rostrum of the sphenoid. So this is not a good reference for midline. We uh, need to drill with diamond drills, these septations, not break them because they can potentially injure the carotid artery. So after careful drilling, we start to see the optic nerve prominences the carotid prominences and the cellar prominence. And here, uh, just to go over the three uh, prominences of the uh, cellar wall of the sphenoid sinus, the cellar prominence, the optic nerve prominences, the carotid prominences, and then three recesses of the sphenoid sinus that are the tuberculum recess superior to uh, the pituitary or the cellar prominence, lateral optical carotid recess, uh, lateral to the carotid and in between the carotid and the optic uh, canal. 
and the clival recess. So what is called also in the literature, like the medial optical carotid recess is uh, truly the lateral extension of the tuberculum recess. So here we see an intracranial view uh, of the same anatomy. And here in between the optic nerve and the carotids, uh, we see the prechasmatic sulcus. And this is the planum, the limbus of the sphenoid, and posterior to the prechasmatic sulcus, we see the tuberculum. And the tuberculum is really where the diaphragm of the cella, the dural diaphragm attaches to. So everything above that uh, tuberculum recess is going to be supracellar and everything below is going to be uh, infracellar. So above or below that diaphragm. The middle clinoid process here in this picture is right here. And if we go side by side and we compare, we have the limbus of the sphenoid as the superior aspect of the optic canals. The tuberculum of this, the tuberculum recess really corresponds to the tuberculum intracranially and also to the attachment of the diaphragm. The chiasmatic sulcus uh, here in, in endoscopic uh, uh, view really is not either, usually it's a flat surface and it is located in between both optic nerve prominences. And this is truly an important area where we are going to have access to the supracellar uh, structures, supracellar cisterns. And if there is a middle clinoid process in our patient, it's going to be found here in the superior aspect of this middle C shape of the carotid artery. So we need to be cognizant. We need to look at the CT scan pre-op and see what the anatomy is, especially when we are going laterally towards the cavernous sinus. And we have to remove the bone uh, here in large uh, pituitary adenomas when there's invasion of the cavernous sinus. Uh, look at the anatomy and make sure that your patient does not have a ring. If uh, the patient does have a ring, then you need to very carefully drill and make sure you don't try to break that bridge of bone. So this is uh, in an anatomical dissection, the dural diaphragm. There's an arachnoid uh, diaphragm uh, around it, and this is the pituitary stalk. And the tuberculum of the cella is right here. The breast chiasmatic sulcus area uh, is there. So if we drill this area, we're going to find first the first layer that is the periosteal layer of the dura that covers in a continuous fashion all the uh, structures, the, set, the pituitary gland, the carotids, the cavernous sinuses. So this is in, in, uh, in an anatomical, well, this is in a, in a patient. We have the carotid uh, prominence here, not as well seen on the right side, but this is the beautiful lateral OCR, the optic canals right here, cellular prominence uh, and clival recess. So this is an example of an intracellular um, pituitary tumor in an acromegalic patient. So it depends on, so in this case, we don't need to really extend laterally our uh, our approach because it's a, it's a small tumor and it depends really on the consistency of the tumor. We try when we can to do an uh, extracapsular dissection and keep the plane. Sometimes the tumor, uh, if in tumors this size, sometimes the tumor are too soft and this plane is, uh, is broken many times. But um, if we can and the, and the case allows, we try to do an extracapsular dissection, very carefully extracting the tumor. And we want to make sure that uh, we keep the pituitary gland uh, intact. We want to make sure that we protect it, that we don't pull on the stock, that uh, with endoscopic dissection, we don't blindly put our ring curettes in there and we try to retract and see what uh, what we are doing, because I think that makes a, a big difference in the uh, postoperative pituitary gland function afterwards. And now that uh, we can see so nicely the pituitary gland and respect it anatomically. So this is the pituitary gland here on the right side of the patient after the tumor has been removed. And here in this case, we want to also remove, this is the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. Uh, because it's a functional tumor, so we're going to resect that as well. So dissecting and resecting that, and that's the diaphragm on top. And this is after resection of the cavernous sinus wall, 
And this is the pituitary gland that we can see here that has been pushed by the tumor. Uh, and that's the pre-op and post-operative uh, three months afterwards. So it depends on also the anatomy of the dural diaphragm, uh, how the tumors expand and grow uh, towards the optic chias right here. This is the pituitary stock. So this is a view just, uh, this is from uh, one of the fellows in our lab, Dr. Agosti, and he's looking at this anatomy uh, from the cellar area. So tumors like this, uh, in this case, we, we remove a little bit more bone. Uh, we, we think that this patient, just the diaphragm is gonna come down. So, uh, but this, uh, we removed a little bit the tuberculum just to allow us to break the tumor and bring it down uh, slowly. So uh, this tumor has a medium consistency and this, uh, in this size of the tumor, obviously you have to devolve the tumor uh, very carefully. And at some point uh, you're going to, uh, to have to work with uh, 30 degree endoscopes and 45 degree endoscopes. And this is looking up and extracting uh, pieces of the tumor um, in a piecemeal fashion. And we see that the diaphragm, the arachnoid diaphragm is uh, slowly coming down. This is looking for the, with the 45 degree uh, endoscope. Those are the, all the faults of the diaphragm. And this is the a thin layer of the remnant pituitary gland. We reconstruct with an inlay, um, an inlay graft, and then uh, most of our pituitary cases, unless the patient is very obese or has history of uh, intracranial hypertension uh, with a free mucosal graft. So this is the postoperative result, very different from those tumors that have the clover leaf appearance where they are, you know, they have violated and go into the subarachnoid space. And uh, so this is uh, another, you know, area when we, when the tumors go to the cavernous sinus, we need to know very well what the, uh, the layers of the cavernous sinus are. And this is the periosteal layer, and this is the meningeal layer that uh, surrounds the pituitary gland. And this is uh, dissection in the cavernous sinus. Uh, we have to know when we are dealing with tumors that invade the cavernous sinus that this is the inferior hypophysial artery. So any tears on that artery are going to uh, injure, obviously, the carotid artery. But we know also that there are some branches like the infralateral trunk that goes lateral to the carotid. So if we are working this space, we need to be very cognizant of those uh, small branches of the cavernous carotid. So this is the third cranial nerve. This is the sixth, and this is V1 in the cavernous sinus. And this is the infralateral trunk here from the carotid. Um, right now we try to, when we open the cavernous sinus, we make a sharp, sharp opening uh, right here in this area. And then with a feather knife, which is a 90 degree knife that has a uh, a tip that is, uh, is protected. This is the sharp opening. We use the intercavernous sinus, the inferior intercavernous sinus to reach the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus rather than making a uh, sharp cut just adjacent to the carotid. And then with a 90 degree uh, knife that is protected at the tip, then we start opening and we can open anterior to uh, the cavernous sinus. So this is how we do it uh, through the intercavernous sinus approach, a sharp incision here. And then with the 90 degree uh, feather knife, we, that just cuts when you bring it towards you, then you can just uh, access the cavernous sinus. And I think this is a little bit safer than what we uh, did earlier. So this is this tumor in the cavernous sinus where you have this is a three times operated patient uh, elsewhere and has both cavernous sinus uh, bulging with tumor. There's nothing really like in between the cavernous sinuses. So that's uh, accessing the uh, right cavernous sinus. And fortunately is a, uh, it's not a fibrous tumor. So it can be uh, carefully dissected and uh, with suctions and uh, ring curettes. And we see here the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. 
as well. So there's a little bit on the outside of the cavernous sinus. It's obviously invading the cavernous sinus, but most of it is in there. And that uh, wall has been violated by the tumor right here, but there's still a little bit of uh, wall in the cavernous sinus. And then we can see clearly the carotid artery right here. And here we're stimulating to see if we find the um, if there's any activity of the third nerve right there. We see very clearly here the carotid. The sixth nerve is going to be just inferior, um, a little bit inferior. The third nerve, this is the posterior compartment of the cavernous sinus. And then uh, we're going, we resected also that uh, cavernous sinus wall. And now it's going to uh, the left cavernous sinus in exactly the same uh, maneuver. And here resecting uh, that incomplete medial wall of the cavernous sinus. And, and using uh, curved suctions to uh, to remove that part of the tumor. And that's the reconstruction and the pre and post-op. Um, some of the tumors uh, like this one that have uh, quite a, you know, a lateral extension, but not true invasion of the cavernous sinus. Uh, using the bulking, these uh, tumors uh, first, trying to not lose the extra uh, capsular dissection, even though we're debulking the tumor, and trying to preserve the anatomical. This is at the end of the dissection, this is the anatomical, the, uh, pituitary, the native pituitary gland that we can see uh, nicely with the endoscopes and we want to preserve, uh, to preserve function. So this is uh, not really a true invasion of the cavernous sinus, but here, this case, I just want to show a very quick clip to, to illustrate that when the tumors go lateral to the carotid, you need to be cognizant of the infralateral trunk because uh, just going lateral and then medial to that area, you can actually, you have to be very careful. So this is, this is the carotid artery. This tumor is a very invasive tumor. Um, and this is going lateral to the carotid artery. So we found the carotid artery with Doppler. And I'm just going to show the, the part that, so this is the infralateral trunk. This is the carotid artery. So this is working in that area. So very important when you are lateral to the carotid, not to uh, separate too much the carotid because that can abolish this uh, little branch and can, can have a carotid artery injury. So when we go just uh, superior to, uh, to the cella in the preasmatic sulcus, the area that we are facing is really the supracellar systems. And as you know, a lot of the tumors invade that area and this is just the keyhole to show you uh, what the uh, area, so this is the pituitary stalk, the diaphragm, the carotid artery, and these are the two ACAs. Uh, and this is the, um, and this is a, a craniopharyngioma just to show you uh, very quickly that anatomy. So just through the preasmatic sulcus, where a lot of these tumors, the pituitary tumors are going to extend to and how they push uh, this, uh, the, the chiasm. And here trying to preserve also the pituitary stock. This is a, uh, almost a 70, uh, near 70 year old woman uh, who uh, had really severe by temporal hemianopsia. So the goal of the surgery is to, she has, no other, he has no pituitary dysfunction, no diabetes insipidus. So the goal of the surgery is to do a maximal safe resection and try to preserve the function as well. So here opening the cyst.
And just to show you, um, after the dissection, trying to preserve all the chasmatic branches uh, that go. Uh, so we resected great part of the uh, well of the cyst and the small solid component. And see if uh, we can see uh, a little bit what we think is the pituitary stock right here uh, attached. And we remove more capsule of the wall. And this is the final view where we saw the pituitary stock uh, right there and the patient fortunately did not uh, have diabetes insipidus post-op, and this is the post-op imaging. And some other lesions in the cella, uh, and this is, uh, I think the last one I'm going to show uh, in the interest of time. So this is an arachnoid cyst in the cella, and just to show how uh, we can see actually the foramen of Monroe and the interventricular, uh, almost the interventricular anatomy through the cyst of the wall, which I thought was, uh, very interesting from the anatomical perspective. So just doing the, uh, the approach and decompressing the cyst. And now you're going to see, and this is, uh, I want to show that we're gonna see both foramen of Monroe uh, through a very thin uh, wall of the cella. And uh, so this is a very thin uh, layer of the arachnoid cyst. And what's, this is the pituitary stock, the remaining pituitary stock completely thinned out. And these are both framing up one row. We started by doing a fenestration here and then we fenestrated that, uh, the rest of it. And then in the interest of time, uh, I'm just gonna share with you, um, uh, that's the last case I'm going to show. Thank you very much for your attention. We invite you to the Mayo Clinic Open and Endoscopic Technique uh, Cranial Base Surgery course in June. And um, these are all my uh, fellows and who contributed to this talk. And thank you very much for your attention and the kind invitation. Thank you, Professor Lucinda, for uh, your excellent presentation. Is there any question from Bernice? I think it was uh, so great and illustrative. Thank you. Thank you. That's great, Sam. Now we will uh, share to uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Matthias. Please, please start sharing your screen. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. It's okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Smith, for for your kind invitation, uh, and thanks, John, for being there supporting this important uh, educational project around the world, and especially in in, in neurosurgery. Uh, the topic of my lecture is uh, midline pituitary gland incision especially focused for red rat cleft cyst uh, resections. I need to thank to Professor Alvaro Campero and Rodolfo Recalde. Both of them are close friends um, and people um, 
who from I have learned a, a lot, uh, especially operating um, pituitary tumors and pituitary rat cleft uh, cysts. Thank you very much uh, to those important and well well recognized neurosurgeons, Alvaro and Rodolfo. And congratulations, Sadmes uh, El Morgi, Professor Samuel Morgi, for, for, for this huge effort that you are doing uh, during the last years, uh, trying to join um, some colleagues and friends from around the world with uh, several important topics, uh, as the topics uh, that we have today in pituitary, pituitary surgery. Um, <clears throat> Congratulations to the previous speakers. Each, each presentation were real, really amazing. And uh, it is important to remember that <clears throat> uh, when we need to, to try some um, kind of tumors uh, located um, inside of the pituitary gland, like uh, pituitary adenomas, or especially uh, rat cleft, right, um, rat cleft uh, cysts, Sometimes uh, we have between our surgical corridor, that could be microsurgical corridor or endoscopical corridor, the anterior uh, pituitary gland in front of our, of our tumor. And in those cases, sometimes we need to uh, resect some, uh, a, a little portion of the anterior gland or uh, to make a, a midline pituitary gland incision. This is an old technique but anyways, there are not so many publications about this technique and <clears throat> there are no publications um, um, where we can find the, the, the proper explanation why the patients after um, an, 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 a small midline incision or, or a small pituitary gland uh, resection have not postoperative uh, hormonal, hormonal disturbances after the surgery. And I think that this is a, a field of our knowledge that could be explained for uh, in the in the in, in the future. Okay, here is highlighted in green and in yellow and in red the three different steps that the previous speakers have uh, explained uh, perfectly: the nasal step of the surgery, the um, the, the sinus uh, step, and the pituitary or cellar uh, step, or the, the last one point of our of our surgery uh, and it is exactly the same if we use endoscopic or microscopic um, surgical micro uh, surgical techniques this is in this uh, green arrow we are represented our our surgical corridor between the <clears throat> anterior surface uh, through the anterior surface of the sphenoidal sinus <clears throat> using the, the the corridor that offered uh, the anterior bone of the sphenoid sinus to reach the anterior surface of the pituitary fossa in order to access to these to these lesions. This is a case <clears throat> in order to highlight our uh, my, my presentation. This is a case that um, we we are trying to publish um, science some month ago. This is a female, three, uh, 34 years old that suffered, uh, suffered headaches and the patient have only hyperprolactinemia due to stalk effect. <clears throat> in the MRI, in the preoperative uh, studies, neuroimaging findings, we can observe this um, cystic lesion located between the anterior pituitary gland and the posterior um, pituitary lobe here. And as we can imagine, when we expose the anterior surface of the pituitary gland, we need to transect the anterior hypophysis in order to uh, reach this uh, cyst in order to evacuate them. This is highlighted the cystic image in, in the MRI in the operative, in operative study. Due to the symptoms of the patient and hormonal disturbance, it was decided to perform the microsurgical removal of uh, the cyst. We are in the preoperative um, period, we need to analyze the benefit of the surgery and the risk. We, we need to remember that the, the, um, this kind of cyst are benign lesions, but uh, if the patient have some kind of symptoms, do some, for example, some hormonal disturbance or endocrine disturbance or um, some visual field deficits, uh, we need to 
evacuate the lesion uh, in order to avoid more complication of our pain. So we need to analyze the risk, vascular or neural damage, uh, cerebrospinal fluid leakage, and new postoperative hormonal deficit uh, after the surgery. We do not um, choose the observation due to the symptoms and the hormonal disturbance of the patient. Uh, we know that um, it's controversial, the position of, of the patient. This is a patient operated um, in Tucumán uh, by the hands of uh, Alvaro. As I told you, it is, this, this is a, a series of cases that we are trying to publish some time ago, <coughs> um, but uh, we have not uh, so, so luck uh, uh, during our attempts, but we, we, we have our hope intact. This is a patient in a semi-sitting position. We use the transesophageal ultrasound, physiological neuro monitoring, high-speed drill, uh, and fibrin glue for, for closure, um, the, 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 the cellar defect after, after the surgery. And uh, this is, uh, these anatomical specimens are, a hu are, are three human hypotheses with a pituitary stalk. And we have a, a theory in order to explain why the patients after the midline pituitary gland incision have not, in its majority, have not new postoperative hormonal disturbances. As the previous speakers uh, explained perfectly, the, the pituitary gland have three main components of vascular, arterial vascular uh, irrigation. We have the superior hypophyseal artery here, we have the inferior hypophyseal artery and some small branches from arising from the directly from the wall of the carotid artery uh, in, in, in the segment of the in, in the um, in the cavernous segment and the, in the clinoid and supraclinoid segment. But uh, there are a characteristic: all these arteries arise laterally to the midline, and we think we are making studies of the. Uh, microscopic situ architecture of the, these small uh, arteries, we think that in the middle of the anterior pituitary gland, uh, we have an special, uh, like an, um, a white line or a vascular line that we can access to the center of the, of the hypothesis, in this case, for remove uh, cyst, red uh, cliff uh, uh, cyst, uh, and we have not any deficit in the postoperative period. This is a, a, a theory that we are trying to confirm or not. This beautiful dissection from, um, from the laboratory of Professor Rotten too. Here we can observe that the arteries arise lateral to the midline, in superior um, hypophyseal artery and in the, the inferior hypophyseal artery is exactly the same. Here we can observe the inferior hypophyseal artery and some branches um, that arise directly from the uh, 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 internal carotid artery. This is the anterior pituitary gland and the posterior pituitary um, lobe of the hypothesis. Here we can observe that the arteries are located uh, laterally to the midline. And I, we think that this can explain why after that we perform the midline pituitary gland incision and we separate uh, in, in two halves, the right half and the left half, the anterior pituitary lobe, the patients um, in the postoperative period usually have not um, new hormonal disturbances. Here we can observe the superior hypophyseal artery, the inferior hypophyseal artery is located behind the anterior, um, anterior lobe, and in this, in, in our technique, we perform a midline incision uh, in the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. This is an original drawing performed by Daniel Casanova, a colleague from Chile, where we try to explain step by step by step our technique of midline pituitary gland incision. After expose the anterior bone surface of the of the cella turcica. We perform um, a, a small craniotomy, um, uh, um, and after that, we remove the in a circumferential, uh, circumferential fashion the dura mater. And after that, we try to select the middle point between the lateral surface in the right and in the left of the um, 
of the pituitary fossa, and we perform a midline pituitary gland incision. After that, after to, to, to do this procedure, we can access to the uh, rat cleft cyst easily and separating the anterior pituitary lobe in two, uh, in two different parts. This is a, an example. This is an example of a micros microscopic um, rat cleft cyst resection. We are drilling the anterior part of the sphenoid, uh, sphenoid sinus, sphenoid bone. Here is the, the, the right and the left foramen of the sphenoid sinus. When we access, I'm trying to advance the video, but I don't know why I can't do it. Here we are removing in a square fa fashion the bone that surrounds the anterior surface of the um, pituitary, pituitary fossa with a high speed and uh, important irrigation during this procedure. This is the dura mater that is exposed. And we, 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 we have two techniques for for the durotomy of the anterior cellar region. <clears throat> we try to open in a circumferential fashion when we operate rat cleft cyst in order to separate the two, the two segments of the anterior um, pituitary lobe easily. After to perform the midline pituitary uh, gland incision, we can observe that the content of the cyst is, um, is being out uh, due to the intracranial pressure comparing with the, the normal pressure inside of the nasal sinus. And here we can observe the, this, this content that is um, a liquid content after to uh, remove all the content we can observe in the posterior surface, the anterior face of the posterior lobe. No adverse, no adverse outcome after this surgery and the patient evolved favorably without any, any deficit. And the MRI, we can observe the complete removal of the cyst inside of um, the, this red rat cleft, uh, rat cleft cyst. This is another case. This is a, another microscopic or, or microsurgical case where we performed exactly exactly the same. This is a case with a, an, a huge rat cleft cyst. We removed the anterior surface of the of the uh, sphenoid sinus, and in this case, the the anterior surface of the of, of the cella is a thin layer of bone due to the, the this the cyst growing that push, uh, that push the the dura mater anteriorly, uh, and uh, this uh, this uh, produce an 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 small uh, surface of the bone in this region. We perform exactly exactly the same. We remove the dura mater uh, to the surface of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And we perform a midline pituitary gland incision. And we need to transect, we need to damage in, 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 a, millimeter, in, in, a, in a millimeter or two millimeter, no more than this, the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland in order to remove all the content of the seas that should, that sometimes is green or um, or or brown, it's a darkish content. Uh, this uh, the content of of the seed. It's important to be aware to remove all the content of the seeds in order to avoid um, recurrence after our surgery and to give um, the the cure uh, for 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 our for our patients. Here we can observe another case. This is an endoscopical um, surgery uh, for, an, for a rat cleft cyst resection, exactly the same. Sorry.
<clears throat> we try to um, avoid them to resect the, the middle turbinate in our patients. We move first medially the middle turbinate. And after that, we push laterally the middle turbinate in our patient in both uh, nasal uh, fossas in, in, in the right first and in the left uh, after that. And, and trying to create um, an endoscopical corridor between the medial surface of the, of the middle turbinate and the nasal septum. Trying to preserve the anatomy of uh, the nasal anatomy of our patients and uh, uh, avoiding some complications related with the turbinectomy uh, in the patient. Here we are drilling the anterior surface of the sphenoid bone in order to access to the um, to the to the cavity of the of the of the sinus of the sphenoid sinus. Here we can observe the surfaces of the of both carotid arteries, the right carotid artery and the left carotid artery. And here is the surface that um, we can recognize through the bone, the surface where is located our anterior, our pituitary gland. We try to use the preoperative CT scans uh, in bone window in order to, um, to, to use it like a GPS, uh, our, the, the septums that are located inside of the sphenoid sinus to guide us uh, when we are exposing the pituitary, uh, the pituitary fossa. Here we are finishing our the, the drilling of the of the bone that covers the anterior surface of the pituitary gland with the diamond tip drill with uh, important irrigation as ever in order to avoid thermal damage to the pituitary to the intercavernous sinus and of course to the carotid arteries that are located near to the pituitary fossa. Sorry, but I can advance my video. I don't know why. Uh, this is why I, I'm showing the whole video, but anyway, I am, I am on time. We are resecting this um, thin bone that covers the dura mater in front of the anterior um, dura mater that cover the, 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 the anterior pituitary gland. I, I, I want to repeat that we, in, in these cases, in order to perform the incision in the midline, we try to expose as much as possible the lateral borders of the dura mater uh, that cover the pituitary gland in order to select by endoscopic or microscopic uh, view the middle point between the edge in the, la the lateral and, and, and right edge of the pituitary gland in order to avoid vascular damage when we perform the midline pituitary gland incision. As we can observe in this case, we select another option to opening the dura mater uh, in, a, in, in a cruciform uh, shape, uh, generating three flaps of the dura mater. Here we are, we are doing a small incision without a scalpel, with a, with a dissector, in, in the midline of the pituitary gland, and we can observe again this, this um, green or brown color uh, content of the cyst. After that, we need to be aware to remove all, this, all, this, all the cyst, all the content of the seal. We, we need uh, to remove the content of the cyst, and it is not uh, so important to remove the, the capsule because uh, sometimes is really, really um, close to the pituitary gland. We can observe in the posterior, in the posterior surface, the pituitary stalk and the, um, the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland after the resection. This patient have not adverse outcome after the surgery and evolved favorably without neurological deficits. In the MRI scan, we can observe again a complete resection of the uh, cyst content. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity. And uh, we tried, I tried to highlight the importance uh, of perform the pituitary gland incision 
uh, following the midline of the pituitary gland because we think that in the midline of the uh, of the pituitary gland, especially uh, in the midline of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, there are um, a, a zone, a central zone that it's um, where we can't um, find so many vessels. And this is the reason why, or at least it's, it is our theory, this is the reason why uh, the patient uh, usually uh, didn't suffer uh, postoperative post -operative hormonal disturbances. Thank you very much, Smith and Sean, for your kind invitation. Thanks a lot, Debo uh, Matthias, for uh, this excellent presentation. Is there any question from uh, panelists? Thank you. And now we will shift uh, to uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Leo. Please start sharing your screen. Can you see my screen? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Terrific. Well, congratulations again, uh, Same, on an excellent uh, symposium, uh, global symposium on very important topic of pituitary surgery and approaches. Uh, it's a, certainly an honor to be here today. And thank you again, John Bennett, for Neurosurgical TV's involvement in really promoting global education in neurosurgery. Uh, today, uh, we'll be honoring um, dedicating this lecture to our friend, master surgeon, teacher, and mentor, Dr. Fred Gentili. <clears throat> and if you look at Fred's accomplishments, he was really known for his mastery of both microscopic and endoscopic approaches to the skull base. And that was one of his favorite topics to lecture on. Uh, I had the pleasure of getting to know Fred over the years and uh, through many skull base courses and uh, skull base uh, conferences. And these are some uh, photographs. Um, this is an interesting um, photograph of uh, a meeting we had in Strasbourg, France. And you can see here, this is uh, uh, Aldo Stamm uh, and Al Mefti here and Fred. And, and we were having this uh, very friendly debate on open versus microsurgical or endoscopic approaches. And uh, Fred was also a visitor to New Jersey when we hosted uh, several skull base courses here. And, on a personal level, uh, I found him to be very kind, personable human being, very down to earth and genuine, and uh, we will greatly miss you, Fred. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to talk, change gears a little bit and talk about craniopharyngiomas. Uh, craniopharyngiomas is one of, one of the most formidable lesions, as Harvey Cushing once said. These are very difficult tumors to treat surgically, and every case is different. Not one case is always the same. Every tumor has very unique characteristics and features. Some may be purely cystic. Some can have a combined cystic and solid component. Majority of these are rather midline and in the retrochiasmatic location, but some of these can occur in uh, more lateral uh, positions uh, within the skull base. We can all agree that the goals of surgery should be a radical gross total if safely possible, but we also have to keep in mind to optimize the quality of life, and we want to preserve vision, avoid injury to the hypothalamus, and if we can preserve the stock, if possible, we will try, but as we know in some cases, these tumors do not allow us to preserve the stock, and in these cases where gross total resection can be achieved, stock sacrifice can be acceptable with hormone replacements. We often talk about the approaches to these, whether we come from above or below, and I think we have to use a personalized, tailored approach, because sometimes you have to use both approaches or one or the other. One of the classifications, and there are many out there, uh, but the one that I find useful in terms of knowing whether or not you can preserve the stock is this Kassam classification where type 1 you have pre infundibular and these are the ones that you generally can preserve the stock uh, in most cases 
type two I find that these expand the stock and I find this these uh, uh, impossible to preserve the stock and in these cases in order to take out the tumor you have to do a low stock sectioning and then type three are more difficult uh, you would have to consider a pituitary transposition or you can come from the back through Hakuba's uh, transpetrosal approach and then type four are purely intraventricular craniopharyngiomas and when I break down the approaches to these, there's generally five categories, the anterolateral approaches, midline transcranial, lateral transcranial, and then intraventricular and endoscopic endonasal approaches. So this was one of my earliest cases uh, in my career. This was a large craniopharyngioma, which I had chosen to do a orbitozygomatic transsylvian approach, but you could see upon exposure of the chiasm, you, rare, you don't see the tumor very well. And that's because it's retrochiasmatic in location, you, and you have to open up lamina terminalis and open up optico-carotid window, and you have to work through these tiny windows to get to this tumor, which can make it more challenging, but also more risky to the neurovascular structures. Um, here's another case where uh, you could see it's primarily retrochiasmatic, but if you look at the position of the chiasm and the infrachiasmatic window, it's rather narrow, and the translamina terminalis window is a little bit larger. So in this case, I came in through an interhemispheric transbasal approach through the lamina terminalis, and you can see here we're going through the lamina terminalis, identifying the tumor, and then the beauty of this approach, as opposed to a anterolateral approach, is that you have a pure midline anatomy, and you can visualize both walls of the third ventricle and hypothalamus. And here you can see there's the basal artery and a, a complete removal. But you have to keep in mind when you come from above, there's still this area of a blind spot on the undersurface of the chiasm, which is difficult to see. You can use a dental mirror or endoscope to look underneath. And so although the initial post-op resection looks very favorable to me, you have to follow these patients long term. And you can see at five years out, we start to see some early recurrence, probably in the area of those blind spots. And we successfully treated this with, um, with uh, radiotherapy. So um, which approach is more favorable? Uh, this is the view that you see from above. This is the view from below. And I think the major advantage of coming from below is that you, you have this ability to visualize the undersurface of the optic nerves, the chiasm, the perforators, and the hypothalamus. You get this beautiful view of the hypothalamus, and you can do very careful, meticulous dissection of the tumor from that interface of the hypothalamus. And I think that's the major advantage. Um, uh, some of the literature suggests better visual outcomes when you come from below. Here's an example of another craniopharyngioma, and you pay attention to the radiographic findings here. This is the diaphragma cella. This is the tumor. The yellow is the gland, and you have to make sure you choose the right approach. The typical transcellar approach would be incorrect, but you need to come above the diaphragm and do a transplanum, transtubercular approach. What are the pearls for success? We typically like to use a 30-degree angled endoscope that helps us look upwards. Uh, and when you drill the bone, remember that the course of the optic nerves go anterolateral from back to front. So that when you drill the planums, uh, sphenoidale, it's not a rectangular bony opening, but rather trapezoidal opening. Some people call this the chef's hat opening because it follows the course of the optic nerves. And you can often decompress the medial aspect of the optic canal at the same time. So here is the dural uh, exposure. I typically like to expose the cellar dura in addition to the tuberculum dura over the chiasmatic sulcus and then the planum uh, sphenoidale. And when you open the dura, the first thing I typically look for is this small vessel that comes off of the medial carotid. These are the superior hypophyseal artery branches and these are very critical in uh, giving uh, vascular supply to the chiasm. So you must preserve these perforators. You typically will get a branch to the chiasm, and then there's typically another branch that goes to the stock. 
So the next step here is I open the arachnoid over the tumor and I open it like a curtain because the arachnoid membranes here are very critical to understand. When you look at the tumor, there's a layer of arachnoid directly on the tumor called the tumor arachnoid, and then there's another layer of arachnoid in the cistern called the cisternal arachnoid. If you mobilize both arachnoids so that you're in the plane between the tumor and the tumor arachnoid, the arachnoid membranes will mobilize towards the neurovascular structures, towards the optic nerve, towards the carotid artery. So here you can see there's arachnoid membrane that's covering the ICA, the PCOM, and it's protecting these PCOM perforators. And if you follow it, in most cases, these tumors will respect the membrane of Lilliquist. And that is another arachnoid layer that helps protect the basilar artery and the P1 perforators. How do we find the stock? The technique I like to use is I find the bottom of the tumor, find the top of the gland, and I lift up the tumor, and I look for the portal striations of the pituitary stock. And that is one method that you can help find the stock. Here's the basilar artery and third nerve. And in some cases, you cannot preserve the stock because the tumor has expanded the stock. And as Ed Oldfield has previous, have previously published, uh, it's probably more effective to prevent tumor occurrence and get the gross total while sacrificing the stock in those cases and putting the patients on hormone replacements. So here's an example of one of those types of tumors. Here you can see this is a cystic tumor. We're peeling it off in the undersurface of the chiasm. There's the uh, mammillary bodies. There's the third ventricle. And then you'll see here that the tumor, if you follow it down, goes right into the gland. So there really is no preservable stock here. We're peeling off the, the last remnant of the uh, uh, tumor. And then here we're removing the last bits of the tumor here. And here's the final view. You can see the ACAs, the undersurface of the chiasm, and a uh, gross total removal. So again, the major advantage here is that you get a direct view of the hypothalamus. And we have to resist the temptation to pull you want to deliver the tumor, but first ensure that all of the adhesions around the tumor have been freed before you deliver it. And then you'll get this nice view of the membrane alliloquist overlying the P1s, the mammillary bodies, and then this classical view of the third ventricle from the endoscopic approach, looking at the foramen of Monroe. So reconstruction remains a challenge. Oftentimes these tumors communicate with CSF in the third ventricle, and these can pose high risks of postoperative CSF leaks. And so reconstruction is very important. We typically like to use a multi-layer repair approach with fascia lata uh, and then a nasal septal flap with a lumbar drain. And, and currently in our craniopharyngioma series, uh, we've had two leaks, which is roughly 7%. And this is what it looks like. You can see fascia lata. We recess the fascia lata and place a little bit of surgicel and then use the HB nasal septal flap. Here's a video showing the repair. You can see this is a, a big defect. We'll put the fascia lata on first, put a little bit of surgicel to kind of hold the fascia in place. And it's very important to ensure that there is no CSF percolating through the defect before you rotate the flap. Because if there's still CSF percolating through, the flap is likely not going to work. Some of the tricks I use is I put the patient in reverse turn Dellenberg to elevate the head to re lower the CSF pressures. You can also drain a little bit of CSF from the lumbar drain during the repair. And then here's the final view of the nasal septal flap. In the office, uh, they'll undergo debridement. And then you can see this is how the flap heals. And then you get a nice uh, post-operative result. So, Again, I think the major advantage is that look how you can remove this tumor and there's no injury to the hypothalamus, no edema, and a nice gross total removal. It's very important that you choose the right approach. These tumors are supra diaphragmatic. You can see here's the tumor and this is the gland. This is not a pituitary adenoma. Unfortunately, this patient was uh, treated uh, at another center where they did a transcellar approach and they biopsied the normal pituitary gland. You could see the craniopharyngioma was not touched. And so that was the wrong approach. So you have to do an extended endoscopic transplanum, transtubercular approach 
to this tumor. So here we are drilling the uh, ventral skull base. We drill the planum, the tuberculum cella, and the cellar floor. And then you open the dura above and below the intercavernous sinus, ligate the intercavernous sinus and divide it. And this will divide the diaphragm to get into the supracellar space. We decompress the cyst contents, and then we can begin our subarachnoid dissection, peeling the tumor away from the critical structures. So here we are looking at the left optic nerve. Here's the left carotid artery. And then here's the ACA vessels over the top of the tumor. You can see there's some arachnoid adhesions to the optic nerve. So you have to use two-handed bimanual microdissection using sharp dissection, uh, cutting and lysing these arachnoid adhesions one by one in order to release uh, the tumor. Here is the pituitary stalk. This is intact. So this is a pre-infundibular tumor. Here's the third ventricle. And then again, lysing all the arachnoid adhesions avoiding the temptation of pulling and making sure all the adhesions are released before you detach and deliver the tumor. And then here's the pituitary stock and the final repair with the nasal septal flap. Here's the post-op scan. You can see complete removal. Look at the optic chiasm completely decompressed with restoration of vision. Here's a larger tumor, more solid uh, component. This is in a pediatric patient. He has a nice aerated pneumatized sphenoid sinus, so this is still very favorable for endonasal approach. And so here we are coagulating the intercavernous sinus, dividing the uh, dura to get into the uh, supracellar space. There's the tumor, and then here is the carotid artery. So we'll go ahead and uh, debulk the tumor and then this is the chiasm over the top of the tumor. We'll continue to debulk the tumor here using this side cutting aspirator. And then once the tumor is decompressed, we can start to come around the top of the tumor using a suction sweeping, suction dissection technique by putting a little bit of gentle traction with your dominant hand on the tumor capsule and using the suction to carefully dissect the tumor from the hypothalamus and the beauty of this approach is that you can visually see the hypothalamus. The dissection here is not blind, unlike the transcranial approaches, because oftentimes the dissection is blind and you have higher risk of hypothalamic injury when you have blind dissection. So again, once the tumor is completely freed from all the adhesions, you can slowly deliver the tumor. And you can see this is a, a nice complete removal of this craniopharyngioma mostly solid and uh, using this 30 degree angled endoscope we can look underneath the chiasm inspect the resection cavity here's the hypothalamus free of any tumor and then we can look around rotating this 30 degree scope looking into the uh, left paraclinoid uh, artery here's the ICA coming out of the distal ring and then here's the view of the membrane of Lilliquist. Here's the basal apex. And then here's the defect with the repair with the fascia lata and the nasal septal flap. Here's the post-op scan. You can see complete decompression of the optic chiasm. And uh, he's about 10 or 11 years out. He's now an adult. This was when he was a child. And he's been recurrence-free since then. Here's a 7-year-old. You can see the, the sphenoid sinus is not as pneumatized here, uh, but this was a nice case I did uh, visit, as a visiting professor doing live surgery in Mexico City. We got a nice complete removal of this tumor, and uh, the patient has done quite well, and she's been about actually three years now recurrence-free. So can the endoscopic and nasal approach be feasible for recurrent craniopharyngioma if you've had a previous craniotomy. So look at this patient. She's had a previous three craniotomies, one microscopic transphenoidal, and she had a previous right IC injury, and she's blind in the right eye. So you could see she's already had some impairment from previous surgeries. And the reason why this keeps recurring is that the previous surgeons continued to drain the cyst, but they did not try to resect the cyst wall. So the idea here is that this tumor presents itself nicely to the sphenoid sinus, 
So it makes natural sense to come through this endonasally. And you can see we've opened up the cyst wall here, but the cyst wall is very thick, fibrotic capsule. This is not a thin cyst wall. And we can stop here, but it will tend to recur. So we attempted to identify the tumor capsule, which we did here, and we peeled it off of the left optic nerve. And you can see we've nicely dissected this thick fibrous capsule away from the remaining good optic nerve on the left. And uh, we left a little microscopic remnant adherent to the cavernous ICA on the right side, and we treated that with uh, radiotherapy. And here's her post-op scan. You can see a near total removal, and uh, she's been recurrence-free for the last uh, several years. Can we erase the telestration here? Okay. So what about this large craniopharyngioma? I, I think when we see tumors like this, our knee-jerk reaction is to say this needs an open approach. But I will argue that even these large tumors you can successfully do endonasally. Uh, this is the uh, case. You just have to be patient and continue to decompress the tumor. And the, the idea here is that this tumor was very adherent to the hypothalamus and there's a technique that you can use using very sharp dissection you can find that interface where the tumor becomes this gelatinous material to the hypothalamus and you we typically use sharp dissection to define that plane so if you just pull on it you'll injure the hypothalamus but if you use sharp dissection you can carefully identify that plane and, and clearly separate it without causing traction on hypothalamus. And so here's the delivery of that tumor. And then here you can see again the beautiful view of the third ventricle. The hypothalamus here is in, intact. And we have a nice complete removal of the tumor and we restored her vision. What about this case? This has a giant cystic frontal lobe component, but the solid component is retrochiasmatic. I debated a long time whether to come at this transcranial versus endonasal, and my thought was that I could get a better visual decompression coming endonasally first, and possibly staging it with a second stage transcranial if needed. So here we are coming from below endoscopically, and we'll go ahead and open up the dura and then drain the cystic fluid. You could see the classic uh, motor oil type fluid. And then here's the intracystic solid contents that we're debulking. And again, the first step I typically look for is looking for those superior hypophyseal arteries. Be very careful not to coagulate this branch vessel. Uh, it is not a tumor vessel. It will wrap around the side of the tumor and go towards the chiasm. And so if you coagulate that small vessel, you can potentially blind the patient. And so we noticed that the tumor wrapped over the chiasm to form this large frontal lobe cyst. And you could see that the ACOM was studded with this tumor. And at this point, I felt that I could not achieve a complete radical removal. And at best, I could do a near complete, safe, maximal resection. And in this case, since the pituitary stalk can be preserved, I'm not going to be able to get a complete removal. So my decision here was to preserve the stock and then get a maximal safe removal. So here's the basal artery. Here's the pituitary stock. Again, you have to use two-handed microdissection. This is all microsurgery, but through a smaller opening. And that's how I like to think about this. So here's the tumor being removed. Here's that frontal lobe cyst. It is very difficult to peel that frontal lobe cyst without injuring the recurrent artery of Hubner and the ACOM. And so I decided to leave this for a second stage uh, if needed. And so here's the critical structures. And here is the post-op scan. We kept her pituitary function intact. She had transient DI in the cyst decompressed, but I know there's a cyst wall there. And then at three months, the cyst wall continued to regress. So at this point, because I knew that the um, ACOM was encased, 
I decided to go ahead and treat it with radiotherapy. And here she is 16 months post-op, post-IMRT. The cyst wall has regressed. And we published this technique uh, some time ago about combining the strategy of doing a maximal safe removal and doing early radiation therapy. So what is the role for early radiation therapy? You could see this is another case where I had to leave some tumor that was located behind the ACOM complex in perforators. I didn't feel that it was safe to remove, and so I monitored it. And at three months, you could see the tumor is starting to recur. So we treated this with IMRT, and look how the tumor has regressed. At two years, the tumor has regressed, very responsive. Here's another example of an 18-year-old who had combined therapy with endonasal with IMRT. And then this is supported by the literature of the radiosensitivity of these tumors. And we should also address the open approaches because they're certainly uh, necessary. This is a laterally positioned craniopharyngioma, not very amenable to endonasal approach. So we do this through a modified orbitozygomatic transylvian approach, working through the oculomotor, carotid oculomotor triangle. You can see there's a nice view of the basilar trunk, basilar apex, after removal of this tumor. And we got a near total removal and treated the microscopic residue with IMRT. Here's an 80-year-old woman. She uh, continued to have recurrences due to the cystic tumor. She was treated with an Omaya catheter that kept failing. And because she was had a previous terional on the left side, she was left blind in that left eye. So now you're left with this tumor on the right side. And because it goes supralaterally, I didn't feel that endonasal approach would be favorable. Plus, if she needed radiation therapy because of her multiple recurrences, you would have to wait three months until that nasoceptal flap was healed. So what kind of approach can I design where it's minimally invasive, low risk of CSF leak, and that I can send her off to radiation quickly and get her out of the hospital quickly? Well, we can do the eyebrow approach, and this is a superorbital eyebrow incision that we did, minimally invasive, and we came at this uh, combined transcortical to get to the cyst wall, and then uh, subfrontal, to get to the subarachnoid component. So here's the cyst wall in the uh, transcortical area. And once we followed it into the suprachiasmatic subarachnoid space, we then come subfrontal and we open up the arachnoid. Here's the right optic nerve. And uh, again, this is very adherent, a lot of scar tissue. So you really have to use sharp dissection, use a good pair of micro scissors and really cut the adhesions that are involved here. You can see this is gonna be adherent to the uh, optic nerve on the right and uh, the ACOM complex. And so we're just removing this in a piecemeal fashion. And then here's the tumor that's adherent to the optic nerve. One technique that I find useful is if you take this arachnoid knife, if you cut right on the tumor capsule, you will release the scar tissue so that the scar tissue releases towards the optic nerve and it really releases this adherent scar tissue and you it you don't have any traction on the optic nerve and so this technique is very useful cut directly on the tumor and it releases the dense arachnoid fibers to release it towards the uh, optic nerve and then here's the final view here's the acom complex that you can see and then we were able to get her out of the hospital within two days and we had a near total resection and we were able to send her off to radiation therapy. Here's another example. This is a, a, an indication for an open approach. You could see this is a multilobular, multicystic tumor. Notice how it's encasing the A3 vessels. This would be very dangerous through an endonasal approach. So we came at this through an interhemispheric transbasal approach. Look how the A3 vessels are completely encased by the cyst wall. So we were able to remove the cyst wall. There was some microscopic adherence to the ACA vessels. And then we removed the tumor in the retrochiasmatic space through the lamina terminalis. We got a near total removal. And at the three month scan, the patient recurred in that retrochiasmatic cyst. So now you can come in endonasally to get to that retrochiasmatic area.
Here's the chiasm. We're removing the cyst wall, and we left this dense adherence of calcium to the optic chiasm to prevent injury. And here's the nice view of the third ventricle. And she did quite well. We treated her with IMRT with excellent control of her tumor. And then lastly, I'll show this case. This is a 30-year-old female with this cystic tumor. We got a near to gross total removal. There was this questionable gelatinous tissue that was adherent to the right hypothalamus. I'm still unsure whether that's just inflammatory tissue or if it's truly a uh, residual tumor, but her post-op MRIs have looked great. But what's interesting is the pathology was a papillary craniopharyngioma. And what, I, what that suggests is that if you have a papillary craniopharyngioma, there are targeted therapies now with BRAF, and MEK inhibitors. There's some good early literature showing the um, favorability of using these chemotherapies. And, and hopefully in due time, we'll have some uh, chemotherapeutic targets to the uh, adamantinomatous variant as well, hopefully in due time. So I'll conclude here. The endonasal approach is an excellent option for retrochiasmatic craniopharyngiomas, but you have to have expertise in both open and endonasal approaches, just as our friend, friend Fred Gentili has taught us. And we have to have excellent knowledge of our anatomy, surgical technique with team experience. I think adjuvant radiation therapy is a useful uh, uh, option in our armamentarium, as well as the molecular targets for chemotherapy. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dibu, for uh, this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, there is uh, one question uh, in chat box. Uh, how does uh, you identify medial OCR while drilling? The medial OCR, um, so the lateral OCR tends to be more obvious. So that, that's like a true recess. The medial OCR is, is generally the lateral aspect of the tubercular strut. And so you have to unroof that, and that allows you to decompress the medial optic nerve canal. Uh, I do that in every craniopharyngioma case, and I do that for every tuberculum meningioma because uh, oftentimes the tumors will invade into the optic canal. So it's nice to have that optic canal uh, controlled, but it really gives you that exposure of the ICA as it comes into the subarachnoid space through the distal dural ring. So you really need to unroof that to get adequate exposure for these transplantum cases. Another question, uh, do you always open the dual over cilia for the trans tubercular approach? Yeah, I always open the dura over the cella because uh, it gives me good control of the intercavernous sinus. Uh, it gives me more space. Sometimes you need that angle from inferior to superior working space. Sometimes you can uh, incise the gland or resect a little bit of gland to get that angle. And, and it, it doesn't do very much harm to the patient. It's uh, very analogous to Matthias's uh, uh, explanation of incising the gland, I would say. Thanks a lot again for this excellent presentation. And now we will shift to our next speaker, Muxo Alvaro. Please start sharing your screen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, it's okay. Okay, and can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, hello. It is a big pleasure to be here now talking about the cellar barrier. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Same for the invitation for uh, this uh, magnificent uh, pituitary course. And when we treat a pituitary tumor, could be very small, so big, with uh, the growth to the uh, upper region or to the cavernous sinus, with the gland in the upper situation or in the lateral situation. And sometimes we have a, a tumor with another lesion like an aneurysm or empty cell syndrome. But in all the cases, 
we try to solve the symptom and signs and also not to generate complications. In relation with the symptom and signs, hypersecretion in the functional pituitary tumor and in the macroadenoma compressive syndrome. And to avoid complication, CSF fistula, pan hypopituitarism, and of course, an hematoma. In this case, I am going to talk about the CSF fistula that could be intraoperative and also postoperative. This is my experience with more than 600, uh, almost 700 cases. At the beginning, I started to operate with the microscope and uh, now for the last three years with the endoscope. And I would like to show this first case, a woman with uh, acromegaly, we can see uh, we, we call this patient the patient uh, zero. Why? This is the patient with the tumor uh, above the cella in the sphenoid sinus with the uh, high acromegaly syndrome. And we can see the tumor here and empty cella above. Of course, when we see this, uh, this patient, we think in the intra-op and also the post-op fistula and also we think about the meningitis and so on. And during the surgery, we can see the tumor inside the sphenosinus. Now we can see the gland uh, push down because the CSF and the tumor, and we can push, the, uh, pu uh, push up the gland and we can remove all the tumor. This is the dorsum the, the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. And finally, we can see this, that is the pituitary gland that we can see in the MRI, but without any kind of CSF. So we start to think that sometimes between the CSF and the tumor, we can have the pituitary gland. And this is the post-op MRI with the remission of the, of the disease. The second case, another patient, a, a woman, 39 years old with a micro adenoma. We can see a line here uh, with the gadolinium, the gland, and also here in the upper portion of the tumor. And in the sagita, sagittal view, we can see the gland and the tumor. And during the surgery, we are trying to do the pseudocapsular dissection and at the end of the resection of the tumor, we can see the pituitary gland and here the arachnoid uh, above the pituitary gland. And the final view with the pituitary gland posterior and superior and the gross total resection of the tumor. And we can see here the post-op MRI with the gland go down and with the resection of the tumor and remission of the disease. And after that, we operate a, a similar case in, in size, uh, I mean, in, in, in the terms of size of the tumor, but here we cannot see the gadolinium, gadolinium enhanced line above the tumor, a patient with a Cushing disease, very symptomatic. We can see the patient with a, a lot of symptoms. And during the surgery, this is the pituitary gland and the tumor trying to do the pseudocapsular dissection, the tumor. And finally, after the resection of the tumor, we can see the pituitary fossa without tumor. But here we can see a defect that we just have arachnoid between the upper portion of the tumor and the CSF. And this is the post-op MRI with the, uh, the resection of the tumor. This is fat that we put uh, to avoid the post-op CSF fistula and the patient with the remission of the disease. And after that, we operate another case of apoplexy. We can see here the white line enhances gadolinium white line above the tumor. And we can see in the, during the surgery, the tumor and the tumor. And finally, after, remotion of the tumor, we can see here the pituitary gland 
that go uh, down and we can see the post op MRI with the pituitary gland, the stall and the chiasm. And another case, similar case in size, uh, another patient with uh, acromegaly, we can see in the sagittal view, the, this line posterior, but not superior. And in the coronal view also laterally, but not superior. During the surgery, the tumor very soft. And we start to see just arachnoid between the tumor and the CSF. And final view with the gland here with the spongostan and arachnoid. And we can see the post-op MRI and also the post-op MRI with the gland in the right side of the page. So between the tumor and the CSF, we can have just arachnoid, sometimes arachnoid plus dura mater, and sometimes the better situation, arachnoid with or without dura mater and pituitary gland. So we started to think about a concept, the cellar barrier that could be strong or weak. So we can see a strong cellar barrier, a weak cellar barrier, just arachnoid in the same size, uh, size of the tumor, a strong cellar barrier and a weak, just arachnoid cellar barrier. After that, we started to think, not just to understand the, the, the surgery and uh, when the cellar barrier descend, uh, go down, but also to understand the MRI. So in this MRI, a patient with the prolactinoma, with the a bad um, uh, um, result with the cavergolina, and we can see stalk, pituitary gland, and also strong cellar barrier here in the right side and here in the upper portion of the tumor. During the surgery, the cella, opening the cella and the dura, the tumor, and at the end, the cellar barrier go down. We can push up in order to, to avoid uh, some piece of tumor. Uh, and we can see in the post-op MRI, the cellar barrier here, a strong cellar barrier that we can see in the pre-op MRI. And the same thing here in relation with the with the pituitary stalk in the sagittal view. Another case, a non-functional macroadenoma, we can see a thick line, white line, enhanced line here in the upper portion, more in the left side, but also in the right side of the patient. And also we can see the same line, a strong cellar barrier in the sagittal view. So during the surgery, the cella, opening the cella, removing the tumor. And at the end, we can see a cellar barrier, strong cellar barrier that we saw in the MRI. In the, we check in the left side and also in the right side. And we can see the pre-op MRI with the gland and the post-op MRI with the gland, more or thick, thicker in the left side. And here we can see the pituitary gland here, and we can see in the post-op MRI, the stalk and the pituitary gland more in the left side, and similar in the sagittal view. So we published in 2019, this first paper about this idea, the cellular barrier that separate the tumor from the CSF. But, after that, we have some cases like this. This is another patient with the macro, non-functional macro uh, adenoma. And we can see here the line in the right side, but we cannot see the line in the left side. We can see in the midline, but not in the left side. So during the surgery, exposing the cella, opening the dura and starting to remove the tumor, and we can see here in the left side, just arachnoid, uh, a weak cellar barrier. But at the end of the, of, the, of the surgery, we can see pituitary gland um, in the right side and just arachnoid in the left side. 
And we can see in the post-op MRI also the pituitary stalk, the gland in the right side, and almost nothing, probably, not probably, just uh, arachnoid in the left side. And we can see in the post-op MRI the stalk, the pituitary gland, and here nothing, just arachnoid. So here we had a strong cellular barrier in the right side and in the left side, just a weak cellular barrier. And the same in the sagittal view. So we introduce another type of cellular barrier. So we have strong, sometimes weak, sometimes and mixed, sometimes. And we publish at the end of 2019 uh, the new subtype that is the mixed cellular barrier. And then we validate this idea with another hospital, another colleagues in another part of the world. This, this is from Argentina and also from Napoli in Italy and also from Ohio, uh, Vienna in Austria and also from France and from Mexico, from Seville, Spain and also James that, uh, that gave an excellent lecture uh, right now uh, from uh, new new from from US and finally i would like to to talk something about the pseudo capsular reception in my opinion i think that if we have a strong cellular barrier is a good idea from to try to do a pseudo capsular resection but if we have a weak cellular barrier maybe it is better to try to resect piece by piece of the tumor. And this is a case that we operate the last week here in Tucumán, a macroadenoma. We can see a, a strong cellular barrier, the pituitary gland, another uh, and in the sagittal view, the pituitary stalk and the gland. Another important thing, look this, in the T1 with, with gadolinium, it's difficult to differentiate the diaphragm from the pituitary gland, but in T2, we can differentiate the diaphragm here and here from the, the other line that is pituitary gland push up because the tumor. And the similar thing in the sagittal view, this is just diaphragm. We cannot see in the T2, the difference between the tumor and the pituitary gland but in T1 with gadolinium, we can, we can differentiate. So um, drilling the cella, opening the cella, cutting in circular uh, fashion the dura mater and expose the tumor. And now we are trying to, to look the, and to, to use the pseudo capsula between, the, in, in this case, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus in the right side. Now we are working uh, below the tumor. We are exposing the dura of the dorsum. And then we are going to the left side in order to, uh, to find the, the, the pseudo capsule and also to separate, in this case, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus in the left side. Now we are working above the tumor and we have, we, we knew before the surgery that we have a strong cellular barrier. So we can work uh, um, quiet because we know that we, we have just, not, not just arachnoid, but also we have a gland. So we are continuing trying to dissect the tumor using the pseudo capsule. And we can see above the, 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 the superior portion of the tumor, this is that is the pituitary uh, gland push up because the growing of the tumor. And finally, the tumor is almost uh, out of the cella and we remove in block the, the tumor. But in our opinion, in our philosophy, we think that is better if we have a strong cellular barrier because uh, lesser possibility of have an intra-op and also a um, post-op CSF leak. And this is the post-op CT. 
yet I don't have the MRI with the, the growth total resection of the tumor. In conclusion, cellular barrier is a good predictor of intra-op CSF fistula. It can be strong, weak, or mixed. The main anatomical structure which constitute the cellular barrier in many cases is the pituitary gland. The pseudocapsular resection is a good um, um, fashion to do a resection, especially in our opinion, in a strong cellular barrier. And rather than saying the sending cellular diaphragm that usually we use should be better to say the sending cellular barrier. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, dear friend, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. Is there any question from panelists? Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you. And now we will shift. We will shift to uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Guento. Please start sharing your screen. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, it's okay. Yeah, okay, thank you, very, thank you very much, Professor Same, for this invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here. And thank you, Professor Bennett, for the technological support. And I want to start my lecture by giving my deepest condolences for Dr. Professor Fred Gentili. Uh, he was a, a giant, of course, a giant of uh, not only on a skull base, but uh, in neurosurgery all around the world. So thank you, Fred, for your legacy. Well, my talk is going to be a little bit uh, controversial considering all the presentations that we have uh, had today. At, uh, I want to start by saying that, of course, most of the pituitary adenomas uh, can be and must be operated on through a transphenoidal route, either one endoscopically or macrosurgically. But uh, in my personal opinion, there's still a place for craniotomy in some specific cases in which I think it's a much easier to perform it in, deep, in this way than uh, from below. So I'm going to share my uh, experience on that. There are several routes to get into the cella turcica from, from above. The most, common, the most common approaches are, of course, trional, subfrontal, interhemispheric frontal approach, peeling of the middle fossa, or anterior or posterior transpetrosal approach. But all of those approaches only represent 6 to 10% of all pituitary tumors, because the rest of them, of course, can be operated on very easily through a transphenoidal route. So let's say I'm going to show you some examples just to give my personal uh, a view of these uh, kind of lesions. Let's start with the most common approach that I used, that is the uh, tyrional approach. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, about the techniques because everybody knows how to perform it. Just a few uh, changes between one person and another, but the, the goal is the same, is to expose all the tyrional area to get into the cell of torsica. Let's see this uh, first example. She's a, a young lady who had uh, this uh, hemorrhagic uh, pituitary tumor. And uh, this is the simple MRI. You can see here the hemorrhagic uh, contents on the tumor. And this is the contrast enhancing. And you can see the pituitary gland and the tumor that is uh, enhancing with this uh, gadolinium. Of course, this tumor can be also approached the transnoidal but it is necessary to make a transtubercular approach with all the risks of uh, CSF leak and the risks also of uh, dysfunction on the nasal, uh, of, uh, nasal, nasal dysfunction because of the using the nasoceptal plaque. A simple craniotomy, it uh, may be a very good option. So in this case, we use a right trional approach. This is the details of the positioning of the patient. And this is the surgery. You can see here the uh, sylvian fissure. The surgery begins with the splitting of the sylvian fissure just to be able to put away the frontal and the temporal lobe to get into the area. You see, it, it's very important to take a, 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 as time as, as necessary to be a, a able to separate, to split those uh, lobes and to expose the area where the optic nerve 
and the uh, carotid artery is clearly seen. Then we move forward to find the uh, olfactory nerve and to expose the tumor initially through a sub subfrontal, subfrontal approach. You can see here the tumor. You see the aspect, the bloody aspect of the tumor because of the of the bleeding that the present present that the patient presented. And this, I begin by identifying the the contralateral optic nerve, and then an opening at what opening on the surface of the tumor just to be able to remove the internal part of the tumor for the compression. This will help. At the, for the removal of the limits of the of the of the walls of the tumors, it's very easy to use a curettes and the pituitary forceps to get a piecemeal resection of the tumor. Now you can see the arachnoid plane. It's very important to identify the arachnoid plane to uh, preserve all those perforate, perforating arteries in terms not to get a, a damage into the pyramidic area and the chiasmatic area also, and. Uh, Transcranially, it's very easy to get this control of all those anatomical structures. And the surgery continues by the, the bulking of the tumor. There's the chiasm, the chiasm behind of the, of the lesion. And when the tumor is, uh, the upper part of the tumor is totally removed, it's uh, time to go into the cella torsica. By moving the microscope, it's also easy to find the cella region here. And I'm looking for the pituitary stalk. The pituitary stalk is over, over here, this is the, the area of the pituitary stalk. And then we cut the upper part of the tumor and we go into the cella torsica. <clears throat> here is the uh, cellar diaphragm here. And we are working now into the cella torsica by using also curettes. Curettes, uh, until we can identify the normal pituitary gland that you can see here, the aspect, the clear aspect of the gland. and Curates of uh, bigger sizes are introducing in a very easy way. Of course, there is a blind spot in the, in the deepest part of the, of the surgical area, but it's, all, it's only the cella torsica, so it's very easy to, to, to perform. This is the pituitary stalk when it's completely removed, when the tumor is completely out. And this is again the cellar diaphragm and the last view of the surgical uh, 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 bed. This is both. Uh, uh, optic nerves, the optic chiasm, and the surgical bed when the tumor has been completely out. And this is the control MRI. In the left side, you can see the preoperative, and in the right side, the postoperative scan, and where you can see that the tumor was completely removed with the uh, uh, preservation of the gland. And the sagittal view, pre and postoperative, here's a detail of this, uh, of this. Uh, 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 a, a result, you can see how the tumor could be removed and with total preservation of the pituitary stalk and the gland and with, without mobilizing, without manipulating the nose and with good results with, uh, with uh, no risks of a CSF leak. That's the patient 10, year, 10 days the, uh, after the surgery. You can see there is no evidence of any uh, uh, cosmetic problems or any uh, olfaction problems or, and no risk of, uh, uh, of uh, CSF leak. So it's uh, another option. It's, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that is the best option, of course, but you can consider this option in these particular cases. Let's see uh, one more example. You see, when this tumor grows lateral, it's very difficult, unless in my hands, to remove this tumor from below. Uh, there is a, a narrowing here that does not allow me to descend this upper part of the tumor. So a simple terional approach, you can control this tumor first, and from here, you can remove the tumor, the, 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 the lower part of the tumor. The problem here is the cavernous sinus. You can see here the carotid artery is completely surrounded by the tumor, but remember, this is a benign lesion. This is, there is, there are another, other options to treat the residual tumors. So my particular point of view in those cases with the small pieces of tumor into the cavernous sinus is to remove only the safest part of the tumor. I mean, the cellar and supracellar tumor and leaving a small piece in the cavernous sinus just to, to observe or to be treated, for instance, by, uh, with a radio surgery. That's what we did. And this is the, the post-operative result we can see that the tumor was completely removed, but well, not completely because we left 
a small piece of tumor surrounded the, the right carotid artery that was under observation. And up to now, the patient was operated on five years ago, and the tumor has not shown any a, a sign of a regrowth. That's the patient that did not have any neurological deficit. This is another case. All those cases are non-functioning pituitary nomas. There are no case of a, of a prolactinoma. So all of those uh, cases didn't respond to any medication. So it's a similar case, but with cystic components into the tumor, but the approach, the focus is, all, uh, is exactly the same. A uh, terional approach, like a uh, right terional approach, approach is for me, uh, uh, in my opinion, is uh, safer to remove this tumor uh, completely. As you can see here, this is the pre and post operative MRI in, MRI in sagittal view. You see how the tumor could be re totally removed. And this is the coronal view. And it's very clear how the tumor could be removed also. This here is the pituitary gland that is pushed back uh, uh, downwards. And even though if I can see this gland, it does not uh, assure that the patient is going to have a complete recovery of the hypophyseal function. So it's very important to, uh, uh, to uh, have a, a multidisciplinary team for the post-operative management of this patient. But this is the patient who could be reincorporated to her, his normal life with, with no any neurological uh, deficit but only, only a, a substitution a hormone a treatment was necessary for, for the long-term treatment of this case. Another case, do you see how the tumor can grow into the lateral, ventric, uh, lateral ventricles? Uh, we see this, uh, this day some uh, expert removing these tumors from below. In my hands, I think it's very difficult to get this upper part of the tumor into the cella torsica from below is uh, for me much easier to control this upper part at the beginning of the procedure from a craniotomy and then the last part of the tumor in the cella is much easier to remove. But of course, there's always a blind spot in the in transcranial approach, which is the bottom of the cella. This patient was operated on through a interhemispheric subfrontal approach. This is the detail of the positioning and the skin incision and the craniotomy. This is the area of the craniotomy. It does not have to be a big craniotomy. In my opinion, it's not necessary to remove the orbital rims because the approach to the cella is going to be taken by the splitting of the uh, frontal interhemispheric fissure. And the, this gives you the opportunity to get the upper part of the tumor at the beginning of the surgery and to remove this upper, upper part. And the last part in the bottom is very easy because, because there are no any uh, important structures in, 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 in below the tumor. So this is the uh, schematic representation of the approach. You see how the broad frontal lobes are split just to expose the tumor from above. And this is the surgery. You see it's an, an old case, sorry. And I'm beginning with the splitting of the frontal interhemispheric fissure, and this is the tumor. You see, it is a, a, the, the, the process is exactly the same. And open, uh, we open a window here, an ample window. This is the A2, A2 both sides, and this is the anterior communicating artery. It's very important to preserve all this perforance because uh, if we coagulate a lot here, it's a uh, there is a risk of uh, hypothalamic uh, damage. This is the upper part of the tumor. This is the lamina terminalis. You see how the tumor can uh, usually preserve all those areas, but it's very important to uh, make a subarachnoid uh, uh, dissection of the tumor just to avoid the damages of, of, of all the uh, perforating arteries. And now I'm removing the cellar content of the tumor. Of course, there is a blind spot in this area and sometimes you can, it's, it's necessary to get a, a, a tactile a, a feeling of uh, the removal in this area. And this is the result you see here in the left side, the preoperative MRI, sagittal and coronal, and the control MRI is possible to see that there is a small residual tumor here into the cella torsica that is uh, uh, taken under uh, observation. And in cases of this tumor pre uh, present a, a, a growing, it's very easy to remove this tumor in a second stage transesphenoidally. And this is the patient that did not have any neurological problems uh, uh, to be concerned about it. What about cavernous sinus? Uh, we saw this morning or this day uh, 
splendid uh, exposures of the governor's sinus from below. But also, a peeling of the middle fossa is a very good and safe option for all these tumors that are completely surrounding the carotid artery. This is a case with a, another case of a non functioning pituitary adenoma with invasion of the right cavernous sinus and the cellar region. That patient was operated on through a, a right terrional approach, a simple terrional approach, but uh, with the peeling of the middle fossa. The clue, of course, of, course, of the approach is the detachment of the dura propria of the Meckel's cave and the trigeminal nerve just to uh, uh, attach the tumor between the uh, uh, trigeminal branches. So here is the surgery is remember on the, on the right side, the surgery begins with the coagulation and cutting of the middle cerebral, uh, meningeal artery. And then when this is done, it's time to identify D3 and D2. Here is B3, you can see here B3. Now I'm drilling the the foramen to find V2 here, <clears throat> and then uh, the peeling of the middle fossa is started. It's uh, uh, I like to start in V2 here in the foramen rotundum here by detaching the dura propria of the Meckel scape and the trigeminal nerve. And as soon as the detachment is get is uh, is in progress, it's very easy to find the branches of the trigeminal nerve. He's here. Here we have V3, V2, and the tumor. Usually the tumor in cases of pituitary adenomas eh, eh, appears be, appear between B2 and B1 and eh, above B1. So it's very important to keep in mind that above B1, this is B1, here are the, the oculomotor nerves. So it's eh, necessary to try to avoid to manipulate a lot this area. So I'm start working between B1 and B2 to find the floor of the cavernous sinus. And then I'm going backwards to find the carotid artery. Here is the, the floor of the carotid sinus, and that's the horizontal portion of the carotid artery, the, the cavernous carotid artery. You can see here in, a pituitary, in pituitary tumors, it's very easy to remove usually the tumor because, because these, those tumors are very soft. And uh, you can get uh, ample resections with uh, a, a, a good and safe results. I'm uh, uh, working. Here is B1, B2, and B3. Of course, there is a blind spot uh, immediate to B1 to the trigeminal branches. So it's uh, very important to make this uh, detachment of the tumor with the cures. This is the end of the surgery. You can see here the whole tri trigeminal nerve with uh, no macroscopical evidence of tumor. And this is the result, preoperative here in the left side and the postoperative in the one in the right side, you can see the tumor could be uh, acceptably removed. Of course, those patients have to be followed because uh, the risk of leaving some pieces of tumor inside the cavernous sinus is very high. So it's very important to keep in observation those patients. This is the patient in the immediate postoperative uh, period, and this is in the long-term outcome that we can see that there was no any evidence of oculomotor deficit. This is the last case, last case I'm going to show you. It's uh, also an old case. It's a rare case of pituitary tumor that was invading the uh, cellar region, the cavernous sinus on the left side, and the petroclavial region. In those cases, in this case, I use a combination of two approaches. First of all, I operated the patient through a, a middle a peeling of the middle fossa for the removal of this portion of the tumor. And in the second stage, I operated, operated on the patient for removal of the posterior part of the tumor through a posterior transpetrosal approach. Let's see the first uh, approach, the peeling of the, of the middle fossa, and in the second stage, the posterior component of the tumor. That's in, on the left side. This is the detail of the positioning of the patient and the skin incision. And again, the clue of the approach, of course, is the detachment of the dura propria of the Meckel scape and the Gasserian ganglion to be able to uh, attack the tumor that is inside the cavernous sinus, uh, working between the branches of the of the uh, trigeminal nerve. So this is the surgery left side. This is V2. This is V3, and the tumor is here, totally extradural. And remember that this is a pituitary lesion, a pituitary adenoma. So is uh, usually these tumors are uh, suckable and are usually easily to remove. Sometimes there are bleeding from branches of the internal carotid artery in the cavernous portion, but it can, can be coagulated very easily. 
Here we have a one, V2, and we mobilize the microscope to get a view, a safe view uh, below V1, just to remove the tumor that is medial to this branch of the trigeminal nerve and to expose the medial, the, the uh, horizontal port portion of the carotid artery that is going to appear now. This is the horizontal portion of the carotid artery that is, is clean. Is, um, there is no risk here for damaging of the sixth cranial nerve. The sixth cranial nerve is running behind the, 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 this portion of the artery. So this is a safe area for removal of this tumor. And in the second stage, we extend the exposure to the posterior fossa uh, uh, through a posterior transpetrosal approach. These are schematic approaches, uh, schematic representation of this transpetrosal approach that appears in uh, textbooks. And we can see the, that the approach is, uh, get, got, is, uh, is gotten uh, by the uh, retraction of the temporal lobe and at, uh, attaching the tumor in the presimode area. So this is the schematic representation of the tumor. And this is the surgery, as you can see here, is on the left side, the temporal lobe is elevated and the sigmoid sinus is retracted behind. And this is the tumor. This is the pseudo capsule of the tumor that is open as uh, with, a, uh, with a bipolar, just to begin with the decompression, the internal decompression of the bulk or the bulking. And now it's time for searching for all the nerves. This is the sixth cranial nerve that is going to the uh, cavernous sinus. This is the fourth cranial nerve in the upper part of the surgical exposure. And this is the fifth cranial nerve here. This is more branches of the fifth cranial nerve, just uh, to remove the last part of tumor that is is, is this. So uh, this is the removal of the, all the pseudo capsule, and this is the surgical bed when the tumor uh, was taken out. That was the fourth cranial nerve. This is the anterolateral part of the medulla and the pons, and you see that the tumor could be re totally removed. And this is the postoperative, the comparative uh, uh, view of the preoperative uh, uh, MRI in, a scan, in, in, in axial view. And the postoperative control where it is uh, possible to see that the tumor could be macroscopically removed completely. And that's the patient that did not have any neurological uh, uh, deficit beside of the endocrinolog endocrinological deficit that was uh, replaced with, the, with hormones. So as a conclusion, I can say that, uh, yes, a, a craniotomy is a viable option. Uh, if you don't have enough experience in complex endoscopic approaches, believe me, it's not very easy to remove the tumor, a complex tumor invading the cavernous the, the sinus or invading the anterior medial fossa from below. A craniotomy is very, is very simple. It's more simple than with uh, another tumor like a craniopharyngioma or like a, a tuberculum salamaningioma. So why don't offer the patient this safe procedure in some specific cases? Um, it's very important to select the cases. It's very important to choose all of them where we can offer a safer procedure than uh, with, other, with other options, of course. It's a very important and mandatory, of course, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, uh, the team of endocrinology is a very important of those cases. Sometimes uh, real complications happens in the postoperative period if the patient is not complete, is not a uh, well uh, followed. So uh, the teamwork is, uh, I think, the most important clue of the, for the success of these uh, complex lesions. Thank you very much again for the invitation, and I appreciate. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dirk Bende, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, is there any question from uh, panelists? Okay, thank you, dear friend. And now we will shift to uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Codwell. Please start sharing your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Can you hear me and can you uh, see my screen? Yes, we can hear you yes, fine. It's okay, Sam. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I just wanted to uh, say a few words um, in condolences to uh, 
uh, the death of uh, Dr. Gentili. He was a great colleague of mine and a great friend and obviously a great mentor uh, for many of us. And it's really an honor uh, to give this talk in, in, in his uh, honor. Um, the talk I'd like to give is really um, related to, uh, it's a perfect bookend to what uh, Gerardo Ginto just talked about. And I'd like to talk about uh, an experience with giant adenomas that I've had over the years. And I don't have any significant disclosures. Um, but uh, to talk about giant pituitary tumors, which are really a, a challenge uh, surgically. And uh, Jefferson uh, first coined the description, but we use it in our definition as tumors greater than four centimeters. And I think it's simple. They account for five to 15% of all adenomas uh, that we see. Um, <clears throat> the, the problem that you have with large tumors, and I think it was well described by uh, Professor Ginto, is that they're large and they can be complex and they may not all be able to be removed uh, from a transphenoidal uh, approach. These are the common presenting symptoms um, and you can see them here. And um, I think the real issue is, um, and I, I give credit to my friend Atul Goel in Mumbai for this, but uh, the majority of them are soft, as you know, and it's a finesse delivery. And we want to deliver the tumor down and uh, not hurt the existing pituitary function if possible, and also get the tumor removed completely. And the reason that we're able to do it through the transphenoidal route is most of the time they're soft. But some of the times they can be very complex. So what would you do with this man? So it just so happens that he presented with apoplexy and he was uh, significantly um, uh, had a decreased loss, loss of, or uh, level of consciousness. And we couldn't assess his vision, although his pupils were not reacting when he came in. Um, and what do you do? So uh, it just so happened we operated on him urgently to decompress his optic apparatus, but his prolactin was greater than 200,000. And he was just merely started postoperatively after transnasal decompression on cabergoline and he had a almost complete response of this tumor. So it's remarkably effective medical therapy. Now it's important to recognize that there's a specific type of GPA, giant pituitary adenoma, um, that may be very easily removed by the transnasal route. And for the younger people, I look at these as tumors where the diaphragm celli here is intact. And it's important to recognize this subgroup because they'll descend nicely. And this can be easily removed through a transnasal approach. And here you can see that the pituitary stalk is there still, and she still has residual pituitary function after removal. So I'm going to uh, tell you some of the things that I've learned. This is a paper that's just been published in the Journal of Neurosurgery and reviews a series of 108 cases over the last 15 years or so within the endoscopic era. And when we chose different approaches and when we chose a transphenoidal approach. This is a list of the different approaches that we've used for this series of tumors. The vast majority of them have been removed by the transphenoidal approach, but we've used a trans uh, terional approach as uh, described by Gerardo in the last uh, talk, a transcolosal approach, transcortical, and subfrontal. So these are all your avenues to removal of tumor in the supracellar cistern here. And we've used all of them. These are my personal indications for transcranial approach for pituitary tumors. In my own series, I used a transcranial approach in about one to 0.5% of cases. So as uh, Gerardo mentioned, constriction of the diaphragm celli, the snowman tumor that you know is not going to drop into the field. Paracellar extension, lateral extension where you know it's not likely gonna drop down in the field. Tumors of fibrous consistency with large supercellular extension, again, where it's less likely to drop down. If there's an aneurysm associated um, with the tumor uh, and we have treated them at the same time. Uh, and so we'll use a transcranial approach for control unless we plan to treat simultaneously. Uh, these kissing carotids, if there's not enough of an intercarotid distance to be able to remove the tumor, we'll use uh, a transcranial approach. A vascular encasement, 
And one that I've added that people don't talk about much is whether you have cranial neuropathy from cavernous sinus invasion. And we have a lot of experience coming in transnasally for cavernous sinus involvement, but I'll, choose, I'll show you a case where we would choose a transcranial approach because of that cranial neuropathy and the reason why. So these are the baseline characteristics of my series that's just been published. And it's 52% of them, uh, uh, or 62% were men. And you can see all the presenting symptoms here. Apoplexy in 13% of the cases. Um, here's the uh, uh, other demographic variables of the uh, patients that were admitted. And you can see that the NOS grade was high in a lot of these patients. And this, again, is an indication that you're not going to probably get complete removal unless you plan to enter the cavernous sinus and remove the tumor. And remember that the majority of these have significant cavernous sinus invasion. And I would just remind you that a grade three and grade four is tumor, is tumor lateral to the carotid, it's encasing the carotid and involving the cavernous cranial nerves, even though they may be asymptomatic. So here's a few tricks that I've learned. You have to open the dura widely. And initially when Hardy described uh, his approach uh, uh, with Guio and they popularized it in the 60s and the 70s, they opened the dura in a, in a cruciate fashion here. And I don't do that. I open the dura widely either in an X fashion uh, or I remove the tumor, the dura completely. And so for these giant tumors, if you're going to get a roof to fall, you've got to remove the floor well and the lateral walls, and then the roof will come down. So I can't emphasize this enough. Give yourself the optimal window to allow the tumor to drop down if you're going to do it transnasally. And so we'll expose the carotids bilaterally in these cases and open up to the tuberculum celli and inferiorly uh, to the uh, inferior clivus here beneath the cella and open up the dura so that we can get the tumor to drop properly. Um, we use a transmodal operation in 88% of these cases, uh, the majority of them you can see, and you can see the other approaches that we've used, transcranial approaches. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we'll do routinely is we'll use Valsalva in the operation, and the anesthesiologist can provide this. And so it's a key that if you're going to remove these tumors with an elevated diaphragm and you think you can get it to drop, try not to get a CSF leak early in the case because the CSF pressure above you can help pull down the, push down the tumor. And I'll show you that in the video. And we'll use bilateral jugular venous occlusion, which is like a Valsalva on steroids. It's really, really effective. And you can do that through the drapes and it, it causes increased intracranial pressure. Now, this slide shows the technique that I use to try and optimize the tumor to drop. And I think this is a, a very important point for the younger people um, in that, again, open the dura widely, either remove it or use an X, because this gets you to the corners if you use the X incision. And then you've got the tumor down in your field here. And what I concentrate on is removing the floor first of the tumor and then going up the lateral gutters and going up sequentially the gutters on each side. And then you ultimately get the tumor to start to drop. If you remove the center of the tumor first, you leave a rind of tumor that will not descend. So you want the heft of the tumor, the weight of the tumor to help drop and then use CSF pressure and Valsalva to help push the diaphragm celly down. So ultimately, when you use this technique, you'll see a herniation it's like a complete inversion of the supercellar diaphragm down into your field. And you'll be able to tell that it's the diaphragm because there's often a dimple where the stock comes into the diaphragm and you'll see that. So let me show you this on a video. Over. With evidence of previous apoplexy. Standing up into the third ventricle here. The tumor was 56 millimeters in the largest dimension. 
had to do a internasal transphenolical resection of this tumor, demonstrating the technique that we use to try to get the tall tumor to drop down into the field. A wide sphenoidotomy is performed. The tumor is evident within the sphenoid, and we open up the dura over the tumor. Concentrate on removing the tumor from the inferior aspect and the floor of the tumor. After the floor is cleaned off, we start up the lateral gutters of the tumor bilaterally and remove the tumor. Important to hook the curette underneath the back of the tumor as we go up the gutter. The lateral gutters have been cleaned out to the farthest extent it can be reached. We concentrate on the posterior aspect of the tumor. And what we're identifying here is the drooping diaphragma cellae coming down into the field. At this juncture, we'll notify the anesthesiologist and ask them to perform a valsalva maneuver, which will facilitate the dropping of the center of the tumor. Careful not to violate the diaphragm cellae and remove the posterior aspect of the tumor, which here is noted to have evidence of previous apoplexy. Bring down the firm apoplectic components of the tumor to get the supercellular part of the tumor to drop completely. It's important to remove the center of the tumor as the last step in this process to reduce the chance of leaving significant tumor in the gutters. See the diaphragm is herniated down in the field now and we'll clean up the gutters around the diaphragm to remove tumor as completely as possible. Endoscopic view demonstrates complete removal in the diaphragm in the center of the field. Please note that we took great care to maintain the integrity of the diaphragm in this case to be able to use Valsalva to help the tumor descend. Go ahead and proceed with closure, fat graft in this particular case. This post-operative imaging shows excellent resection of the tumor with a complete descent of the supercellular component. A six-month delayed MRI. So this technique can be used regardless of whether you use an endoscope or microscope for your surgery. Um, but it's been very effective in my uh, opinion over the years to try and get these big tumors to drop. Here's another example. This is a, a apoplectic patient with necrotic apoplexy and a 30 year old man with six nerve palsies bilaterally. And you can see the post-op, but here's the lateral view and then the post-op view. And you want to be very careful because obviously the pituitary gland is stuck as a little membrane over the diaphragm. You don't want to come around that membrane and do a hypophysectomy. You want to leave the pituitary gland intact and let the diaphragm come down and then clean off all the tumor from the residual pituitary gland. So what do you do in cases such as this? So here's a case um, of a woman with 100 pound weight gain and she came in lethargic into the ER. She had hydrocephalus uh, and EVD was placed. And you can see the tumor is coming lateral here. And I used endoscopic approach and I tried to get the tumor to drop down, but it just would not completely. And so uh, the next day I brought her back and we did a transcortical removal for the rest of it. And <clears throat> I did this case probably 15 or 20 years ago and I would have done it differently now. I'm gonna show you why. So here's another uh, example of a case um, where uh, the patient again presented with a giant adenoma, visual difficulties, hypopituitarism, and he's got this huge tumor with a lot of mass in the ventricle and uh, down extending from the cella up to the ventricle uh, at the level of the corpus callosum. And so instead of coming in transphenoidal on a case like this, I will come in primarily transcranial. And the reason for that is that if you follow down the, the corridor of the tumor here, you're able to get down to the cella fine. And I think Garajo showed that in the case, and I'll show it to you again in another case, where you can remove the tumor completely. You don't need a transphenoidal approach on a case like this because the corridor of the tumor is making your surgical corridor right down to the cella. And here you can see, I've left a little bit of tumor in the cavernous sinus, but even the pituitary stalk is still there and uh, you can come and just follow the tumor right down to the region of the cella. So we wouldn't even bother with the transphenoidal operation here because it's not likely to get the supercellular component of the tumor. And it's important to control the mass of the tumor 
because you can create apoplexy in the residual tumor with disastrous complicant, uh, complications. What do you do with this? Here's a, a case, recurrent tumor in the cavernous sinus and the cella. So the tumor's in the cella and has grown into the cavernous sinus. She's had radiation therapy before. What do you do? Do you come in from below or do you come in from above? And I'd like to make a case in this. She had a six nerve palsy, and I'm gonna show you why I would choose a transcranial approach and a transcavernous approach uh, as Gerardo just showed us for this case and make the case that consider so doing a craniotomy in a case like this. On the right side, she had previous surgery and then radiation for this tumor and now has a recurrence with a progressive six nerve palsy. Primarily located in the cavernous sinus, cella is also filled with tumor. I could make the argument to either transcranial in this case or transnoidal with extension into the cavernous sinus. Choose a transcranial approach in this particular case to be able to manage more effectively the sixth nerve if it requires repair. Frontotemporal craniotomy is planned. She's positioned supine on the operating table, and her head is turned approximately 40 degrees to the left side. Surgical incision is opened, and we can see evidence of the primary approach many years ago, which was frontal. We'll perform a full frontotemporal approach here to be able to do a extradural approach to the region of the cavernous sinus. Fill up the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus by the superior fissure, V2, V3, and here we're dividing the middle meningeal artery at the frame of spinosa. When we expose the ganglion, we can see that the tumor is presenting to the surface between V1 and the fourth nerve, i.e. Parkinson's triangle. And this opening and proceed with debulking of the tumor. Know that the third, the fourth, and the fifth nerve are pushed laterally. We do not know where the sixth nerve is running. So during the dissection, we do a piecemeal removal and bring the perimeter of the tumor in and carefully explore for the sixth nerve. We identify the sixth nerve, which she is completely disconnected in this case. And go back to the region of Dorello's canal, explore and find the sixth nerve at Dorello's canal. Find it, form a primary repair of the sixth nerve within the cavernous sinus. The repair is performed with nino suture, interrupted fashion. Nerve is repaired. Explore the cavernous sinus and make sure that we've removed the tumor completely. We close the opening into the paranasal sinuses with a muscle plug and fiber glue. Dead space within the cavernous sinus is filled with fat. After duro is closed, the bone flap is replaced using titanium mini plate fixation and a med pore craniplasty is fashioned. Our imaging shows resection of the tumor with visualized fat graft within the cavernous sinus. Improvement of her cranial nerve six palsy starting about six months following the repair and improved till almost a year following the repair. She has functional binocular vision. So I think the important thing here is, is that remember the fourth and the sixth nerve, they innervate one muscle only. Uh, and they're excellent um, nerves to consider direct repair on because you'll get good improvement with, uh, with inner re innervation after uh, primary repair of these nerves. The third nerve is terrible because it gets crossed innervation, but the fourth and the sixth should really be repaired if they're injured or if they're damaged by the tumor. 
Um, so I want you to just consider the transcranial approach as a reasonable approach for this. So here's a case that uh, uh, Chandrasekhar Diopajari and I did in India together. And this is a case of a pituitary tumor that had a transnasal approach previously, and they couldn't get the tumor to, to drop at all. Then they had a frontotemporal approach and the tumor was firm and they couldn't get much out. He's got hydrocephalus, he's got a shunt in place. And I'll show you how we'll do this. So look at the, the axis of the tumor is going straight up. So I'll use a uh, transcolosal approach in this case. And attempted to both transphenoidally and transcranially through a frontotemporal approach. The previous surgeons were unable to remove the tumor. See it is extending vertically up to the level of the foramen or row and beyond and causing hydrocephalus. She has shunted hydrocephalus at this point and we'll choose an approach to come down the long axis of the tumor and remove the tumor right down to the region of the cella. A transclosal approach here on the right side. Identify the corpus callosum. The dissect between the anterior cerebral arteries. Really upon opening up the corpus callosum, we identify the large tumor, which is entered, debulked. It's a combination technique of debulking the end of the tumor and then dissecting around the perimeter of the tumor to remove it completely. Using soft cottonoid dissection technique, dissect the tumor from the surrounding perimeter. Choose to debulk the tumor, the dissected capsule. Here, part of the tumor now is dissected free of the walls of the ventricle. Identify the plane of the tumor. Balance. Absolute is cauterized and remove it in a piecemeal fashion. We're down to the region of the cella. The tumor along its vertical plane down to the region of the cella, which is now evacuated of tumor. It's extending into the lateral cavernous sinus. And we'll stop here and not perform any further dissection. Field is irrigated. So gel foam is used to plug the opening through the corpus. This is bolstered by fibrin glue to avoid hygroma. Swab scan shows complete resection of the interventricular tumor, but small residual left in the left cavern sinus. The patient remains stable post-op and his vision stabilized. And then finally, I'm going to show you a case uh, where we'll perform a frontal temporal approach on and uh, an example of a case. And this is quite similar to a case, again, uh, Gerardo showed. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a gentleman. This case demonstrates the removal of a very large macroadenoma and a 44-year-old man with near complete visual loss in his right eye. He presented late with very deteriorated vision. See the tumor is extending from the cella into the supracellular cistern and pushing up the third ventricle. And it's also extending frontally. It's encasing the anterior cerebral arteries. This is an indication for surgery transcranial. It's a transcranial approach for this case, given the extent and the vascular involvement. A right frontotemporal craniotomy is planned. Round flap is fashioned. Dura, and we can see, which is quite common in these tumors, that there's a tremendous amount of hemosiderin where he's suffered subarachnoid hemorrhage from the tumor in the past. Sylvian Fisher, immediately identify the very large soft tumor. At the center of the tumor to enable dissection around the perimeter of the lesion. Very soft, quite hemorrhagic. Adequate debulking. Identify the 
frontal perimeter of the tumor and dissect it from the inferior frontal lobes. Now identify the right optic nerve, which is quite atrophic. We sharply dissect the tumor off of the optic nerve, the proximal carotid artery. The extent of the tumor is dissected fairly and removed. Identify the middle cerebral branches, bifurcation of the carotid artery, and pick up the anterior cerebral artery and follow this out distally to the ACOM. Capsule of the tumor is removed. Continue removing the tumor posteriorly to where it merges with the pituitary gland. Important to recognize where the tumor merges with the gland so as not to injure the gland with the remaining removal. Find where the tumor merges with the normal gland, which is pushed superiorly. It's dissected, as is the region of the hypothalamus. This is the remaining gland. Stasis is secured. It's closed. Anatomy is closed. Post op imaging shows complete resection of the tumor and remaining normal pituitary gland. He had a lengthy recovery, but did well, and his vision in his right eye improved slightly. So I just want to show this last case as a, as a real um, warning to the young people. So you can have these giant tumors. This is a 42-year-old man who came in with cognitive decline and headache, giant tumor, they often have these cysts around them. We've published on this. It's trapped CSF, but it facilitates the dissection of the tumor if you do come transcranially. You can see the large tumor. So this is a case I took care of approximately 15 or 20 years ago. And we did a transnasal approach. The tumor was soupy. We couldn't get it to drop. And the patient ended up deteriorating postoperatively because he had apoplexy and I had to come in transcranially to get the tumor. So currently, nowadays, after what my experience has been over the years with a lot of these patients is that I would come in transcranial on this approach initially to control the mass of the tumor so you can avoid this dreaded complication, which can occur in up to 12% of these cases postoperatively if you leave tumor. So their options are a single transthenoidal approach, and you know all the advantages and disadvantages, a single transcranial approach, or a combined approach as well. And we've done this occasionally, um, but uh, we'll usually try to view the tumor removal through one approach if we can. Um, so if we can get the tumor out through this uh, transmodal approach, we'll do that. But if we can't, we'll use a transcranial approach and try to remove the tumor right down to the region of the cella. So in conclusion, giant pituitary tumors are still a treacherous problem. Mortality has improved. It was 1% in our series that's just been published. Complete resection is not possible in most cases because of cavernous sinus invasion. The large functional tumors, the growth hormone ones especially, are problematic to get uh, adequate endocrine control. You need to control the mass to avoid apoplexy. And if that's one message that I can deliver today, I think that's the most important one to the younger people. And multimodal treatment is necessary in most cases. And, and just like uh, Professor Ginto, we'll usually watch the tumor. If it's a regular to benign pituitary tumor, we'll watch the residual in the cavernous sinus. If it does grow, we'll go ahead and treat that with radiation therapy. And I thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks a lot, uh, Dave Professor, for uh, this uh, excellent presentation and illustrative uh, videos. Is there any question from uh, panelists?
I think it was uh, very illustrative uh, that uh, make us uh, have no more question. Thank you, dear professor. Thank you, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. And now we will. Thank you, Sam. And now we will shift to our next speaker, Professor Joanne. Uh, please start sharing your screen. Hello, everybody. Bill, great to see you. Great talk, as always. Good to see you all. Um, and, uh, and good morning for those of you who are, that is, is morning time. Um, thanks for inviting me. You guys see my screen okay? No, you are not selling, right? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay, here you go. Let's see. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for inviting me. Um, um, I am Juan Fernandez Miranda. This is uh, where I work at Stanford, where I've been here for about three years. Um, as we all know, it's all about teamwork and having the right team working with us. And especially, I'm going to talk about endoscopic in the nasal surgery. Having a good uh, rhinology ENT team is essential in what we do. Uh, in addition, you know, we try to carry on, on Professor Rotten's legacy. And this is my laboratory in Pittsburgh, in, uh, at the University of Stanford, Stanford University. Um, and uh, we carry on, on on trying to do nice dissections that can, um, you know, enhance our anatomical knowledge and influence uh, surgeons worldwide on, you know, performing gentle, accurate, safe surgery, as Professor Rotten uh, encouraged us to do. Um, I do have some conflict of interest uh, relevant to the talk because uh, you will see I use these uh, uh, dissector, dissectors that I design. Uh, but two different versions with two different companies. Um, so just be aware of this conflict of interest. I do think these are great dissectors, but I acknowledge there's a conflict of interest here. Um, so I'm going to talk about a transcavernous approach, endonasal endoscopic transcavernous surgery for pituitary tumors. And I subtitled this method to madness because I, I, I want you to understand that although this might seem uh, too risky um, in some more inexperienced hands, when you do this the right way, really the results are very good and you know uh, they can be very safely done. I was heavily influenced by uh, Professor Evandro Oliveira. I know we're honoring uh, Professor Gentili today, giant in neurosurgery, and Professor Evandro passed away a few years ago too. And, and, and uh, he was a, a great influence on my way of looking at neurosurgery, the passion of looking into doing, uh, you know, uh, surgical, complex surgical approaches. And from him and from his work with Professor Rotten, you know, I learned that the method to madness is actually, you know, working from the lab to the OR. Understanding really well the anatomy is what makes a difference and allows us to do, uh, you know, good, gentle, accurate, safe surgery. I'm going to start reviewing a few concepts uh, and then I'll show some illustrative cases. Uh, I think I'm going to lay down some principles of anatomy in this area. First, we talk about paraclinoidal vision. And we can look at this from both endoscopic and open uh, uh, skull base perspectives. It is, of course, critically important that we become first very familiarized with transcranial approaches. And for the paraclinoidal region, you know, we learn how to take the anterior clinoid process and how to unroof the optic canal and expose the clinoidal segment of the carotid already. But we can do the similar thing endonasally but from the ventral perspective. I want to understand the structures from both uh, perspectives. This has been an interest for many years, trying to correlate and understand structures in a global perspective, 360 degree around the skull base. What is the proximal ring? What is the distal ring from both uh, perspectives? Um, for example, we describe the middle kernel process, which uh, had been uh, oversight for many years um, or mislabeled. And the middle kernel process is a very important uh, landmark in endonasal surgery because it limits what we call the clinoidal segment of the carotid artery from the uh, cavernous sinus segment of the carotid artery down here. Um, then uh, also taking the clinoid process, the middle clinoid process allows you to expose the cavernous sinus much better. Um, then we describe the cavernous sinus compartments from an endonasal uh, perspective. And uh, we describe superior, inferior, posterior, and then a lateral compartment. This is a classification that uh, uh, complements 
NOSC classification. And I think in my perspective, my personal opinion is that NOSC classification is, is a radiological classification. And it is very powerful to standardize how we categorize tumors based on an MRI. However, it is not as useful as surgeons uh, when we go into the cabinet to do an operation. And in those cases, it is uh, much more relevant to understand the different compartments of the cavernous sinus. And uh, it is therefore an anatomically based classification that is relevant for us neurosurgeons. So we talk about a superior compartment. And the meaning of this is we're going to go into each area of the cavernous sinus and understand what are you going to find in there. So this is the superior compartment of the cavernous sinus. And when we work here, we're going to enter into what is called the oculomotor triangle area. You're going to see the oculomotor nerve running along the dura. And there is a key landmark here, which is this ligament, which is the interclinoidal ligament. Whatever is in front of it, we call this clinoidal choroid artery. What is behind it or lateral to it is the oculomotor triangle with the third nerve uh, running. Uh, so superior compartment is an area where uh, tumors often invade. You can see in a sagittal view, this is superior compartment here, as opposed to inferior. Uh, this is superior compartment in a coronal view. And it's an area where it's relatively safe to work because the third nerve is nicely protected by dura. There are exceptions, as you will see, where the tumor can break through the oculomotor triangle dura, uh, but most of them stay within the oculomotor triangle. The uh, uh, next compartment I want to review is the uh, posterior compartment. The posterior compartment is often forgotten. Uh, for example, in the NOS classification, it's not even considered. And uh, it is important because tumors embedded in the posterior compartment very often, they can do it this quite often, and you look at a sagittal view and it's tumor that is behind, you know, this vertical segment of the uh, cavernous carotid, just on top of this petroclaval uh, confluence or the, how the petrosal process of the sphenoid bone joins the petrous apex, just where the relos canal is. So the posterior compartment is just above the relos canal. If you look at this anatomy, you know, is this space right here? And if you look at it carefully, you see the sixth nerve running with petrous sphenoidal ligament just behind Gruber's ligament. Uh, so this is your posterior compartment right here. And you can look at the uh, ostium of the superior petrosal sinus and inferior petrosal sinus opening to this posterior compartment. It's also very important to understand the drainage of the different sinuses into or through the cavernous sinus. You can do better hemostasis. And I'll try to show you this with some case examples. Uh, but remember, six nerve here behind the short vertical chorion within the cavernous sinus. Then we have the inferior compartment. This is also tricky compartment because it's more lateral. Uh, to access the inferior compartment, you would have to really extend your exposure more lateral and really widely expose the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus. And as you open it, you go underneath the horizontal segment of the carotid artery. And uh, the sixth nerve in this case is not just behind the carotid, but it's now lateral and just below the carotid artery. So you have this working area here underneath the carotid artery to remove tumors from this area, and you can see here in this view of the coronal view, is this is the what corresponds to the inferior compartment. The sixth nerve is going to be right here. So when I have tumors that That's okay. He'll be back. We just had a temporary loss of connection, internet connection. Sam, just hang in there, okay? Okay, we will wait him uh, just for. Uh, yeah, he'll, he'll be back. He'll be back. He'll be back shortly. Okay. Just, just wait.
Okay, here we are. Please start sharing Hello. your screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, it's okay. We have lost you for a couple of minutes. We knew you'd be back. Okay, can you guys hear me? I cannot hear you. Yes, we can see. We can see and hear you. You haven't started sharing your screen yet, right? Yeah, it looks like the connection is acting up. Just be patient, usually works out. Well, Sam, I guess we're taking a break. This is the first break, right? We will wait uh, just for uh, more one more minute. If he think, doesn't think, work, think, uh, we will he, shift the minutes to speak. Yeah, I think he just came in. I think Juan just came in. I think. Okay. Uh, but I do agree. I guess we have to move on if nothing happens in the next minute or so okay sam i think he is trying to look on uh, from uh, other computer so we uh, may uh, waiting for him let's give him one minute hello i'm here i'm sorry I oh, apologize good, good great can you guys hear me yes i don't know what happened the computer just uh, shut off suddenly <laughs> I it had happens. to restart it. it. It happens. I'm sorry. Um, no, I think no I'm problem. I'm back in business here. Okay. Maybe because I'm you know in the Silicon Valley and you know <laughs> 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 something is going on. Anyway, um, I apologize okay. for the delay. Um, so I was saying that this is on the posterior compartment. We worry about the sixth nerve. Um, and then on the uh, inferior compartment, the sixth nerve is going to be more lateral, as we said. And then finally, we have the lateral compartment. This is um, when we work between the carotid and the nerves in the lateral wall, the tumor expands that space. And sometimes you can work into this lateral compartment, although it's a bit more risky. And you need to be more careful working here because the injury, the risk of injuring the nerve is definitely, is definitely higher. Um, so a key concept when we talk about cavernous analysis to understand the walls of the cavernous sinus. And we talk about an anterior wall and a medial wall of the cavernous sinus. As you all know, we have two layers of dura on the pituitary. These two layers bifurcate one from the other. And the periosteal layer forms the anterior wall, the meningeal layer forms the medial wall. And what we found uh, was that the uh, meningeal layer of dura that covers the pituitary gland completely here has some ligament projections, we call them parasitar ligaments, that join this dura to the carotid artery or to different uh, walls of the cavernous sinus. And these ligaments became very important to understand how to work within the cavernous sinus. Um, we described these different ligaments. The most important one, most robust, is the CCL or carotidoclinoidal ligament that you see right here. It forms like a, a fan-shaped structure that separates here the clinoidal space from the cavernous sinus space. Um, and it sort of anchors the middle wall superiorly. And I'm seeing more and more often that how this ligament can actually be involved with tumor and you need to transect it. And you need to be very careful because this ligament, we studied in this in lab two thirds of the time, really attached so tightly to the carotid artery. You cannot dissect it from the carotid artery. 
you can trim it, cut next to it, but you cannot definitely separate it. Some, there is a third case where it's loosely attached, so you can actually cut it completely, but two thirds is very attached. So be very careful if you're gonna attempt to uh, mobilize uh, that ligament. Oh boy. What the heck's going on now? Yeah, the, the, the screen is frozen, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you may have to reload it. One second. You know. Yeah. I, just re, just reload it. It'll that'll work. What I'm doing is I'm gonna use a different computer because I think there is a problem with that one. I have it okay. open here. Okay. Okay. Um, the thing is, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'll do this because it's, sorry, I'm, something is going on with that computer, but um, okay, here we are. You're seeing the same slide, aren't you? Yes. You're very good. So uh, as I was saying, the CCL, um, then as we said, that CCL divides the clinodal space from the carbonosinous space. And uh, this cryptoclonal ligament is the equivalent of the ventral, uh, is the equivalent of the proximal dual ring, but from a ventral perspective. You can see how it uh, surrounded, surrounds the uh, clinoidal or the carotid artery and separates clinoidal above from carbonosinous just uh, below. In addition, there is another very important uh, ligament that is behind the CCL, which is the interclinoidal ligament. And that ligament, um, it serves as a, as a very important reference because it goes from the posterior clinoid to the anterior clinoid, and it serves as a reference that is, you know, very relevant. Oh boy, Sam. Okay, I, I think uh, we will shift to uh, next speaker. Uh, okay, Sam. Whatever you say. Whatever you say, Sam. Okay. Okay, I'll. Tr Are you guys hear me? Y yes. You want to try, it? Sam? It's yes. up to you, Sam. Can you guys hear me? Oh, okay, Sam. Is it, is it okay for you to complete? Can you hear me? Or, uh, you need to yes, find yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, okay, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Go okay, ahead. Very good. So hopefully I can make this <laughs> successful now. <laughs> but okay. the, um, I just switched computers entirely. So the, um, the bottom line is, you know, all these anatomical concepts brought us to, um, you know, developing this technique of the resection of the middle wall of the cavern of sinus, step by step. A technique. Um, this technique was, you know, the removal of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus and the importance of this uh, removal was first um, uh, described by uh, Professor Oldfield, you know, giant in the field of pituitary surgery and in Cushing's disease in particular. And he described this technique of removing the medial wall. Uh, although, as you see from his illustrations, the uh, knowledge of the anatomy at that time was, you know, not very advanced. And also, it was very limited. Uh, because of the use of the microscope, which does not allow you to see all the structures as you should be seeing them when you go into the cavernous sinus. But he was the one pioneering this removal of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus, and so its relevance on improving outcomes, especially for Cushing's disease. We try to take this technique to the next level using endoscopic techniques and more anatomical knowledge. So he, here is an example, remove the tumor. Uh, sometimes we find that there is tumor that is stuck to the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. Sometimes it's a lot of invasions, and this is just some invasion. So when I hesitate and I think the middle wall could be invaded, I try to remove it. The first step with a dissector here, you try to separate the 
anterior wall from the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. Once you get into the cavernous sinus, you're going to get venous bleeding, but you first want to find this entrance. Once you find the entrance, you uh, make it widely open with a right uh, uh, angle knife like, such as this one. I like to really widely open the wall of the cavernous sinus. This wide opening is, what, is what's going to allow me to really see the carotid inside the cavernous sinus. And I think that that is very important because if I'm going to go into the cavernous sinus to remove tumor or to remove the wall, I do have to see the uh, carotid artery because it's a structure that I worry the most about. Next, we see this inferior parasolar ligament um, and it's anchored in the middle wall. So I have to transect it. And behind that ligament, often I find the inferior hypovisual artery, which I also want to transect because this artery is anchoring also, the, it's attaching the carotid artery to the pituitary gland or to the dura. Uh, and if you're going to mobilize one or the other, you can avulse this artery. So it's better to coagulate it up front, in my opinion. That's safer. Then I can dissect the dura along the posterior clinoid. And then I can uh, separate the carotid ligament. Again, being very careful to not injure the carotid artery in this process. And finally, the middle wall can be removed um, entirely. And at the end, you have this picture looking back to the posterior clinoid. The whole carotid is exposed. You see the intercarotid ligament up here. And this gives you a complete resection of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus when tumor is embedded. So I'm going to show you some uh, cases right here. This is a 15 year old. Uh, uh, um, uh, young girl with Cushing's disease, as you see, very severe Cushing's disease. Um, this is her being, you know, maybe 12 years old, and, and you know, two, three years later, she's clearly Cushing Goy. This is with the uh, permission of the parents, of course. And uh, um, you can see, as we see the imaging here, um, let me just pull this again. I just want to stop on the imaging for a second. Um, you will see that the tumor is, you know, touching the wall of the cavernous sinus. And uh, you look at this right here, you know, this tumor, you cannot tell whether it's embedded in the wall of the cavernous sinus or not, but it's definitely adjacent to it. Okay, so we're gonna go here. Uh, as I'm gonna show you this, you know, I was doing this surgery. Actually, my fellow was doing the operation, did the first part, removed some tumor, positive for tumor, but then I came into the room and I said, well, this is the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. This looks thick, this pituitary gland right here. This wall looks like it has tumor on it. We didn't remove enough tumor. And, and uh, we were right, you know, that's a chunk of tumor that you will see this embedded into the middle wall. You see that middle wall is very thick and it's because it has tumor inside. So what I do here is I disconnect it medially along the posterior clinoid, then I open widely into the cavernous sinus. You can see some of the tumor that is within the uh, cavernous sinus itself. And, uh, I just need to disconnect. What you see there is the inferior hypoxial artery that I'm coagulating and cutting. I cut the inferior parasolar ligament uh, and I cut the CCL superiorly. I cut all the attachments and at the end I can remove this middle wall entirely. And the last view, posterior clinoid, carotid in the cavernous sinus, complete cleaning. And this makes a dramatic difference in this uh, patient's outcome. Um, and, you know, I've learned over the years that this is actually the reason why, and Dr. Allfields mentioned this, the reason why many Cushing's disease uh, surgeries fail, or some of them fail, because there is tumor left in the cavernous sinus. This patient, young kid also, from uh, uh, actually from Lebanon, had this middle, this, uh, uh, op two operations for a tumor in, that was occupying this area of the cella. And he asked me, they contacted me about you know, is it possible to remove this tumor here? There is tumor attached to the middle wall of the cavernous sinus, as you see right here. Um, he had multiple consultations, and uh, I told him that I think there is a very high chance of success uh, in my hands removing this tumor from the wall of the cavernous sinus. So the first thing is we expand this all the way to include the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus. And you see here is the, the clinal sinus of the carotid artery, and open the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus really widely. and uh, Again, I need to do this wide opening so I can see the carotid artery. If I don't see the carotid artery, I don't feel safe working to the cavernous sinus. I do have to see it. Easy to disconnect first on the clinoidal space, clinoidal, clinoidal uh, posterior clinoid. That's the medial disconnection, then superior disconnection from the CCL, and then inferior disconnection from the carotid, parasolar ligament, inferior hypovisial artery. And you see that's the superior disconnection there. And then you see the inferior hypovisial artery in the back. And now I'm cutting the inferior parasolar ligament. 
And, uh, you know, this becomes a very methodical operation. Step by step, you fire your anatomical landmarks, you make your disconnections, and that frees up the tumor. Because what is quite interesting is these tumors actually do grow within these ligamentous structures. And you need to disconnect these ligaments to disconnect the tumor entirely. And this patient that had previous unsuccessful surgeries now uh, was in complete uh, remission successfully. Um, the question is, do you always remove the middle wall of the cavernous sinus? Of course not. When I do in surgery, this is another acromegaly patient. You see that middle wall of the cavernous sinus is completely clean. I can inspect it really well. I don't see anything that is suspicious. Um, I, believe, I believe it's all normal. So I don't remove the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. Okay? It's only when I think the tumor is invading it. If I am not sure, I would probably remove it if it's a functional tumor. But if it's clean, I would not. Um, and, you know, size is not always the factor that determines whether it's invaded or not. This is another acromegaly patient. You see that little tumor invades already inferiorly, I can see. And uh, it's key that the exposure is really wide. If you don't do a wide exposure, you cannot see, explore, or remove the medial wall. In this case, unexpectedly had invasion of both sides. Uh, even on the side where imaging did not suggest there was invasion of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. So I'm trimming the whole dura. This is the posterior gland right here. So I'm getting the dura adjacent to the posterior gland. Then again, I'm opening the anterior wall. Now on the patient's right side. In acromegaly patients, this can become very difficult because as you know, they have very large tortuous carotid arteries and the wall can be very stuck to the carotid. So it might be more difficult. And you can see the inferior hypophysial artery there that I'm quadrant and cutting. And I'm directly working on the carotid artery wall, being very careful to remove this. Now I'm going up, and that is the CCL, carotid clonal ligament. And I'm uh, transecting the medial wall of the CCL. Again, just a reminder that often you cannot completely remove the CCL from the carotid artery. You have to just trim adjacent to it because it's very stuck. Um, even another case, this case is a very large tumor. Um, that is embedding both the superior and the inferior compartments of the cavernous sinus. But in reality, what it's doing is embedding the middle wall and pushing the middle wall against the carotid artery. So at the end, I'm going to find these attachments to the carotid that are formed by the ligaments. So I'm finding these ligaments and I'm detaching them from the carotid artery. Um, this, is, this was a really difficult one uh, because the tumor was very fibrous, very stuck to the carotid, but I was able to gradually detach the tumor from the carotid and uh, uh, remove the tumor uh, entirely. You can see, I see the, at the end of the operation, the carotid is completely skeletonized. So it's so important to have a good mental picture of the shape of the carotid artery in the cavernous sinus uh, and try to do, replicate that during your operation. Um, even NOS4 cases, we've been able to get in remission. This is a case that I did not think we could get in remission. Um, but working more aggressively in the cavernous sinus around the carotid, this patient had normalized IGF-1 uh, six months post-op. Things that we've learned doing these uh, uh, more you know, advanced uh, approaches and techniques to the cavernous sinus is that it is interesting that somatotroph adenomas and also lactotroph in our updated series is showing, and both are the P21 positive, as you know, uh, uh, pituitary tumors. Those P21 positive, they are, for some reason, uh, more invasive into the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. So we're working on a updated or new classification of pituitary tumors where consideration of P1 positivity or preoperatively beam prolactinoma or acromegaly case, those cases have higher risk of invading the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. There is no question about it. Much more than even Cushing's, Cushing's disease or cortical trough or gonadal troughs. And this is something that we're also going to be publishing uh, uh, soon on. So clinically significant, statistically significant, somatotroph adenomas invade the middle wall of the cavernous sinus more often. And I think that explains why the results on remission are not so good in, in classic series. Uh, in 30 consecutive cases we did here, you look at the NOS scores, you realize that these, are, these have become irrelevant to, uh, a, in particular, acromegaly patients because there are grade zero cases and more than half of grade one cases that actually invade the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. Uh, and all grade two invade the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. So this is goes even against the principle of NOS classification where 
is a gradient scale on the risk of invading the cavernous sinus. Uh, so it doesn't work for patients with acromegaly. We've also seen that uh, all results have dramatically improved. If you compare these results with what has been published in the literature, this is a meta-analysis where the surgical remission rates are between 50 and 60% in average. All remission rates are above 90% in, in our series. And now we are uh, approaching 50 cases now. And uh, uh, I believe this is due because of uh, you know, the techniques of removing the middle wall of the cavernous sinus, even going into the cavernous sinus when, when uh, needed. And also, uh, in, is that those patients that are not in remission with surgery only, they actually normalize their IgA1 levels if they need medication or you add radiation. So all our cases are under control. Uh, most of them only with surgery, but a few of them with radiation and or medication. This, you know, I became so convinced of how effective this technique is, and I will also show you that it can be done safely, that uh, I'm starting to do more and more cases, and these cases are being referred also, um, for patients with residual tumor after surgery. This patient is a patient actually from New York with residual tumor in the cavernous sinus um, on uh, medical therapy and it's still elevated IgA1 levels. This patient really struggled with this. Um, so I did an operation, were able to remove the tumor uh, uh, very well, and then her IgA1 level is normal at three months with no medication. And uh, another example, even more dramatic, this patient with a very large uh, tumor done, this was a patient from also out of state in Chicago. They removed all this tumor nicely, but they left above tumor supracellar on the cavernous sinus, even in the other cavernous sinus too. And uh, this patient really was on two medications or medical therapy, I still not in remission, you have this tumor that descended, but it's very complex. And then we did surgery, clean both cavernous sinus, supracellar space, now a patient in, in remission. So as we re review our cases, uh, and I think it's so important that we look at the outcomes and especially also complications, I can say that we haven't had a single injury to the carotid artery, even though we do these very aggressive resections about around the carotid artery. Um, there are uh, a few patients that uh, can get transient diplopia from a six nerve palsy, but this is just transient. All patients do get better in time, actually not better, just get normal, uh, uh, dip, no diplopia after uh, three months time. And so there is no permanent morbidity on doing these cavernous sinus uh, resections. The, um, I'm gonna probably just finish this area of, you know, of course you know that we can also do transcavernous approaches to other type of pathology like uh, chordomas, sarcomas, et cetera. But I wanna finalize by emphasizing uh, the importance of laboratory and clinical fellowship training to, for performing these complex operations. The, you know, you cannot um, pretend to just go and start doing these operations without the proper training, without the proper knowledge. You can really hurt patients if you don't do it, if you don't do it the right way. Um, so we all need to acknowledge what our limitations are and what are the risks of what we do. And uh, I just wanna show that what, it, what is possible to do and, and what are the uh, potential benefits, but also the potential risks. And if you are not aware of the risks of what you do, you can really get in, in, in trouble. You and definitely your patients get in trouble. So um, although this can be a bit mad doing this, uh, looks like madness doing this aggressive resection in the cavernous sinus, it can be done safely. There is a method to it. The method is based on surgical anatomy and in a very careful uh, technique. Thank you very much for having me. And again, I apologize for all the technical issues. Thank you. I'll happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Juan, for uh, this uh, nice presentation. Is there any question from uh, panelists? Okay, uh, thank, you. thank you. And now we will uh, shift, we'll shift to uh, next speaker, Professor Hector. Please start sharing your screen.
Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. And can you see my my screen? Yes, yeah, not full size yet. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'm Hector Rojas, neurosurgeon of the Hospital Privado de Rosario. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank to Professor uh, Samel Morsi Hassan for inviting me to share my experience with you. And I'm honored in sharing this international webinar with such a prestigious colleagues. I am from Argentina a country that is 12,000 kilometers away from Egypt. I live in Rosario City, which is a 1.4 million population city besides the beautiful Paraná River, as you can see here in the, in the map, who runs through three countries to reach the Atlantic Ocean. This is the landscape of the Paraná River. And in the middle of the city, is the uh, Hospital Privado de Rosario where I work and where we discuss and treat these cases in the pituitary and school-based uh, social unit. This, is, uh, this unit is formed by 15 colleagues from different specialities, ENT, oculoplastic surgeons, ophthalm ophthalmologists, endocrinologists, neuroradiologists, head and neck surgeons, and radio oncologists. He's Professor Herrera, who is our mentor, and he's Pablo Jose, my surgical team partner. She's uh, the ENT part of the surgical team. Okay. non control cushion disease or acromegaly is associated with increased morbid mortality. It is known in medical literature that the more we control the serum hormonal levels, the higher the evolution of patients becomes. There are three possible treatment options for functional pituitary tumors producing acromegaly or Cushing disease, surgery, medical therapy, and radiation therapy. Despite therapy could be started before surgery, surgical resection is the first option when there are no contraindications. The comparison of remission rates in different series is very difficult because they depend on the remission criteria adopted at the time of all, at the time of follow up, independently of this aspect, we, uh, the success of surgery is highly related to surgeon experience. Other factors that influence surgical results are the size of the adenoma and the cavernous sinus invasion. In necromegaly, remission rates are near 50% in macro adenomas and 80% in micro in micro adenomas. In this pathology, women older than 60 years old with macro adenomas have worst evolution. In Cushion disease, the results have a wide range from 40 to 97%, which may be due to prior factors mentioned. For most patients with Cushion disease, surgery is the primary definitive therapy with low morbidity and mortality. So we understand that the main goals of surgery are total resection of the tumor and preservation of pituitary function. But how can we reach these objectives? For us, the following are the most important concepts that we have to keep in mind for reaching a better result. One, B nostril, four hands, ENT plus neurosurgeon endoscopic approach. Two, no turbinate resection, rescue and susceptible flap. This is because most of uh, Cushing disease and acromegaly are small tumors. Three, four blue cellular craniotomy. Four, it is very important to use a microsurgical technique dissection, especially during the dural opening and the identification of the plane between the normal versus tumor, tumor tissue. Respect the dural opening, we made it layer by layer, and sometimes a tile or opening is enough to show the normal tissue that surrounds a tumor. Number five, complete in block resection if possible. If not, the compression, plus resection of the pseudo capsule. Number six, careful and thorough infection of the surgical bed. And number seven, checking the serum hormone levels in early post-operative period. Alongside this presentation, I will show you some 
surgical videos of how we do this. As Professor Fernando Miranda says, said in previous conference, in 2011, Edward Oldfield from the University of Virginia emphasized that in the last 30 years, we were focused in how to reach the pituitary gland, but not in how to operate the tumor. And he published this very interesting article paying special attention to the use of the pseudo capsule for tumor dissection. We think that the pseudo capsule is a very important concept, but it is not constant. So in that cases where it is not or is partially present, we have to continue the resection until normal anatomical structures are found. Now let's discuss Cushing's disease. This is a 41 year old man with a very aggressive Cushing disease. Uh, with hypertension, hypertension, diabetes, retinal thrombosis, and multiple pathological fractures. The MRA show a right microadenoma in contact with the internal cavernous ICA. In this video, we can see a right parasitical adenoma and how its MRA image correlates with the intraoperative finding. Here we can see how we open the dura enough to expose the plane between the tumor and the pituitary gland. Once it is identified, we start the dissection through it. We made a 360 degree dissection. This way we can achieve an in-block resection of the tumor. As mentioned previously, the meticulous inspection of the tumor bed is mandatory to be sure that there is no residual tumor. You can see here the pituitary gland and the internal carotid artery without any rest of tumor. And this is the in-block resection of the tumor. This is a case of a 31, 30-year-old 30 woman with Cushing disease and a right microadenoma. In this case, the pseudo capsule was not continuous or maybe we broke it dur during the dissection. So after in-block resection, we identify residual tumor. In this video, we can see again, the careful opening of the dura layer by layer, trying to identify the tumor, the pituitary gland, and the cleavage plane between the tumor and the normal tissue. Once we identify it, we start the, dis the dissection trying to separate the tumor from the pituitary gland using both hands with microsurgical techniques. This case is interesting because the adenoma didn't have a complete pseudo capsule. Or as I said before, maybe we broke it during the dissection. So when we removed the tumor in a block resection, there was residual tumor in contact with the dosum cell and the pituitary gland. So we had to continue the resection with suction and dissectors until there was no residual tumor. We always made a saline solution irrigation to clean the surgical field and to eliminate any tumor cells. After that, we can be sure that the resection is totally complete as we see in the video. The dorsum cella, the, uh, the pituitary gland, the floors of the cella. This is a case of a 21 year old woman with Cushing disease and basal midline microadenoma. It has no pseudo capsule, probably because it's small size. So we have to resect, in, resect it in a piecemeal way. A very careful odura opening is necessary to expose all the tumor and the normal surrounding tissue. As you see, there is no capsule of the tumor. So we continue the resection until normal tissue is exposed. It is very important to make a meticulous exploration of the circular, surgical, surgical bed, sorry. Finally, we can see only normal pituitary tissue. Now, 
and the perfect correlation between this finding and the MRA preoperative, the preoperative MRA. This is the last Cushing disease case. Here, the microadenoma is on top of the horizontal segment of the intracavernous cyca and behind the gland. When we started the dissection, we realized that it would be difficult to work in such in such small place. We tried to move the gland to the left very softly, and suddenly the tumor emerged. After that, we continued the resection until the horizontal segment of the carotid artery, the intracavernous carotid artery, was exposed to be sure that there was no remnant of tumor. Here we can see the carotid artery and there is no more tumor. The medial, the medial wall of the cavernous signs, of the right cavernous signs, the tumor was there. Finally, we routinely do a saline solution washing, trying to eliminate any tumor cell. Now let's see some acromegaly cases. This is a 41 a year, old woman, a year old man with acromegaly who have a left basal microadenoma with cellular floor compromise. As you see, sorry. Okay. As you see in the surgical MRA, the pituitary gland covered the tumor here so we plan an inferior approach to the adenoma. As I mentioned previously, we always start with a careful dura opening layer by layer. Using the sector and scissor if necessary. And this allows us to understand the anatomy. It's very important to expose the tumor and the pituitary gland, the interface between the tumor and the pituitary gland. Look that we use uh, microsurgical technique. In this case, because of the anatomical relations of the gland and the tumor, we had to cut the pituitary first in an horizontal way to find the tumor. And then with two vertical cuts that allowed us to totally expose the tumor. This is the tumor and this is the pituitary gland. We made two cuts. We started the 360 degree blunt dissection that led us to achieve an in block resection. Now we are taking off the taking out the tumor. And when venous bleeding occurred from the cavernous sinus that uh, that was stopped with cottonoid surges and a smooth compression. Then we resect some residual tumor, and finally, we could be sure that the surgical bed was totally clean. This is the in block resection of the tumor. This is a case of a 42 year old woman with acromegaly treated in other center with lung rotate for two years with partial shrinkage of the tumor, but without improving serum uh, growing hormone levels. This is the initial. MRA, and this is two years MRA, where we can see only a, a partial response with a small shrinkage. As we showed in previous videos, it is very important for us the dissection layer by layer, trying to understand where the tumor starts. We knew that this tumor was under the pituitary gland, so, we didn't have to open the superior part of the dura, and we made an horizontal cut in the medial dura. We started to identify, when we started to identify the tumor, we continued the dura open until it was entirely exposed. At this time, we realized that there was no pseudo capsule. So we continued the resection until the normal tissue was exposed. 
Because of the tumor was in the inferior part of the gland, we had to use a 40, the 45 degree lens for final checking. And here you can see the pituitary tissue as it's uh, the, the inferior face of the pituitary gland as a sign of complete resection. I want to emphasize that an in block resection does not always mean there is a no more tumor. This could be because the pseudo capsule was not continuous or because we broke it that is possible during the dissection. Anyway, in all cases, we have to check in a very meticulous way the tumor bed looking for any residual adenoma or pseudo capsule. In this video, we can see an example. Okay, in, it is an apparent, an apparent total resection of the tumor, but when we insist on checking surgical bed, we found a small part of the pseudo capsule, this, that could be totally resected. This is very important for getting better results in Cushing disease anachromegaly. Okay, let's talk about perioperative management of these pathologies. As we know, patients with Cushing disease have hypercortisolin, so nowadays we don't use perioperative steroids. The day after surgery, we routinely check serum cortisol level. Values lower than two micrograms per deciliter are an early criteria of remission. In acromegaly after the surgery, disease remission is defined as normal age match uh, IGF-1 values plus random growing hormone minor than one microgram per liter or nadir growing, uh, growing hormone minor to 0.4 micrograms per liter on an oral glucose tolerance test. We recommend waiting at least 12 uh, weeks after surgery to assess IGF-1 levels as the post-operative decline can be delayed compared with that of uh, growing hormone levels. As a conclusion, functional pituitary tumors surgery are very similar to other central nervous system tumor surgery. So they share the same principles of surgery. It is very important to have a very good vision, expose all the tumor limits, use microsurgical dissection techniques, understand the changes in the anatomy caused by the tumor, and Obviously, that the primary goal is to achieve a total resection, but there is a big difference between them. This means that function in pituitary tumor surgery are functional procedures. So our appreciation of how the resection was is not important. This procedure has, this procedure has only one shot, the post-operative hormonal levels. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, dear friend, for uh, excellent presentation. Is there any question from uh, panelists? Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Hector, for uh, this uh, nice presentation. And now we will shift to uh, next speaker, Professor Pablo Josh. Please start sharing your screen. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. I can hear and see you. Hello? Yes. Can you hear us? Yes, now, yes. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Saleh, for the, inviting me to give this lecture. I'm based in Argentina and I'm going 
to talk about some ENT stuff. Let me share my computer. It's perfect. Okay, as I said, I'm going to talk about preservation of nasal function and reconstructive options for endoscopic anterior school based surgery. I have a problem, I cannot see my mouse. Okay. We can Okay. Um, I also work at the Hospital Privado de Rosario Pituitary Skull Base Unit Surgery, as Dr. Rojas mentioned before. And the aim of this conversation is to review different reconstruction options for endoscopic skull base surgery and highlight topics about nasal function preservation. To put us in context, Endoscopic and nasal skull base surgery requires effective skull base reconstruction to facilitate healing and prevent postoperative cerebrospinal fluid leak and intracranial infection. Reestablishing the separation between the sterile cranial vault and the microbe colonizing nasal cavity is paramount. For that purpose, we have many options that can be divided into main groups, free grafts and vascular grafts. Free autologous free grafts are divided into autologous grafts and allografts. Autologous free grafts include fat, temporalis fascia, fascia lata, and more commonly nasal free mucosa, septal bone, and cartilage. Allografts include a cellular human cadaveric dermis, a cellular porcine intestines, and collagen matrix materials such as Duragen. Between vascular flaps, we have regional, which are within the nose, like nasoceptal flap, inferior or middle turbinate flap, to name a few of them, and others that are in at the surrounding structures, like pericranial flap, temporoparietal fascia, and others. Uh, as distal, we can mention fascial lata free flap, omental free flap, adipofascial radial forearm free flap, and fibula free flap. Free mucosal grafts are frequently derived from the middle turbinate, which is often completely or partially resected as part of the endoscopic approach. In our series, we don't resect middle turbinate, so we don't have this as an option. Other sites where we can get free grafts are inferior turbinate, nasal septum, and nasal floor, always while taking care to preserve olfactory epithelium. The advantages here are the low nasal morbidity and they are straightforward to obtain. Free bone grafts has been used as an inlay to support the soft tissues of the brain. However, if postoperative radiotherapy is necessary, they are prone to osteoradionecrosis and can take longer to heal compared to other graft materials. If used, free bones should be combined with a vascularized on life lab. Onlay grafts can be used in a single or multi-layer fashion and should encompass the entire bony rim of the defect with an adequate margin to account for contraction. Free grafts generally lose about one fifth of their size during the healing process. So starting with a graft that is at least 1.25 times the size of the defect is advised. Inlay graft materials should consist of materials without epithelial surfaces, such as fascia, bone, or fat, 
as well as collagen matrix materials. So now let's talk about vascular flaps. The nasoceptal flap is the dominant vascular flap using skull-based reconstruction because of an ideal central location, robust vascular supply, ample coverage area, and acceptable donor site morbidity. In situations where nasoceptal flap reconstruction is not an option, other local flaps such as turbinate, lateral nasal wall, or, or nasal floor flaps has been described as viable substitute, drawing their body supply from branches of the sphenopalatine artery or ethmoidal arteries. Regional and distal flaps offer alternative reconstructive options to local flaps. The pericranial flap is heralded as perhaps the most versatile with a long history of use in reconstructing anterior skull-based defects. Distal flaps in the form of free tissue transfers exist mainly as options in dire circumstances where defect size, location, or limitations in vascular supply preclude the use of more readily accessible tissue. We can have complications and limitations when uses vascular flap, and they can be divided in three main categories, flap integrity, recipient site complications, and donor site complications. Flap integrity may be affected by technical challenges encountered during flap elevation, prominent septum deviation, large septal spurs, and prior septal surgery can contribute to heightened difficulty, dish, um, to difficulty during flap elevation, potentially increasing the likelihood of flap laceration or tearing. Nonetheless, small lacerations as well as rescue flap or the reuse of a previously placed nasoceptal flap during revision cases appears to have minimal impact on flap failure rates and postoperative CSF leak rates. Reported rates of postoperative CSF leak among patients undergoing vascular flap repair in the setting of previous radiotherapy range from 8.1% to 28.6%. A case series compiled by Grass and colleagues observed no difference in postoperative CSF leak rate rates after vascular flap repairs between patients with a history of radiotherapy and patients with no prior radiotherapy. Other potential recipient site complications include incorrect orientation of the mucosal surface of the flap against the skull base, delayed mucosal formation under the flap, and the risk for misinterpretation of the vascular reconstruction as this is persistent or recurrence on surveillance imaging. Complications involving the donor site can cause considerable impairment in synonasal quality of life most commonly relating to prolonged nasal crusting and imperial function. Remucosalization of the denuded septum can be expected to take up to 90 days. And within this period, nasal crusting at the, dust, at the donor site can be expected aspect of normal wound healing. Crusting another nasal donor site morbidity may be improved with adjacent mucosal graft transfer techniques or a reverse flap rotation. Endoscopic skull base surgery with or without elevation of an asoceptal flap often leads to transient reduction in olfaction. Olfatory strip technique reduces permanent hyposmia. The structure a structural integrity of the nasal septum may be also compromised during surgery. Septal perforation may be seen in 14% of cases and nasal dorsum collapse in 16%. I want to show you this video about how we perform an approach to the pituitary gland. This is a right nasal fossa, an endoscopic view. This is the nasal septum and the right inferior turbinate. We start making room, so we outfracture gently this inferior turbinate, then the middle turbinate, 
as I said before, we don't resect middle turbinate routinely in pituitary surgery. Then we can see superior turbinate. And when we outfracture, we will see the sphenoidal, sphenoidal recess with a natural ostium and the sphenoidal rostrum, as we can see here. So then we make posterior septectomy, prefer preserving olfactory strip. Then we check downwards where the artery of the flap runs and excise the mucosa to expose the bone and sphenoid rostrum, then separate the, muco, the mucosal flap, mucoperiostal flap of the, um, of the rescue flap. And we can have the, this nice view and most important, we have room enough to work comfortably. Let's talk about um, some decision-making considerations for reconstruction. If there is a low flow leak, then defect site and size, small is less than one centimeter, large greater than two centimeters, should guide whether a free graft reconstruction alone is adequate or the use of a vascular flap is required. In a high flow leak, defect site alone guides the reconstruction. Vascular flap, vascular tissue for larger and more complex skull based defects is the preferred option. In this case of a Cushing disease, it's a 44 year old woman that after resection, we can see pituitary gland in the upper part of the cella. We can see the bed side of the tumor that we are inspecting and there is no CSF leak, no hemorrhage. So we start performing the reconstruction. We use oxidized cellulosa, we don't use fat. Then we use a collagen matrix in an overlay fashion. Over this, we use duracillant to make a watertight closure. And then we put absorbable hemostatic gelatin sponge over phenoid sinus. After this, we reposition the flap of the, of the rescue, the pedicle of the rescue flap. And as you can see, we preserve the middle turbinate. And then we reposition also middle, middle and inferior turbinate. In this other case of a non-functional macroenoma, it's a female patient, 34 year old, and we can see a wide arachnoid defect with high flow CSF leak, which occurs during tumor dissection. We can see pituitary gland and the arachnoid defect. And after complete resection, we use for reconstruction collagen matrix as inlay, adjusting to the bone rings, then an overlay collagen matrix. Then we used a left nasoceptal flap. Here you can see the pedicle and the flap expanded and the uracillant, and then the others I showed, I showed in the case before. In this other case, with a giant macroadenoma of a female patient of 67 year old, she was um, in, uh, operated in other center. She had amaurosis and pituitary apoplexy. And after complete tumor removal, there was small CSF leak. Although the tumor was very big. And we do the same as I showed before. We fill in the cavity with oxidized cellulosa. Then we put a collagen matrix in an overlay fashion. A left nasoceptal flap. And in this case, 
we didn't use duracillant, we put oxidized cellulose all around the edges of the nasoceptal flap. And then filling the cavity with gelatin sponge. Here you can see the tail of the middle turbinate, which was preserved. Let's see some other considerations in the decision making process for skull based reconstruction. In cellular defects, the size of the defect matters as this corresponds to the availability of a bony defect rim, which can be limited by the optic nerve and paracellular cavity. If there is no bony ledge, reconstruction with purely free grafts is difficult and a vascularized flap is advised. The size of the tumor does not directly correlate with the presence or quality of intraoperative CSF leak. As I showed in the two last cases, first one was, was a macroenoma with high CSF leak, and the last one was a very big a giant macroenoma with small CSF leak. So the most predictive factor in the occurrence of an intraoperative CSF leak is the violation of the arachnoid system and the size of the dural defect. In cellular defects with a low flow intraoperative CSF leak, layered free grafts reconstruction is a good alternative to nasoceptal flap and has decreased nasal donor site morbidity, especially when we talk about hypospia and crusting. Free middle turbinate mucosal graft is a good alternative for cellular defect reconstruction after pituitary surgery for microanomas and macroanomas less than three centimeters with no or low flow intraoperative CSF leak. When we have to put a free mucosa a graph, we, preserve, we, uh, we prefer to use nasal floor or lateral nasal wall. Another considerations, elevated body mass index has been found to be a risk factor for postoperative leak in cellular defects in pituitary surgery, regardless of defect location when compared to normal BMI patients. Free grafts reconstruction alone should be avoided in these cases. Fraser and colleagues concluded that the vascularized flap should be used in all patients with a BMI greater than 25 kilograms per square meter in the presence of an intraoperative CSF leak, regardless location. To conclude, several factors should be considered when determining the use of free grafts or vascular flaps in reconstructing skull-based defects. Defect size, location, presence or absence of intraoperative CSF leak, quality of CSF leak, high flow versus low flow, tumor pathology, patient risk factors like obesity or intracranial hypertension, previous or future radiotherapy, and presence of bony rim around defects. Free grafts reconstruction alone, may be useful in cases of no intraoperative CSF leak or low flow CSF leak with a small defect size, achieving success rates upward of 90%. The location of the defect and tumor pathology coincide in determining the likelihood of CSF leak as well as anticipated flow rate of CSF leak. Finally, surgeons must find a material and technique that works best for them with equal or better success rates to those published in the literature. The overriding goal is achieving a circumferential watertight seal regardless of material use. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Professor uh, Barulo, for uh, this excellent uh, presentation. Is there any question from uh, panelists? Thanks again, uh, Professor Pablo. We now uh, will open.
open discussion for all audience. If you have any question, please unmute yourself and ask it. Okay, I think we all uh, today uh, have done a lot of effort to put all this to put all uh, these uh, eminent speakers together and we all enjoy it uh, and uh, I hope we will uh, meet you uh, again soon. Thank you all. Well, well Sam, I'd like to say thank you for putting this all together. Uh, all the speakers came, it was well produced and things went well. Uh, and I'd like to invite all the panelists to stick around after the webcast. We're gonna test something in this platform called breakout rooms. And it won't be on the air, it won't be recorded. So stick around after. And thanks again, Sam. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. It's over to you. If anyone uh, wants to say hello or say something. Okay.